thank you everyone for joining us for day four of the seventh Molecular Oncology Society Conference. Uh, we'll move on to our first session, which is on breast cancer. And our speaker, our first speaker is Dr. Ram Abhinav, who's a medical oncologist from Coimbatore. And he'll be talking on the topic, redefining the medical management of HER2 negative early breast cancer in the era of precision medicine. This session is sponsored by AstraZeneca. And with that, I request our speaker to start the session. Over to you, sir. I hope my, my slides are visible. <clears throat> yes, sir. This is a sponsored session by AstraZeneca, and I uh, thank AstraZeneca and Dr. Pashankar, the organizing secretary, for the opportunity. So I'll kick start. So, my topic is redefining management of HER2 negative early breast cancer in the era of precision medicine. More importantly, what are the new updates for early breast cancer who are HER2 negative? We know that most of the patients in abroad are early breast cancer, but for us, not so many patients are early breast cancer. We have more regional breast cancer, more of locally advanced breast cancer. For early breast cancer, the survival rates are now up and above 90%. And even for patients with locally advanced breast cancer, we are looking at survivals of around more than 70 to 80%. So that is a significant improvement which has been achieved over the last few decades. And we are all aware for the, according for the treatment stratification, each patient is different. And depending on whether the patient can undergo whether the patient can undergo breast conservation surgery, depending on the lymph node status, depending on the size of the tumor, we tailor therapy for each patient with neoadjuvant chemotherapy or neoadjuvant targeted therapy, or if the tumor size is very small and it's feasible for BCS, breast conservation surgery, we go ahead with afferent surgery and we complete adjuvant chemotherapy radiation whenever it is necessary. So what has been new is we all been knowing that BRCA mutation accounts for around 5 to 10% of breast cancer patients. And the prevalence of BRCA mutation varies between different countries. <clears throat> so on an average, it is found to be around 5 to 10%. So previously, these patients who had BRCA mutation, germline BRCA mutations, the only advantage of testing BRCA was for probably familial screening. And we get to know that patients with BRCA mutation, they are diagnosed at an early stage. Most of these patients are triple negative patients. They have a higher grade of tumor and they have more incidence of CNS metastasis. And we are aware that the contralateral breast disease or ipsilateral recurrence is also high for patients with BRCA mutation. And it is also known that BRCA mutant breast cancer patients have a higher risk of recurrence compared to those who don't have it. Coming to the criteria for testing. So the testing question was only for patients who were less than 45 years and they were diagnosed. diagnosed with breast cancer, who had a second primary in the breast or had a family history which entitled them for BRCA testing. And the third group was who are more than 50 years and who had a personal history or family history, which was suggestive of BRCA testing. So basically we were checking patients and individuals who had high risk for BRCA mutation. We were in checking everybody for BRCA mutation, but now things have a little bit changed because it has now therapeutic value. Now for any age, if the PARP inhibitor is going to add some value to systemic therapy option, either it is metastatic or high risk breast cancer who are BRCA positive, we will have to check them for germline BRCA so that there can be a treatment addition. 
So this is the most important study and most important update, the recent times. So Olympia study, everybody is aware of it. It's a phase three study in high risk G BRCA mutated, had to negative breast cancer. So the patients where patients should have a the germline pathognomic BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutation, and they have to be stage two or stage three breast cancer, and they should be HER2 negative, and they should have completed the entire neoadjuvant chemotherapy or adjuvant chemotherapy. So these patients can be of two types. One is they are in the neoadjuvant group or in the adjuvant group. So if, if they are in the neoadjuvant group, if they are triple negative, after neoadjuvant chemotherapy, they should have not had a pathological CR. And if they are hormone receptor positive, they should have had non-pathological CR. And they should have had a CPS EG score of more than equivalent to three. I'll be shortly discussing about the, the CPS EG score. And if the patient underwent upfront surgery, then how do we choose who is eligible for adjuvant olaparib? If it is triple negative breast cancer, any tumor which is more than two centimeter PT or patients who are not positive. And if it is hormone receptor positive, the patient should have more than four lymph nodes positive. <clears throat> so it's a well-conducted study. They specifically took high-risk breast cancer patients. And these patients were randomized to standard treatment or placebo treatment or valaparib the standard dose 300 mg BD for one year. The primary endpoint point was distant disease-free survival and other secondary endpoints were overall survival, PRCA mutated uh, associated cancers and quality of life and safety. So it is a well conducted study. So this is the CPS EG score. This is nothing but CPS EG scores in hormone positive breast cancer means that what was the initial clinical stage? Pathological and what is the receptor status, whether it's ER positive or ER negative, and the nuclear grade. So these sum up to the CRS uh, EG score, CP, sorry, CPS EG score. And if it is more than equivalent to three, then these patients and who did not have a path CR after neoadjuvant chemotherapy, they were eligible for adjuvant olaparib. So what did we see? Olaparib reduced the incidence of in patients who are receiving olaparib for one year. The difference was 85.9% versus 77.1%, a difference of around 9% improvement in disease-free survival at three years. We could also see that there was a decrease in the distance disease free survival. It reduced from uh, 80.4 in the placebo arm and 5% in the collaborative arm. The OS data is still not matured. For Olaparib, I think we are all used to using some form of power inhibitor and most of us would have had first-hand experience in using olaparib. It is not a very difficult drug, but it's not a very easy drug as well. So the main side effect is what we face patients have a little bit of nausea. probably the approximately 5 to 10 percent of the patient so as i said not very difficult to manage but not very easy to manage as well so for the uh, quality of life assessment there were fever but that is understood because it's not the difference is not very significant whereas receiving olaparib there were a little bit there was a little bit of improvement in there were increase in the side first after stopping olaparib <clears throat> 
A similar study, brightness study, one is addition of carboplatin to the standard chemotherapy of AC and uh, paclitaxel. And the other are and valiparib to the standard arm of paclitaxel and doxorubicin based chemotherapy. And the primary endpoint of the study was pathological CR. And secondary endpoint was OS and EFS and safety. Unfortunately, addition of valiparib did not have an impact on the pathological CR. Just the addition of carboplatin to paclitaxel showed improvement in the pathological CR. So that is one point we learned from the study. One is probably carboplatin and valiparib might not. And even in the, there was an improvement in even free survival with the addition of carboplatin to paclitaxel, but not as of now. The only power pin apparent. And we have seen for patients with germline who are not having. Gina germline BRCA mutations at CR for triple negative patients. We are aware that CREATEX is only in triple negative breast cancer, but not in hormone positive breast cancer. For hormone positive breast cancer, we have other modalities like ovarian function suppression or as we just might be an option. So for patients not achieving path CR on TIX capsid for six months is now recommended. Patients would not have, have neoadjuvant chemotherapy as sometimes even locally advanced breast cancer because of multiple nodes positivity. So we are also in a confusion probably If we are given neoadjuvant chemotherapy, we could have put the uh, main in scape sediment for six months. Now that that been so this is a Chinese study, CIS UCC study. So in this patients after after surgery and add chemotherapy were randomized to keep sediment 650 mg per meter square twice a day for one year. So the dosing is different for between the CREATEX and uh, the adjuvant maintenance low dose cape sediment. This is only 650 mg per meter square twice a day, and it is given for one year compared to CREATEX, just given for six months. And what we saw is with addition of maintenance low dose cape sediment, even if the patients were not stratified based on uh, neoadjuvant chemotherapy and pathological complete response. KPC have been managed to show an impressive 9% improvement in five year disease free survival. So, this will probably sort out some of the problems which we face in the clinical practice. So, for the next question comes should we give chemotherapy, especially for elderly women? Because People who are more than 65 or more than 70, we are always a little bit dicey to give or not give adjuvant chemotherapy. Capesetabin is a very good option. We have already seen that in triple negative breast cancers, um, capesetabin will improve the disease free survival in selected populations. Can we replace a non? Uh, can we replace a non IV? Can we replace an IV-based chemotherapy with capsidabin based chemotherapy? That is what CalGP49907 did. So they replaced the standard chemotherapy of CMF or AC chemotherapy, and they gave capsidabin chemotherapy for six months. And what was seen is that it was probably uh, not sufficient. We we'll have to give the standard chemotherapy, either anthracycline-based or CMF-based chemotherapy. But it has its own pitfalls. It did not uh, use taxane based chemotherapy. In spite of that, AC or CMF, so patients who were really not fit, capsidabin for six months would be an option. 
And when we look at the subgroup analysis of the study, actually did not benefit with CMF4 and the cyclin-based chemotherapy. And probably in that particular set of patients, capsidabin would be sufficient. That is one learning point. It's a post-doc analysis, but definitely we can substitute for at least certain proportion of patients. And coming to the other important trials, we know that immunotherapy is there. Every map to the addition of new adjuvant chemotherapy, the anthracycline, and so it was given along with paclitaxel and carboplatin for four cycles, and it was continued with anthracycline base came open for a year. So what it showed is that pathological complete response, that was a primary endpoint. And it is also starting to show impressive even free survival data, just not mature yet. But in the initial analysis, all patients have shown improvement in even free survival so complete the updated analysis mature data is still not available so we'll have to wait a little more to confirm that immunotherapy might add something to uh, survival or even free survival similarly it is also seen with atezolizumab uh, and this is more atezolizumab to the addition of anthracycline and taxane based chemotherapy now, to note that there was no carboplatin added to the study, and atezolizumab added to the new adjuvant chemotherapy and adjuvant setting also showed an improvement in pathological complete response. So, what we learned is that twin triple negative breast cancer, if add addition of immunotherapy, either atezolizumab and pembrolizumab, will show improvement in pathological complete response. We know that it's a, and we have also seen from the pembrolizumab study, keynote study that there has been signs of improvement in event free survival. But having said that, this is not metastatic setting, giving immunotherapy for a year. We have always seen short course immunotherapy for metastatic settings probably might not have a lot of problems, but in the curative. setting when the survival is having hypothyroidism or hypothyroidism, adrenal problems, diabetes, hepatitis, billion bar to name a few. These are sometimes or very frequently seen in patients who are receiving immunotherapy. So if that happens in a patient with uh, early breast cancer, that is something we would be concerned. So we'll have to wait for the final data the side effect profile and also the survival analysis then take a call on adding immunotherapy that is my opinion for hormone positive breast cancer so what do we do apart from ovarian function suppression in postmenopausal and premenopausal women so there is now data to suggest that adding abima cycle for two years initial analysis which showed at 13 months uh, two years the seven percent from 92 percent but in the updated analysis the invasive disease fees 83 percent to 18 nearly 89 percent so approximately a five to six percent improvement improvement to the invasive disease free survival rate. So this is in data seems to be very good because at three years, it has managed to show a nearly a five to six percent improvement in invasive disease free survival. So this is something one would definitely consider in especially hormone positive high risk breast cancer. But Abima Cyclip is not without side effects. We all know that the idea can be a approximately two years and there are other side effects as well fatigue nausea neutropenia and to name a few but 
the grade 3 diarrhea rates are generally less than 10% and the neutropenia rates are less than 20%. So generally manageable. There will be side effects with any drug. So generally manageable. So can palbociclib do the same thing? Because you all feel that in our clinical practice, palbociclib is more probably well tolerated than abimacyclib. But unfortunately, there are two studies, PALA study and Penilo B study. Both did not show an improvement in disease free survival. So probably in adjuvant setting, abimacyclib and palbociclib are not seen. And if we are considering to conclude, there were many recent developments in breast cancer and especially in early breast cancer. And BRCA mutation and addition of olaparib is probably one of the most important uh, studies. So the Olympia study, which showed approximately uh, seven to eight percent improvement. And there are other studies as well. In triple negative breast cancer, we have seen that pembrolizumab and atezolizumab have shown improved in disease free survival rates, even free survival rates. And we have part of inhibitors adjuvant for two years. And if that, I thank you for my for the opportunity. Uh, thank you so much, sir. Uh, if you have any questions, we have some time. If you have any questions for uh, Dr. Ram, we request our audience to please uh, raise their hand or uh, just put your questions in the chat box. Uh, we can wait for another uh, 30 seconds. Uh, doc Dr. Vishwanath, please go ahead, sir. Uh, Dr. Ram, it was a nice talk. I have a question. So if you have uh, a premenopausal uh, early yeah. breast cancer, can you hear me? Dr. Vishwanath here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I can hear you. Uh, if you have a premenopausal early breast cancer who is hormone receptor positive and HER2 negative, which mm -hmm. kind of patients would you actually consider Olaparib as uh, for one year? So premenopausal women with who are hormone positive and who are BRC mutant. Yeah, BRC mutant, correct. Yeah, so this is a very tricky question. Nobody knows the exact answer. So there are two uh, drugs which are available. One mm -hmm. is PARP inhibitors, which have shown Olaparib, which have shown improvement in CG survey. And the second drug is Abimacyclib, which also has shown improvement in disease free survival. So choosing between the two, as of now, there is no direct comparison, which one is better. Probably it is up to the physician discretion. We'll have to look at the risk factors, what are the risk factors. So there is a specific criteria for Abimacyclib also, which patients would probably benefit from uh, addition of Abimacyclib for two years. For hormone positive breast cancer, they need to have uh, node positivity, and they need to have key 67 of more than 20% or more than four nodes positive. So these are the uh, uh, patient characteristics who would benefit from abimacyclib. And we have already discussed in the Olympia study, what are the uh, patients who would fit into the criteria. We'll have to look at the nodal status and CRS, EG score, pathological complete response. As of now, there's no separate answer. My opinion, I would generally consider abimacyclib probably because it's a easier drug to manage only because for that reason. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, sir. Uh, we'll now move on to our next session. This session is sponsored by Novartis and I invite our chairperson Dr. K. Kalai Chalvi, Senior Medical Oncologist from Chennai to start the proceedings. Over to you, ma'am. Yeah, uh, good afternoon. And I thank the organizers for inviting me for this program. And I thank Novartis for making me, a, uh, making me part of this program. And we are going to have the uh, uh, panel, which is being moderated by Dr. S. Vishwanath. 
it's on living longer and living well. Now, a reality in patients with HR positive and had to uh, negative advanced breast cancer. And we all know that the CDK46 inhibitors have made life easy for all these advanced breast cancer and metastatic breast cancer patients. And uh, let's see what our moderator is going to allude into and uh, what we'll get at the end of the session. Uh, Dr. Vishwanath, can yes, you take over the session? Yeah. Yeah, and thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Kali Silvi. And uh, thank you, Dr. Novartis, for this opportunity and uh, as well as Dr. Kripa Shankar for uh, inviting me. So let me share my slides. So it's an interesting topic, uh, living longer and living well. Now a reality in patients with hormone receptor positive HER2 negative advanced breast cancer. And we have a distinguished uh, panel here. We have Dr. Bhavesh uh, Poladia from uh, Namakal, Dr. Jovita from Chennai, Dr. Mithun from Trishur, Dr. Uh, Jagan from Chennai, Dr. Monica from uh, Sikandrabad, and uh, Dr. Roshni from Bangalore. I hope all of you are here. Okay. Yes, sir. All have logged in, sir. Perfect. Perfect. So uh, let's start with this case. Here is a 63-year-old woman who presented to the uh, healthcare practitioner with a lump in her breast. She had a 2.1 centimeter right breast mass and a two, say, a two, centimeter, a two palpable lymph nodes. Her ultrasound and mammogram confirmed these physical findings. And she was referred to a medical oncologist and a, had a core biopsy which showed the hormone receptor positive, HER2 negative breast cancer by immunohistochemistry. And the uh, CT chest, abdomen and pelvis uh, showed two liver lesions. The brain MRI was negative for meds. She's a de novo patient. So let's start with jo Dr. Jovita. So what would you do for this patient? And do you, think, do you think the treatment paradigm is rapidly evolving for patients in this particular subset of hormone receptor positive HER2 negative advanced breast cancer? Dr. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, thank you for this question, sir. Um, just as you said, definitely there's a great uh, improvement in the way we look at uh, this subside, this particular subtype. Yeah. There was a time when we just had only chemotherapy in our armamentarium, and now we have the CDK4-6 inhibitors. But the only decision uh, point that will, uh, you know, it, uh, the decision will depend upon whether the patient is affordable enough for a CDK4-6 or the patient, uh, you know, is on the porous uh, side. So if the patient is um, not really affordable, then I will definitely go for chemotherapy only. Otherwise, the best take will be uh, to go for CDK for 600. I think that's a fair point. I'm sure the other panelists also would agree because there is also growing data in all kinds of subsets of uh, hormone receptor positive HER2 negative, including visceral crisis. And the entire paradigm has changed. And now we have the CD4, uh, CDK46 in combination with the different endocrine therapies, which has uh, literally revolutionized the treatment in this particular subset. And uh, just to allude on to the point of how the CDK46 inhibitors act, they basically prevent uh, CDK4-6 uh, binds to the uh, CDK1 and then there's a G1 to S uh, 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 in the cell cycle. But again, what happens is because of the CDK4-6 inhibition, the, it prevents the RB phosphorylation and hence this uh, transcription factor E2F is blocked and that's how the CDK4-6 inhibitors act. So uh, like uh, Dr. Jovita did mention that now it's part of... Uh, all the guidelines and would definitely we would all go ahead with this uh, kind of uh, treatment, including the NCCN, the ABC6 also mentions, and as well as the uh, in the premenopausal and postmenopausal women. Now, uh, several uh, CDK46 are, are, are uh, inhibitors are actually approved in the first line as well as in the second line setting based on the different trials. We have the Paloma 2 uh, and uh, we have the ribos for, for palbocyclib. We have the Paloma 3 as well for the second line and then Mona Lisa trials for the ribocyclib and the monarch trials for the abemacyclib. And uh, here it says, this slide says more of a PFS benefit, but we'll as we move forward, we'll also talk about the OS benefit, which has uh, literally changed the scenario. So Dr. Bhavesh, uh, are the treatment goals and standard of care similar for premenopausal and postmenopausal patients with advanced breast cancer? We always look at it as a different subset. So uh, what is your thought, Dr. Bhavesh? Dr. Bhavesh, you're there. Uh, Bhavesh, sir, you'll have to unmute your mic, sir. Okay, if not, uh, somebody else can take this question. Dr. Roshni, you want to take this question? 
Same for the pre-menopausal and post-menopausal women, but yeah. uh, specific uh, weightage might be added to the quality of life when it comes to the pre-menopausal women because we know we are they're going to the competing factor for uh, life will be less in them. So giving them an extended survival with a good uh, quality of life is more important for the pre. Otherwise, the goals would be same. Yeah. So any other panelists would like to add, uh, uh, Dr. Jeevan? Would you like to add something more? Jagan sir. Jagan. Uh, no. Again, sorry. Uh, uh, what uh, Rohini Madam told, the same things are actually, uh, we want to extend their survival with a good quality of life and almost similar uh, type. Now, uh, the pre menopausal except we are going to add up this uh, ovarian suppression. Yes. yes, perfect. So definitely the idea of uh, disease control as well as extending survival and maintaining quality of life definitely remains uh, the same in pre-menopausal as well as the post-menopausal women. But uh, when it comes to uh, other challenges, so, Dr. Monica, would you like to talk uh, talk about what other challenges you would face in premenopausal women as compared to postmenopausal? Uh, yeah, in uh, premenopausal women, uh, uh, like if they're very young women, uh, some of them have not yet uh, uh, like uh, completed their families. So, this is one challenge which I keep seeing. Like I have a uh, 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 few patients who are less than 35 years old, unfortunately presented with metastatic hormone positive or to negative breast cancer. So fertility is an issue in them. And uh, that is uh, something like, uh, which is uh, uh, quite uh, difficult to manage, which I find. And uh, the other thing is many of them are working women. And uh, so as it was uh, rightly pointed out by uh, the panelists uh, that uh, maintaining their quality of life is very, very important. I mean, quality of life is important even in postmenopausal women, but many of these young women, premenopausal women, they are uh, like working, they are teachers or they are uh, working in offices. So uh, coming frequently for chemotherapy sessions and uh, um, also uh, managing the uh, toxicities and again, taking leaves repeatedly because they develop toxicity due to the chemotherapy. These are things which are like a diff little difficult when it comes to a younger woman. And these younger women, uh, they might be having uh, like younger kids at home whom they have to manage a lot of uh, things. Social things also come into play when it comes to uh, the premenopausal women as compared to postmenopausal women. So fertility, it's uh, like a few patients of mine uh, who still hadn't even had one child. So they keep asking me, when can we um, uh, plan for a child? So that is something difficult because stopping hormone therapy and uh, uh, making them go through pregnancy is a very risky thing. It will uh, lead to a flare-up of the disease. So um, in them, like in vitro, fertilization and surrogacy, these are the options which need to be discussed about. And uh, yes, financially, that may not be possible for some of these patients also. So these are the challenges which I commonly face while uh, handling premenopausal women. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Monica. You brought out very nice and important points, the practical points. Apart from this, we know that this uh, younger patients are at a higher risk of relapse and death. They're more aggressive, greater symptom severity, and uh, the quality of life is also because of uh, various points you mentioned. Uh, they also have a lot of psychosocial and emotional challenges. And uh, they're, they're also worried about what menopause could mean to them and, uh, and uh, distress and it decrease energy levels and Correct. also uh, sexual function and uh, vitality, depression. Like you said, very important, uh, the, uh, the infertility issues. All these are very important points that definitely makes it a different subset as compared to the postmenopausal menopause. Yes. So uh, apart from this, this is something which we mentioned, higher grade and larger tumor sizes, more positive lymph nodes, and uh, they tend to have a lower DFS as compared to uh, more than 65 years of age. And uh, less than 35, we know, is an independent uh, risk factor. And uh, apart from that, uh, we did mention the other points. So uh, now I think I can see Dr. Babesh. So why is overall survival always considered an important uh, point in uh, advanced breast cancer? In fact, when uh, I do remember when I was a PG in ISMP UConn, we used to have this debate, overall survival versus progression-free survival in advanced breast cancer. What is the gold standard? So Dr. Babesh, what are your thoughts? So I think the overall survival has always remained a gold standard. We have just uh, tried in between to get some short goals like uh, EFS or DFS or even PAC CRs. So these are all our short-term goals, but uh, the gold standard has always remained the overall survival. Uh, only thing, because we have multiple lines in therapy, uh, 
including dr bhavesh you are breaking endocrine therapy chemotherapy so so due to bandwidth you just uh, st stopped your video sir please go ahead sir yeah so i think what dr bhavesh is trying to allude is definitely that os is uh, definitely an important gold standard and we know that uh, in patients uh, uh, the pfs because of multiple lines of therapy pfs may not exactly right. translate into os benefit and uh, the in fact the breast and uh, the nci uh, breast cancer steering committee working group also recommended that os may be a preferred endpoint especially when the so, post progression survival is less than 12 months because uh, the, the this definitely reflects the uh, meaningful the, and toxicity overall survival is the is overall survival has always been uh, Dr. Bhavesh, we are you're not audible, so we uh, we got your point. So OS reflects the balance between meaningful clinical benefit and toxicity. Like I mentioned, OS is definitely the preferred uh, uh, endpoint, and especially when the post progression uh, survival is less than twelve months. So uh, let me go to Dr. Mithun. Do you believe uh, improved OS without compromising quality of life is an achievable treatment goal in advanced breast cancer, Dr. Mithun? And we are dealing mainly with hormone receptor positive or HER2 negative. Dr. Mithun, you are there. Yeah, I am here. Yeah, please go. Ahead. I think uh, definitely with the uh, advent of CDK four six, uh, the quality of life can be maintained because most of the times we are not using uh, chemotherapy and hormone receptor positive, and we are trying to go ahead with the hormonal treatment plus the CDK four six. So definitely, I think uh, quality of life can be maintained with uh, improvement in overall survival. So when it comes to uh... Uh, a patient, do you uh, when it uh, so we have different uh, uh, endpoints, right? Okay, overall survival, progression free survival, quality of life, cost. So, which do you think is the most important? I think in the present era, quality of life is uh, most important, followed with overall survival. Yeah, of course, cost is always there. So yeah. this, uh, yeah, so we know this updated results from this phase three Mona Lisa seven trial of patients with premenopausal and perimenopausal patients. Uh, you can see that endocrine therapy plus ribocyclic. You can, it's, in fact, the update was uh, recently uh, published, and you can see the longest ever median overall survival for close to 60 months. That's five years. That's phenomenal after median follow-up of around 53.5 months with ribocyclic treatment, and the quality of uh, life was also maintained in the ribocyclic group. And uh, uh, this is the uh, Kaplan May curve. You can see that it's nicely the separated, and it's, it's also plateauing. And you can see that it's there's a 10.7 month. Uh, overall survival difference and uh, this and very impressive hazard ratio of 0 0.763. And uh, just like what Dr. Mithun mentioned that quality of life is very important and it goes to say that the time to deterioration was also delayed. And you can see that there was a difference of almost 12.5 uh, months. And this goes to say that the quality of life was also maintained in the ribocyclic arm and uh, the overall survival also was significantly longer. So, Dr. Jagan, what makes ribocyclic uh, as compared to other CDK4-6 inhibitors a treatment of choice for women with advanced breast cancer? So, we have three different CDK4-6 inhibitors. This is definitely a million-dollar question. Uh, which CDK4-6 inhibitor you would choose? And why do you think ribocyclic becomes a uh, choice? And uh, I know it's a NOAT-sponsored uh, session, but you can be uh, uh, pretty uh, uh, frank about it. Dr. Jagan? Unmute yourself. Unmute. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Regarding ribocyclic, uh, so, uh, I think it has a better uh, safety profile, except for the prolonged QT prolongation. Uh, sorry, except for the QT prolongation, uh, that doesn't have major side effects. Whereas palbocyclib has more uh, my, uh, myelosuppression, and whereas abimocyclib, as you all know, there is a gross diarrhea is a, um, a significant side effect. But recently with ribocyclib, we could see that there is a lot of uh, uh, pruritus and allergic manifestation we could see in few patients. And generally, I would choose because of the better PAP program reason and uh, ease of administration. And we can reduce the doses as we want. And these are all the things. And the, even uh, we have a proof of a longer uh, overall survival, which others uh, may be getting in the future. But as of now, we have the best one is for uh, ribocyclib. And uh, 
so that uh, these all things make me the ribocyclob as a first choice actually yeah that was very nicely summarized so we have survival we have quality of life and better safety profile like uh, dr jagan mentioned uh, palbo and ribo again uh, maybe the os is the one which clinches between abema and ribo i think uh, uh, though monarch to showed os benefit uh, again it also depends on the diarrhea because diarrhea sometimes becomes very problematic and of course the cost so he has uh, very nicely summarized these points and uh, more most importantly if you look at the pharmacokinetic aspects ribocyclob has uh, more selectivity for cdk46 versus cdk6 uh, and more drug is available and uh, which can penetrate into the tumor cells and can act so that way if you see compared to abemacyclob and palbocyclob even the pharmacokinetic aspects are also uh, technically better in ribocyclob and most importantly one other point uh, which i think uh, is also important we do see that uh, 600 mg is not tolerated by all our patients and we may uh, do a dose de escalate to uh, 400 mg and very rarely uh, for various reasons we might come down to even 200 mg uh, but uh, if you see here uh, the os probability in the mona lisa 3 and mona lisa 7 they have looked at dose reduction was it having any uh, any difference in the outcome and you can see here there was no difference in the outcome and uh, this goes to say that did not compromise the os benefit and there was no relationship uh, seen between os and dose reduction dose intensity or dr drug exposure which again is uh, very uh, uh, nice to see because we may have to dose de escalate in certain situations uh, due to side effect profile and uh, you can see here that ribocyclob is the only cdk46 inhibitor uh, uh, with three first line indications including pre and post menopausal women including visceral disease and multiple endocrine partners including uh, Uh, letrozole, tamoxifen, as well in the Mona Lisa seven uh, seven study, and you also have the fullest trend in the uh, Mona Lisa three study. So this definitely goes to say that it's uh, it's spread its uh, tentacles all over. So uh, quality of life has been uh, talked about by most of our panelists. And uh, uh, Dr. Roshni, would you like to emphasize on this MCPS score of ESMO? What do you think about this, and uh, uh, and how important would you consider this? Uh, Mona Lisa seven has got this ESMO MCBS score of uh, five. How would you, important would you consider this when you actually treat your patient? Yeah, considering that uh, uh, MCBS score is one of those scores which can uh, which gives good weightage to the quality of quality of life apart from the hard points of OS benefits. So it's a very comprehensive score to determine uh, what drug is going to give us the maximum benefit, compliance, and good quality of life. So considering that it is one of the only CDK46 inhibitors which has a MCBS score of five, that is that helps in the guidance that it should be one of the best choices because it's a very comprehensive score and a good data point to guide us through the treatment. So would all my panelists agree that uh, this Mona Lisa three showing four and uh, seven uh, showing five is actually maintained in the real world experience as well? What about the other panelists, Dr. Babesh? Yes, I actually totally agree with it uh, because especially in India, when we have a good patient support program, uh, using CDK four six uh, choice by choice as a ribocyclic is better. Uh, quality of life is better, and I think uh, the efficacy is definitely much better. So, including all the all the points what we usually see in practice uh, in the usual pra clinical practice, uh, this course is almost uh, close to as as close to real real world. Okay, thank you. So, um, do all CDK four six result in an improvement in OS in women with advanced breast cancer? So, I will ask Dr. Monica this question. So, what do you think, uh, Dr. Uh, Monica, uh, so uh, uh, what is what is your opinion about this? Uh, with regards to OS, uh, as uh, it was discussed earlier, probably ribocyclob is the only drug which has demonstrated a, a significant OS benefit across the trials. And uh, the other reason why we may not be able to see a significant OS benefit with the other CDK four six inhibitors is uh, probably because of the subsequent lines of therapy that patients are receiving. But uh, yes, uh, if we see uh, ribocyclob is the only drug which has demonstrated the OS benefit so far. Although all the drugs have consistently shown a PFS benefit, this uh, sort of an OS benefit we are only seeing with uh, ribocyclob. So, Dr. Monica, I would like to interrupt you here. And uh, what do you think about Monarch two showing that OS benefit of around, uh, 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 I think, close to nine months, right? So, was it that Monarch two also did show uh, the OS benefit? 
yes, Monarch Two also Abima Cyclib, was yeah. benefit. Yes, with Abima Cyclib. So right. um, uh, yes, I mean like Abima Cyclib also, but as discussed again, like we need to take the other parameters also into consideration. The cost is the main driving force in choosing. Uh, ribocyclib over abima cyclib so uh, when we have uh, a drug which has like across three trials has demonstrated os benefit uh, or obviously the balance would tip more in favor of uh, ribocyclib yeah i think i totally agree with the very fair points uh, raised by dr uh, monica and the other thing is only 15% of the patients in monarch 2 if you want to compare between monalisa 7 and 2 only 15% were actually uh, premenopausal in the monarch 2 study and in terms of uh, safety Uh, I think we have discussed about this uh, safety profile, uh, Dr. Jovita and Dr. Roshni. I think uh, you have anything else to add apart from what uh, Dr. Jagan mentioned. He did mention, but do you want to add anything about maybe we can specifically talk about QT prolongation? In your experience, have you noticed any patient, uh, especially when it comes to adding in premenopausal patients, when you want to select maybe tamoxifen as a partner, they say that the QTC prolongation is higher. What is your experience, and uh, would you not consider that combination and Uh, can you talk about that? Uh, yes, sir. I have had a, an experience where I had a postmenopausal lady whom I started with a uh, ribocyclib, and after about six months, I was closely watching her. I did see a QT prolongation, and I found that uh, it wasn't advisable to continue with ribo, and therefore I had to shift it to palbo, and she's now doing well. But uh, you know, overall, the response. with respect to the tumor size reduction uh, you know it is very quick that I have seen it with the uh, ribocyclib the other important uh, pharmacokinetic aspect as you already has i have discussed it is eight times more uh, so the off target kinase inhibitions are also less with, uh, with respect to ribocyclib which needs to be mentioned uh, we would also um, you know see other uh, points like you know in complement study it is also Uh, yeah, seen good effect that, with uh, Jovita. We'll come to that. So, any other uh, any other panelists would you like to mention any specific uh, situation where you had to dose uh, maybe interrupt significantly interrupt the uh, ribocyclib uh, for for a variable period of time? Any specific uh, side effect? Any yeah, Dr. Vishwana, the, can I uh, tell a point? Yeah, please. Uh, so this QT prolongation, um, I also had seen it with two of my patients, but uh, uh, it, it's very important to look at the drug drug interactions also uh, because uh, if they're using any other drug which is causing QT prolongation, then uh, like just stopping or replacing that drug uh, can uh, also take care of this. so usually uh, like most of my patients whoever were on ribocyclib they were not able to tolerate the 600 mg od dose so most of them were on 400 which was like fairly well tolerated but still despite 400 mg dose i did see qt prolongation in one or two of them and i distinctly remember one patient who took azithromycin for 5 days for upper respiratory infection yeah. so these, these are the things which need to be seen Yeah, definitely. That's a so very one, fair. One other point, point I forgot to tell you is transaminases uh, are also on the rise. There's one of right. my premenopausal patients which have who had an increase in transamin, so I decreased the dose. Sir. Yeah, even the literature says that around nine to ten percent may have transaminase elevation, which has to be taken care of. So uh, I think we yeah. have just we have discussed. Uh, there is some significant skin toxicity we could see, sir, dermatitis or allergic okay. reactions. That is also requiring a road dose reduction. That is. That's an interesting point. Yeah, so uh, I'll go to the next question. Uh, do you think we'll quickly? I I uh, just request my panelists to be as brief as possible because we'll try to cover even Tivicto. Uh, so, do you think the treatment paradigm has been uh, redefined? I think we have kind of discussed this. I don't think we should go into this. This all this has been discussed, and the overall survival now in the Mona Lisa seven, and uh, we also talked about uh, see Mona Lisa three in the post menopausal, and uh, post Mona Lisa seven in the pre menopausal, and then the. for the mona lisa 2 in combination with letrozole all this has been discussed and uh, we also uh, did see that the quality of life and the safety profile is all better with ribocyclib and i think somebody raised a point about this complement study so i would a quick i want a quick answer from each one of the panelists so maybe i'll start with dr bavesh what do you think with this complement study i know we all use abemacyclib uh, as the first line in brain metastasis would anything change of this large 3200 uh, patients in that they saw around around 50 patients had brain metastasis and there was actually a intracranial benefit 
and uh, you can also see that uh, the uh, the look at this uh, Kaplan Meyer curve. Does it make any sense to you? And would you actually consider using ribocyclob in these patients? So five minutes left, sir. Yeah, I know that. Quick, uh, quick yes. Uh, maybe Dr. Babesh can just conclude yes. this, and then we can go to the next uh, thing. I think this is uh, one of the subgroup analysis uh, which is showing some improvement, and uh, um, definitely we can consider um, this as one of the alternative if abimacyclic is not, uh, 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 you know, the patient is not able to afford it. Then I think uh, this is a better choice, and uh, with this uh, complement study, we have some data to back up and uh, include this into our AMA material. Okay, perfect. So let me quickly go to after CDK46. What are the choices? I think uh, Dr. Uh, Monica, you can start. Uh, so we uh, do have uh, uh, quite a few uh, drugs now and uh, uh, including quite a few in clinical trials. So uh, would you do PIK3 mutation testing? Uh, is it liquid biopsy or tissue? So what would you do? Quick answer. Uh, yeah, I do PIK3 CA uh, testing. Uh, preferably, I do it at baseline itself and I do it on the tissue. Okay, that's perfect. And we have this uh, solar one study where, uh, in fact, they use this... Uh, uh, patients, uh, they, uh, they added uh, this alpha plus uh, full strength and especially in pay and uh, the, we have two trials. We have the solar one, which actually had a very small set of patients who had prior CDK46. And we also have this uh, phase, three non -random, phase two non-randomized trial, the uh, bi-leaf study, which actually showed the benefit by, with this combination. So Dr. Mithun, so uh, what is your experience with using this uh, uh, this alpha is uh, with full strength in the uh, second line, especially we nowadays we are seeing only patients who are uh, four CDK four six. Quick answer from you. You're muted. You're muted. Yeah. <coughs> Means uh, this is one which causes hormone resistance. Actually, most of the patients can progress. So I think uh, we should be checking this uh, in tissue, and uh, most of the time uh, it gives a good response. But only issue is with. Uh, shorter response I found. Yeah, perfect. Shorter. Point taken. So you will start with liquid biopsy and if it is negative, then you go for tissue. So yep. uh, so this was better overall response rate, literally doubling of the overall response rate in the combination 35.7% versus 16.2% around six to seven months of PFS benefit. And you can also see that patients who had a CT DNA positive, they had actually a better response. And, uh, and, uh, so what are the ideal precautions? Last few questions before you start patient on alpalisib, Dr. Roshni and Dr. Mithun, you can quickly take these questions. How would you manage? Uh, what about hypoglycemia, rash, diarrhea, and stomatitis? Two questions to you each. A mucocutaneous so, reaction patient information and education is one of the most important uh, okay. steps. I think, and uh, involvement in endocrinologist early on, uh, along with lifestyle modification is something that I would choose before starting the patient on alpalisib. Yeah, so that's very important. So uh, now, now they say the guidelines that if you your fasting sugar should be less than 140 and the HbA1c should be less than 6.5 before you start this uh, alpalisib. And depending on the uh, sugar levels, again, uh, there is also uh, when to start metformin. And uh, now we have also this uh, newer drugs, uh, which can be uh, added. Uh, and then uh, you can also consider going down on the dose depending on the sugars if it is not uh, controlled that well. So there are, this algorithm is there everywhere for us to read. And uh, what about the use of prophylactic antihistaminics in uh, to prevent uh, this alpalisib induced rash? Doctor uh, was asking. Uh, maybe anyone can take this question. Doctor Monica. Uh, I haven't used this drug in any patient, but uh, yes, uh, uh, after interacting with few of my colleagues, uh, they do use uh, um, antihistamines, and that does reduce the intensity and the uh, incidence of the rash. Okay, perfect. Yeah, we have used it in one or two patients. We are generally giving with that allegra of exophenadin. And, and do you think major it's problem was compliance in your patients? And do you think it's improved compliance in your patients? And uh, how often have you seen rash? Because they say that uh, rash and hyperglycemia are the ones which happen early, and the yes. diarrhea is the one which happens late. So how recently we have started, rash? and within uh, ten days, fifteen days itself, she has developed a severe hyperglycemia and uh, this rash. So I have just given antihistamines and hold the, with all the medicines. We have to wait and see how. So, so according to you, uh, uh, you have been uh, basically practicing the use of prophylactic uh, antihistaminics, and that's yeah. it. Yes. Yeah. So that kind of summarizes. I thank you. Uh, I thank all my distinguished panelists for uh, answering the questions very efficiently, and uh, and uh, we we were, we managed to cover this entire uh, uh, 
um, uh, topic in half an hour. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks, Dr. Vishwanath, for that enlightening uh, discussion on CDK46 inhibitors and also covering on ribocyclib. I think uh, some of the side effects you have already mentioned, but some side effects may really deter continuation of treatment or interruption of treatment like skin toxicity. Apart from whatever you said, QTC prolongation, that's not so common if you monitor regularly, but skin toxicity is really common. It happens uh, really after six or seven cycles, even after one year, you find people are coming with skin toxicity. The most common one is hyperpigmentation of the face, neck, and hand, and sometimes associated with itching. Sometimes only itching starts initially, then you get hyperpigmentation. This I've seen at least six or seven of my patients, and I had to use uh, you know different kinds of uh, uh, drugs, uh, I mean, um, like antihistaminics, and also dermatology opinion on managing the side effects and interruption for for one or two months and the later restarting with uh, uh, reducing the dose to 400. That is one important. I also had some patients developing severe urticarial rash and then this rash subsided. Then you like hypoderma, uh, like leucoderma patches uh, occurring on the skin. This also has hampered, uh, you know, continuation of treatment. And I found uh, one consultant has used 200 milligram of ribocyclib for uh, not only elderly patients, for some patients, and uh, some people are doing very well with 200 milligram. I really don't know, but one of my patients, uh, you know, she was very sick, bedridden, and I had given her 200 milligram initially with um, uh, this one, eczemestane, and uh, she felt very better and she became all right and starting, uh, started walking. When I increased the dose to 400 milligram, then she says, no, no, I'm finding it very difficult. But uh, over seven months now, she's continuing with only 200 milligram. So we must find out this efficacy of this 200 milligram versus 400, 600. Though the, your trial says that the uh, reduction of the dose does not uh, interfere with the overall survival. So I must wait and see. But uh, most of my patients who tolerate well also have skin toxicity at some point of, you know, this is, I think this is the most important toxicity in ribocyclob. And uh, almost uh, nearly 20 patients have used ribocyclob. And after one year also, I've seen the skin toxicity coming up. And women, especially when they get hyperpigmentation over the face, they refuse to take it. And alopecia also is implicated in our uh, toxicity profile, but alopecia is not so common. And sometimes the stomatitis and gastritis. Uh, specifically, they say after taking ribocyclob, we have this burning sensation inside the stomach and it takes nearly two, three hours for it to subside. And so one patient refused to take ribocyclic because of this. So all these toxicities, you know, practical, uh, you know, practically, which makes you think that how, uh, you know, how to manage this. But I have managed only with antihistaminic some patients and moisturizers and some lotions from the dermatologist and reducing the dose or stopping for one or two months. And then restarting again with ribocyclib has helped them to continue with the treatment. Also, one more side effect, which I noticed is interstitial lung disease, which is supposed to be very rare in these trials. Also, they find 1% of these patients in Mona Lisa combined trial and in Paloma trial also, 1% of patients develop uh, interstitial lung disease and the uh, mortality due to interstitial lung disease was less than uh, 1%, like 0.9%. But I had one patient who developed grade three interstitial lung disease where I have to stop uh, ribocyclib. And then after two months, she settled. And then I had started her with uh, 400 milligram. She is continuing. I have to find out how her lung disease is uh, going to worsen or remain stable in that situation. So these unusual uh, side effects we can we do see sometimes. And liver function uh, abnormalities are very common and mild one or two times elevation of enzymes. You don't have to worry at all. And similarly, all your patients after, say, five or six cycles, they will have total WBC count of only 2,000. And you don't have to worry about it. You continue and never, uh, you know, you don't have to stop or uh, uh, reduce the dose or anything like that. As long as your ANC is over 1,000, you can continue that. I had only one patient who had neutropenic sepsis because she had uh, radiation at that point initially for the lumbar region. And so she developed neutropenia and sepsis. Of course, she recovered after that. And she continued ribocyclib. 
So I think all over, Dr. Vishwanath did justice to this uh, topic. And I think it's very informative and practical, important also for to manage premenopausal as well as postmenopausal patients with advanced breast cancer, keeping quality of life in mind. I think we should be able to uh, treat our patients more effectively nowadays. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you so much, ma'am. Uh, with that, we'll move on to our next session. Our next session is on breast oncology, and I invite our two chairpersons, uh, Dr. Sudeep Gupta, Senior Medical Oncologist from Mumbai, and Dr. K.B. Akila, Senior Medical Oncologist from Coimbatore. Over to you, sir and ma'am. Good afternoon, all of y'all. I first of all thank the organizing persons and uh, Dr. Kripa Shankar for giving me this opportunity. Uh, first, uh, till now we have been really hearing a lot about hormone positive breast cancer with CDK4 inhibitors. Okay, now like we'll go on to, like in this hormone positive breast cancers, we all of us know that we have to give adjuvant endocrine therapy. Initial days were just tamoxifen for five years, then came aromatase inhibitors for five years, then it became switch therapy. Now it is like tamoxifen for 10 years, and of course, still, are we really sure that we have to give tamoxifen for 10 years? I'm sure Dr. Krishna Prasad can enlighten on us on this issue. Over to you, sir. Thank you, madam. Is my slide visible? Uh, yes, sir. Thank you, madam. So uh, I was given an interesting topic. Is it come to salsa? So uh, with very keen interest, I started reading about it and came across this paper, which was published in the National Cancer Institute Journal, Breast Cancer Research uh, Journal by the National Cancer Institute, Maryland. What they did is they tracked 2,000 women for 11 years. And at the start of the study, the women were asked, what exercises would they do? Gentle and strenuous exercise. An example of vigorous activity included salsa. So over a period of 11 years, out of 32,000 women, 1,500 developed breast cancer. And analysis showed that vigorous exercise, including salsa, cut the risk of breast cancer. So I was thinking that this is a very interesting topic and go on and on. But ultimately, Kripa Shankar brought me back to world and told me that we need to speak about the other salsa. So we all know that breast cancer, especially ER positive breast cancer, has got a unique way of relapsing and the chance of relapse continue to remain more or less the same for the next 12 to 20 years. You can see in this uh, graph that ER negative breast cancer have a very high uh, rate of uh, relapse in the first two to four years and it turn rapidly, whereas ER positive tend to continue to relapse at a low frequency. We also know that tamoxifen given for one or two years reduce the, ch uh, the chances of recurrence by around 8% at the end of 10 years. And if you give tamoxifen for five years, the uh, recurrence rate reduced by 14%. We also know that uh, as the uh, T status worsens and as the number of nodes increases, the chances of late relapse at the end of 20 years is quite high. So 47%, which is a very, very high number. So the idea of extending endocrine therapy came because of these late recurrences, which are probably because of dormant disseminated cells, which are able to hibernate and stay in the G0, G1 cycle phase for a long period of time within normal tissues. So something happens changed condition, including a microenvironmental signal change or change in immune surveillance, or in fact, acquiring a resistance to endocrine therapy, which triggers a clinical relapse. So uh, we, previously we were happy with five years of tamoxifen, AI, or a, a you know, switch from tamoxifen to AI, and now the dil mange more. So we consider extended therapy with additional five years of tamoxifen or AI. So there are multiple trials on this subject. I will just look at two studies from the ATLAS and ATOM trial where they looked at tamoxifen for five years after tamoxifen and you can see excellent results with that. Also the other three trials, the NMA17, the NSBPB33 and the Austrian Breast Cancer Study Group 6A showed that 
if you give ai after tamoxifen for roughly uh, total period of 10 years there is excellent benefit there are also trials where they initially gave a combination of ai with tamoxifen that is a switch or they gave ai initially and then continued ai which is the uh, data trial the nsabp 42 and the ma17r so for a total period of 10 years or sometimes even up to 15 years and also there are other studies to look at little bit of more optimal uh, duration of treatment so at the two trials which tried for around 10 years of uh, letrozole the ma17r trial which randomized patients who had already received 5 years of ai to either another 5 years or to placebo the 5 year disease free survival was significantly improved with giving letrozole so the total period of aromatase inhibitor in this trial suggested 10 years however if you look at the trial closely most of the benefits to be because of improvement or reduction in contralateral breast cancer the nsabp b42 trial wherein they tried to give letrozole after uh, giving aromatase inhibitors for 5 years or the switch uh, protocol initial results at the end of 7 years did not show uh, any benefit but when the follow up was at 10 years it showed a statistically significant benefit in terms of disease free survival with the delta being around 4% if you look at the uh, nuances of this trial age uh, a younger age group and pathological uh, notes being positive and also having primary tamoxifen rather than giving uh, aromatase inhibitor from the beginning where the patients were uh, benefit all for an additional 5 years was very significant also in this trial there was improvement not only in terms of a contralateral breast cancer reduction but also in terms of distant recurrence however this new trial that is a duration of adjuvant aromatase inhibitor therapy in postmenopausal breast cancer popularly known as the salsa was uh, published last year it did not show any benefit to 7 uh, to 10 years of aromatase inhibitor compared with 7 years so 5 years of extra anestrozole versus 2 years of anestrozole was compared and you can see there is no improvement in disease free survival nor in terms of overall survival what improved or what deteriorated was the incidence of bone fracture there was no you know, difference in terms of local recurrence distant recurrence contralateral breast cancer second primary and also death without recurrence so basically in the salsa trial they took patients who had received hormonal therapy for 5 years and they continued uh, i mean they switched to or continued aromatase inhibitors for another 2 years versus 5 years and found that there is no difference but when you look at the trial carefully most of the patients that is 75% of the patient had t1 tumor and out of the remaining another more, uh, majority of them were t2 so very early stage disease in terms of t status and also in terms of nodal status majority of them were n0 and few of them were n1 another interesting thing was hardly 7% of the patient actually received aromatase for 10 years so only 7% of them had aromatase inhibitors for the first 5 years and then we were randomized to 2 versus 5 years extra majority of them received first 5 years of tamoxifen and around 40% of them received the switch therapy so in uh, in reality this was a trial which uh, compared ba uh, basically extra 2 years or 5 years of aromatase inhibitor to patients who actually received tamoxifen in the first 5 years or the switch protocol there was another trial uh, you know called the ideal study which was very similar to this trial however in this trial there were number of patients who were more positive in fact lot of them uh, had more than uh, three nodes positive and also many of them around 28% of them received initial 5 years of aromatase inhibitors and only 12% in this ideal trial received the first 5 years of tamoxifen what did this trial show this trial was very similar in terms of results uh, to the uh, uh, salsa trial in this ideal trial additional 5 years of aromatase inhibitors was no better compared to 2 and 1/2 years 
in terms of disease free survival in terms of overall survival and distant metastasis the only difference was in terms of second breast cancer so it could be argued that extended endocrine adjuvant therapy with aromatase inhibitor beyond 7 and a half years actually served as secondary uh, you know prevention rather than adjuvant therapy so is it time for 7 years treatment for all our patients see nsabp b42 trial actually showed some difference only after a longer follow up of 10 years so also atlas and atom trial if you look at the actual difference majority of the benefit seems to be there or the difference between 5 and 10 years of treatment is there only at the end of 15 years not at the end of 10 years so is it possible that a longer follow up of both the salsa and the ideal uh, trials would throw up some difference in terms of benefit for the longer treatment also in terms of toxicity which uh, salsa trial showed that increased osteoporosis now the ma 17 r trial showed the quality of life was same whether you gave 10 years of ai 5 years of ai and in the nsabp b42 trial 10 years of uh, ai did not actually increase osteoporotic fracture so you have trials which show that there is no increase of osteoporotic fractures also nowadays with the routine use of bisphosphonates maybe osteoporotic fractures are not that big a deal also with the uh, use of cdk4 inhibitor in adjuvant therapy of uh, you know hormone responsive breast cancer where does this extended hormonal therapy fit into also in premenopausal patients who are now being offered ovarian function suppression what is the benefit of giving more than 5 years of hormonal therapy so there are lot of questions to be answered still however we can conclude that both the salsa and the ideal trial suggested that the ideal duration of hormone therapy probably is hovering around 7 years in most of our patients if you want to give beyond 7 years probably there are few group of patients where the benefit is there maybe these are the group where you have started with tamoxifen rather than ai and your patients have got multiple lymph nodes being positive and have a large tumor risk of complication may be low but it is real and selection is now becoming more and more difficult with the availability of more and more other options including uh, you know uh, cdk4 inhibitor and ovarian function suppression thank you thank you so much sir uh, sudeep sir would you like to uh, give any comments on the same sir no i think uh, dr krishna prasad has nicely summarized the data including the uncertainties involved in extended adjuvant therapy and i have no more comments and i don't see any questions in the chat box as well uh thank you so we'll move on to our uh, to our debate right do you want me to invite yes sir please that'll be great sir okay so i think uh, first of all i would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to this uh, excellent session um we have a debate and the debate is a very topical one whether uh, it is time to use cdk46 inhibitors as adjuvant treatment in er positive early breast cancer and we have two excellent speakers dr aditya murli will argue for using cdk46 inhibitors and dr saurav mishra will argue against it so we will invite dr murli to present the case for using cdk46 inhibitors in the adjuvant setting thank thank thanks to organizers and thanks uh, dr sudeep sir for uh, uh, having me given this given this opportunity to me so uh, before i start off just one second okay uh, my screen is visible right yes sir yeah okay thank you so over the next 7 odd minutes this is what i am uh, going to be talking about there is definitely a role for uh, cdk46 inhibitors in the adjuvant setting uh, that would be a resounding yes from my side uh, so over the last 20 odd years the evolution of early breast cancer management has evolved somewhat like this we started off with tamoxifens and then there was the aromatase inhibitors era 
and then came the the path breaking uh, soft and text trials which looked at trying to add ovarian suppression and then we had the extended adjuvant therapy era and we can see from the graph over here that you know the the difference from tamoxifen to aromatase inhibitor was maybe adding another 3.6% of uh, idfs but uh, going forward we do know that uh, uh, at least 20 to 30% of the stage 3 uh, hormone positive breast cancer patients are going to relapse and is there something more that we can add to sort of reduce this risk of recurrence uh so a uh, majority of my talk here would be concentrating on the path breaking monarch e trial uh, data on this has been uh, you know presented at most of the conferences in last year so essentially we know that adjuvant abemacyclib combined with uh, endocrine therapy has previously demonstrated clinically meaningful improvement in the idfs and dfs in hormone positive uh, her2 negative uh, high risk early breast cancer so when the statistical significance was met this uh, the the data presented at sabcs last year was basically uh, it was a follow up which was limited to median of 15.5 months and uh, uh, i would uh, discuss the data which has been uh, presented uh, at a median follow up of 27 months Uh, the role of ki67 index as a marker for cellular proliferation has also been further exposed in this uh, particular presentation so the monarchy study had uh, uh, the trial key schema was somewhat like this essentially it was a straight forward uh, comparison between abemacyclib given at a dose of 150 mg uh, twice daily along with endocrine therapy or the standard of care uh, the interesting thing here was that the, the trial investigators divided into two cohorts cohort 1 was defined as high risk based on clinical and pathological features the clinical features included uh, involvement of more than four uh, axillary lymph nodes or one to three axillary lymph nodes with uh, grade 3 disease or a tumor size of more than 5 uh, when we talked about the cohort 3 the the, uh, the lymph node criteria was reduced slightly it was made as one to three axillary lymph nodes and a ka67 of more than 20% so grade 3 and tumor size more than equal to 5 were not included in this analysis so uh, the this has been Uh, presented in last year's sabcs and this shows that you know the invasive disease free survival uh, benefit was maintained even when an additional follow up of 27 uh, months was median follow up was achieved uh, when we used abemacyclib with endocrine therapy in the uh, adjuvant setting we can see that the hazard ratios are about 0.69 which is very significant considering the fact that this is a adjuvant trial and not a metastatic trial so the two year difference was about 2.7% the three year difference was again uh, nearly 5.4% the absolute difference in idfs rates between the investigative arm and the standard of care arm was about 5.4% at three years uh in this forest plots we can see that uh, uh, except grade 1 over here wherein uh, there was clearly no benefit of adding abemacyclib to endocrine therapy uh the ac- across most of the other subgroups there was a benefit of adding an abemacyclib to endocrine therapy in patients with uh, high risk early breast cancer disease so uh, when 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 we look at it you know there was an increasing magnitude of idfs and the drfs benefit from first to second year and uh, uh, as we go forward as uh, the data becomes more mature uh, there is very likely that the, the curves will separate wider and the benefits will even uh, increase uh, uh, with time uh, so uh, the this this was basically on the back of that uh, presentation uh, about uh, about a month or two ago asco came out with an update uh, this was you know about a month and a half back and this said uh, this talked about you know the use of abemacyclib with endocrine therapy in the treatment of high risk early breast cancer this was optimal adjuvant chemotherapy and target therapy rapid recommendation update um, Uh, on the back of that again fda also came out with a approval and uh, fda approved abemacyclib with endocrine therapy for high risk early breast cancer and and th- this is one slide wherein you know i i, I wanted to show to everyone to see why fda came up with this particular recommendation so what fda said is that you know approximately 70% of the breast cancers are hormone positive and her2 negative uh, the high but approximately 30% of patients will relapse with local or metastatic disease which makes it incurable so if we are able to identify high risk features such as size grade number of lymph nodes involved and ki67 there is a uh, there is definitely this is going to be unmet medical need and we would try and need to improve the long term outcomes such as idfs and the overall survival so when we added abemacyclib 
in this particular subset there was a statistically significant improvement in idfs in the intention to treat arm abima cycle plus et demonstrated a statistically significant improvement in idfs uh, the os data is mature i know that uh, my colleague who is going to speak next is going to be uh, talking about a little bit about the os data but i just want to throw it out there that there is the os data is mature and we should not draw any uh, conclusions from the os data Uh, so to conclude my talk uh, with additional follow up adjuvant abimacyclib combined with endocrine therapy continued to demonstrate a clinically meaningful benefit for patients with hormone positive her2 negative node positive high risk early breast cancers this was based upon a robust idfs and drfs benefit which was maintained beyond the two year treatment period of abimacyclib uh, the safety data set is definitely mature so so a, a big uh, point which somebody might argue against abimacyclib is the added toxicity when we are talking about a long term use of a drug in a adjuvant setting but the safety data set is mature more than 90% of the patients have been off the study treatment period and there were no new risk factors ki 67 was prognostic and abimacyclib benefit was consistent uh, with uh, long term follow up we will be able to get a final assessment of the overall survival so uh, in uh, perimesens absolutely iconic words because of phase 3 data because of asco recommendation because of usfda recommendation in high risk hormone positive early breast cancers who are her2 negative abimacyclib with endocrine therapy is the stand of care and i definitely rest my case over here thank you for a patient listening Thank you so much, sir. And now we hand over the mic to Dr. Sarv Kumar Mishra. So, thank you there. So, let me share my slides. So, is my screen visible? Yes, sir, it's visible. Yeah, thank you. So, so thank you there. Uh, for this opportunity so i would like to thank krupa first for reigniting this old rivalries so aditya is like my perennial uh, debating rival since college days and somehow very uh, eloquently uh, krupa has put us again in front of each other so what i am going to say about is that no this is not yet a prime time for the role of cdk4 inhibitors in the adjuvant setting and why so see the cdk46 inhibitors they are similar in terms of efficacy in advanced breast cancer how far you try to separate them we do understand that the way they are designed the very and the results which we have seen in the front front line setting in the advanced breast cancer these are similar molecules as you can see the hazard ratio the curves they look like these are similar molecules so when we get results we my uh, rival he discussed mainly purely about the monarchy trial but let me remind you this the the story for adjuvant cdk46 inhibitors in the adjuvant setting started with these negative trials that is for palpocyclib the penelope b and the pelas trial so here we saw that in the incorporation of palpocyclib in the adjuvant setting and with a good follow up we did not find a significant improvement in the invasive disease free survival so with similar molecules when we get this similar results that is the monarchy so the even the wisest of person would like to ask the question always more questions than answers there are so monarchy probably has added to more questions for cdk46 inhibitors rather than answers for them in the adjuvant setting we start with the first question is the follow up enough my 27.1 month is what the median follow up for this trial we know the recurrences in adjuvant setting in hormone receptor positive breast cancers are a big problem at subsequent point of time beyond 5 years and on the red dotted line on the left hand side we have the follow up for monarchy that is 27.1 month but on and we can very well see that the node positive and high risk subset of patients which was incorporated in this trial they have a risk of recurrence which is much high beyond 5 years and almost remains constant for up to 20 years so with the current follow up of 27 per 1 month are we confident using it in our clinical practice routinely no in this trial there have been none of the patients who have been followed up to 4 years so if at all we plan to use it we have to wait secondly can we say that the results of monarchy trial would persist over time we do not know that what is stopping us from seeing a curve like the panilope b 
we can see here that although the graphs start to separate early they completely merge with each other at a later point of time so is it there to say that the similar state of affairs would not would not happen with monarchy so the idfs benefits may or may not decrease over time and we have to wait for that before we use this drug in our routine practice third is it for all high risk hormone receptor positive early breast cancer no so i have underlined very clearly the fda approval is for hormone receptor positive breast cancer who are at high high risk and the high high risk is defined by the recurrence score of t67 more than equal to 20% and which has to be performed on an fda approved kit which is the catch in this study so we cannot use it for all high risk patients so let us say 5 cm tumor with four lymph nodes but e67 5% no this trial doesn't say that fda doesn't approve this indication for this drug and the ki67 is the key to the use of this drug and why we cannot use in all population because the benefit at all if was seen it was mainly in the patient who had the ki67 more than 20% not in the subset of patients because the had you know, the uh, upper limit of the hazard ratio almost uh, near unity so the key to the use of cdk46 inhibitor is the ki67 and harmonization of the ki67 is the key and we know that ki67 although it is a prognostic marker to predictive for cdk46 inhibitor in the adjuvant setting is a long way ki67 has lot of inter observer analytical variability why only 20% cut cut off why not any other levels of cut off standardization is the key so we across all laboratories in india ki67 is being performed and standardization for the use of abemacycle based on this fda approved kit is essential before we start using it so with all these shortcomings we do understand that we need additional biomarker for use of this molecule rather than the ki67 something which has less variability like the genomic proliferation signatures like the oncotype dx or the mamaprint or the pam50 luminal ab subtype before we use ebima cycle prime time in our clinical practice toxicity we cannot say that toxicity would not be a big deterrent is toxicity a deterrent for adjuvant use of tk as very much when we do not have sound results toxicity is what will guide the clinical decision 84% of the patient will have a diarrhea so with a 90% mature result 84% of the patient will have a diarrhea and even if it's a grade 2 diarrhea in the adjuvant setting it is definitely troublesome 10% of the patient will have a grade 3 diarrhea and do not forget about the high risk toxicities like the venous thromboembolism pulmonary embolism interstitial lung diseases because of which there will be dose reduction in 42.5% and the dose will be withheld in 60% of the patient quite a big thing to ask so when we are planning to use abima cycle if something is always in your mind and that is the loo you always think about the diarrhea and in a country where defecation becomes so difficult where you have to line up for the public toilet you may better end up owning a loo shop for yourself so the problem is that in public toilets in india if there is a current situation and what can be done about this i would suggest let us restrict the use of cdk46 inhibitors to the metastatic setting only till we have very good data in the adjuvant setting so with jokes apart if we have this toxicity we definitely have an impairment of quality of life we need data for these drugs in the adjuvant setting the patient related the, the, the patient related outcomes and when we have toxicities then there are financial toxicities should not be forgotten about this drug and when we have toxicity compliance is an issue and when compliance is an issue there is a chance that patients may be non compliant they may discontinue the drugs and when we discontinue the drugs the selection of resistant clones happens which is a serious consideration in real life so it is seen that in the new adjuvant setting if you stop abima cycle for a more than 4 days the ki67 rebounds in 67% of the 69% of the patient meaning selection of resistant clones and we see that with the toxicities there are likely that many 60% of the patients are likely to withhold the drug for some point of time leading to resistant clones what are going to happen to these patients if we discontinue with these drugs so with all of these understanding i do say that the benefits of this cdk46 inhibitors are not a class effect some of the drugs have benefit some of them no and we need to have 
to look at further data. We need longer follow-up in the adjuvant setting because for a hormone receptor positive breast cancer relapses occur much later. Then we have a follow-up here, 27.1 month. The benefits are dependent on centralized K67 done on an FDA approved kit. This is a big challenge in our country. K67 harmonization needs to be done. Toxicities are real time and are deterrent to its use. So there is a huge number of patients who are undergoing to have diarrhea. There is toxicity in, in interstitial lung disease, venous thromboembolism. And with all of these, there will be issues with compliance. We need to wait for the patient related outcomes also. Emergence of resistant clones at discontinuation is also a practical issue. So I would summarize that currently there is no role of CDK46 inhibitors in the adjuvant setting. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, sir. Uh, Sudeep, sir, should we take the questions? If I can just present one slide for rebuttal, if you just allow me for one slide for rebuttal, please. So, uh, sure, sir, but we request you to keep it under 30 seconds. Please. Just one slide. Okay. So, because a uh, uh, large part of uh, my colleagues talk, uh, dis uh, talked about the class effect, this is one slide to talk about how Palace was different from monarchy. Palas trial, uh, which was a negative trial for palbocyclib, that included a completely different subset of patients. There were 13 patients who were N0, and we know that N0 is not a early is not a high risk feature. There are only 38 percent of the patients who had more than four lymph nodes positive. Again, you know, not a very uh, uh, not the target population for uh, adjuvant use of CDKIs. Uh, the the hazards in the the IDFS hazards was 0 0.93. So obviously that reflects the kind of trial population which was chosen and very importantly the dose discontinuations over here was 42 percent when we use palbocyclib however in the monarch e the dose discontinuation was only 17 percent and the, um, the 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 next thing i want to tell is that fda has evaluated idfs as an outcome before approving any therapy for adjuvant treatment and they have found it quite robust so the wisdom of fda has to be respected uh question but yes respected uh final thing is that this uh i can Academic debate. So one thing that everybody's uh, no, agreed upon is at least in the subset of high risk early breast cancers, we have to use uh, financial uh, issues with uh, standardization of lab tests. We have to work with it over time, but that shouldn't uh, color academic debate. Thank you very much. So I think uh, to be fair, we should allow about half a minute or one minute rebuttal to Dr. Mishra as well, but please, if you can be very brief. So, sir, I will just say this, that although approved, but the bigger problem is the key 67. So, the approval is based on a kit, and we do not know how this kit is going to perform. So, like immunotherapy, we need to have this validated key 67 as well in our context. And definitely, we need to wait much, much longer. These are hormone receptor subset of patients, receptor positive subset of patients, and mere follow-up of 27.1 months doesn't say that we need to use this drug right now for all of these patients. Okay, very good. I think uh, we have Dr. Wesley Jones for the expert comments. Yeah, we thank you so it. much, sir, uh, Dr. Sudeep. Thank you so much. Uh, yes, we uh, have you here. Have... Perhaps you can also address Dr. Roshni Bhagwat's question in the chat box about the use of P67. How do we grapple with that? And also, if a patient also has germline BRCA mutation, then what would you use? So over to you, Dr. Jones. Right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I it was it was an excellent debate uh, between two perennial rivals, as I'm told. Uh, but I don't think we are going to see the end of it very quickly. Uh, to begin with, uh, I guess uh, uh, we we need to understand there is a lot of uh, undercurrents here. Instead of just uh, trying to put it as a large class of uh, uh, drug which can probably benefit in an adjuvant setting, we need to realize that all these drugs, even technically, pharmacokinetically, are different. Like for example, abimaciclib is a much uh, broader class compared to palbo and uh, ribo. You you realize that CDK46 not alone, but even CDK12 is affected by abimaciclib. Abimaciclib on, the, on one hand is given continuously, whereas you have a break for about seven days for both ribo and palbo. Uh, the time duration has been a confusion. You have palbo, your palace trial and Penelope trial, which has done only for two years. Uh, monarchy running for two years, Natalif with uh, RIBO going on for uh, three years. So all these things are still not standardized and probably we are 
comparing apples and oranges right now uh, but it's it's a good beginning it is not something that uh, uh, we should uh, restrict to but uh, we, we should probably have uh, a, a clearer understanding before we try and apply this onto our patients now uh, with the key 67 issue dr uh, mishra had uh, very beautifully put it key 67 has been uh, a big confusion including the international key 67 working group has not yet been able to come down to a, a absolute clear cut solution for the pathologists to follow and uh, we would understand that in a in a, in a country like ours with uh, so many labs around a lot of them uh, standardized versus non standardized you probably would be getting a very varied sort of uh, uh, a report and then based Based on just those reports, if you're going to deal uh, on, on these kind of uh, costly drugs, it, it may be a bit of a concern. Uh, how do we organize it? How do we make the key 67 more standardized in our country? Probably we need to have, probably we need to start with uh, centralized laboratories, especially for those patients who need to be on a molecule like this uh, and start from there and probably train pathologists in uh, taking uh, that into their own setups and then uh, having a constant, uh, a constant monitoring of all these, uh, all these uh, parameters that are done in the lab. The other issues that uh, Dr. Mishra pointed out was a cure issue. Now, diarrhea definitely uh, with uh, with uh, the drug uh, abimacyclid, and obviously neutropenia, leukopenia, and all the other things. If people end up using the other drugs, uh, these are serious concerns in an adjuvant setting. Whereas in, in a metastatic setting, probably our concerns are very very different. Where whereas in adjuvant setting, the patients that we deal with are all going to go back to their normal life, or going back, going to go back to what they were doing. These QOL issues would be of very, very serious concerns and would need to be addressed. The bigger deal with, uh, beyond this is, as, as pointed out, we have only 27 months of follow-up. Now, we do need to understand that we could be probably looking at the tip of the iceberg. We don't know what is below. Are we actually preventing a recurrence or just simply masking the whole thing? We really don't know that. The other question that we need to deal with is uh, what really happens if we put our patients on a routine basis, a lot of our high-risk patients on abimacyclib, what would happen if in case they fail at a point in time, say three years, four years from the beginning? What are we going to use then? Uh, are, do we, can we just put them on palbociclib or they, you, you go straight on to a PIK3 inhibitor? Uh, would we be probably pushing them into a bigger financial debt by starting off much uh, intense right in the beginning? We really don't know. Uh, on the other hand, the continued benefit of CDK4-6 inhibitor, the, the, the blockage after progression or recurrence, uh, is it the same as how we used to do for uh, trastuzumab? Again, another question which is not seriously answered. What does uh, it hold for future? Can we come to a point where we can say patients who are high risk, are hormone receptor positive, HER2 negative, can we entirely take them off the chemotherapy and just put them on CDK4-6 inhibitor? Another question to ask. So I would probably say that uh, the, the debate is not over at just with the monarchy trial being published. Uh, it has opened up a Pandora's box. You have so many more questions to answer before we make this a standard criteria for most of us to follow. So I think in situations where we're dealing with patients like this, we should make it a point to be honest, tell them what the scenario is and tell them what they can expect out of uh, making, making a choice between using CDK4-6 inhibitor as uh, adjuvant therapy versus keeping it for later. Uh, it, it, was, it was a beautifully presented uh, debate. Thank you so much for allowing me to speak. Thank you, Dr. Sudeep, sir. Uh, thank you so much, sir. Uh, we'll move on to the next uh, panel discussion. Uh, can I request Akila ma'am to please introduce our moderator and panelists? Uh, well, uh, I'm happy to introduce Dr. Manikandan, who's a good friend of mine and who'll be moderating this session on the topic where it's a response adapted therapy and maintenance strategies in her to positive and, of course, TNBCs. It's uh, quite a big topic. But I'm sure Dr. Manikandit will do it in the right way, in a short and sweet way, and will tell us clearly what has to be done at the end of the session. And I would like to introduce my panelists, Dr. Roshni, Dr. Reshma, Dr. Alunidhi Chalvan, Dr. Hanisha, Dr. Kisjit, Dr. Shefali, and Dr. Vidya Ramalingam. Over to you, sir, Dr. Manikandit. Yeah. 
Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I would like to thank the organizers and Dr. Kripa for this opportunity. Uh, so uh, the first question goes to Dr. Arunandi Chelvan. So the current ESMO and the NCCN guidelines recommends neoadjuvant therapy for all tumors uh, that are more than two centimeter in size. Uh, Dr. Arunandi, do you think uh, this is a strategy that uh, in India we should follow even for small tumors, say 2.1, 2.5 centimeter tumors? Do you think all of them receive new adjuvant uh, therapy? Yeah, flat. I do agree. Um, we, we, in fact, we have started following the same protocol uh, to treat our patients also. Mm. Do, do you think there will be to the new nodal assessment? Like, if you give new adjuvant therapy, then we may not know the exact uh, nodal stage. Uh, the of course, stage, that, that's yeah. So, how do we uh, work around it? Yeah, of course that uh, that is um, that will be a drawback, and um, um, we 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 clinically uh, go one step ahead in assessing these patients for the um, possibility of having an axillary node metastasis by doing an ultrasound axilla or a guided FNAC, um, and most of the patients undergo a PET CT, so PET directed uh, FNAC also um, we do at times. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nandi. So we will go to the uh, case presentation. I just have uh, two cases for discussion. So this is a 60-year-old female with carcinoma of the breast, clinically T3N1, infiltrating ductal carcinoma grade 2. She's triple negative and BRCA is wild type. She has finished a uh, total uh, eight cycles of neoadjuvant chemotherapy, dose-dense adriamycin cyclophosphamide and dose-dense uh, paclitaxel. Subsequently, she has underwent surgery and uh, histopathologically, it is a T2 disease. Uh, YPT2 uh, disease and the nodes are negative. And Dr. Vidya Ramalingam, uh, how do you think uh, we should proceed? Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, this um, uh, triple negative after neoadjuvant patient is having a residual disease. Uh, it's a T2. So according to CREATEX trial, uh, adjuvant capsitabin for six months uh, should be given. Uh, also, uh, as usual, post mastectomy radiation also should be given. Okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Roshni, uh, what do you think is the uh, survival benefit uh, with adjuvant capsitabin? Is it an overall survival or progression-free survival? Or what is the benefit? There is both a disease-free survival benefit of 70% versus around 55% and an overall survival of around 80 versus uh, 70% with adjuvant capsitabin. Okay, okay. Okay, good. So uh, there is a clear overall survival benefit also in patients uh, with triple negative breast cancer who receive adjuvant capsidibin. Dr. Reshma, uh, how, do you, how, how should we sequence the capsidibin? Uh, should we finish the radiation and then start capsidibin? Or do you think concurrent is an option? Or uh, should we give capsidibin first, uh, followed by subsequent local treatment, if that is warranted? Sir, nowadays, since the radiation is very short course, I think we can finish off the radiation. And after that, we can start off with the capsidibin. Then it avoids the toxicities. And we can continue it for the next eight cycles. So I think completing the radiation and then starting is it, starting it immediately is a better option. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. Hani, uh, Dr. Hanisha, uh, do, do you routinely do uh, this mutational analysis before capsitabin? Or Dr. Shifali? Uh, Anisha, I'm you to mute yeah. yeah, yeah. Sorry. According to the Olympia trial, we don't usually do the BRCA mutation in the early stage uh, breast cancer. Only in the metastatic setup, we go for BRCA mutation analysis. But according to the recent data from the Olympia trial, uh, we can go for, if the patient is BRCA positive, then there is a role of uh, Olaparib, adjuvant Olaparib, which shows PFS benefit. Okay, okay. Okay, actually my question was, do we have to do a DPYD mutational testing before you start capsidibin? Do you do the test, wait for the report and start? Uh, or in your practice, you generally uh, don't do it? I generally don't do it. Do it. Okay, okay, all right. Okay, uh, Dr. Joshi, uh, what do you think in case the, the pathological response, there is only a small tumor, say a four millimeter tumor, that is T1A. Do you think still those patients we should offer uh, capacitabin or do you think uh, those patients, uh, uh, they may not benefit much? for very small pathological residual tumor, like uh, less than five millimeter. There is definitely always been, sorry. Yeah. 
So although in this CREATEX only a small proportion had T1A, uh, even those subset who did not achieve pathological response clearly had a, a clear benefit. And uh, say, Dr. Roshni, in case a patient is BRCA mutant and uh, there is no logistic issues, how do you, uh, do you think Olaparib is an option or Capecitabin is an option or both uh, should be offered? Uh, patients with BRCA mutant who have a residual disease after neoadjuvant therapy. See, for the Olympia trial, we don't have the overall survival uh, data. So if the patient is affording, we can offer both to them if there is residual disease after surgery. But we need to explain that we don't have the OS data for the Olaparib. Okay, and we okay. need to discuss the quality of life issues also. In case of the CREATE X, if the patient is not tolerating capsetibine, then one can always try to use that Chinese trial for one year capsetibine. But Olaparib, there are issues with QOL in terms okay, of okay. nausea, fatigue and anemia. Good. Uh, any of our pathologists have used uh, adjuvant olaparib until now? Any any medical oncologists have yeah, used it in have, clinical practice? I have used yeah. it in. I have used it in one of my patients, and she was triple negative, node positive, and she received it in the adjuvant setting. So we know from Olympia that uh, I mean, good three year IDFS data is already there. So I think. Uh, uh, we should also wait for the OS data. But however, um, I mean, I do not use Cape Cytabine uh, in, uh, along with that uh, Olaparib uh, if I give it uh, to all my patients post-neoadjuvant. So uh, that data, though we know that safety concerns are little less, the safety profile, uh, some phase two data is also available. But uh, since the trial did not include the involvement of Cape Cytabine in those subsets, so I do not use it if I'm using Olaparib in my BRCA mutant. Okay. And what toxicities those patients had, breast cancer who received adjuvant Olaparib? the patient whom you treated? So, so the anemia is one of them and uh, they are post uh, anthracycline, post treated. So I also suffered, I mean, my patients also suffered that neutropenia. That was a major concern. So I had to often dose reduce. So I have used it in only two or three of my patients, not more than that. So okay, okay. Uh, in the breast cancer. So that is how it is. Okay, okay. Uh, Dr. Vidya, do you think uh, all patients uh, are able to take that eight cycles or you think maybe a six cycles may be good enough? In your clinical practice, do you think all patients complete that eight cycles of adjuvant capsitabin? Yeah, uh, not the actual dose. We used to give uh, uh, 850 milligram per meter squared uh, 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 every two, uh, two weeks for, for uh, every three weeks. So okay. ideal 100 milligram per meter squared, most of our patients won't tolerate. So okay. if you're given at 850, they are tolerating eight cycles. Okay, okay. So, Roshni, what do you think is the quality of life for patients who receive adjuvant capsitabin? Do you think this hand foot syndrome, diarrhea is all a big concern or uh, we are able to manage with appropriate dose modification? See, the recommended dose was 1250 12. milligram per meter squared BID, right? So, there is an issue of hand foot syndrome with that. So, I, as I mentioned before, the alternate is if your patient is not able to tolerate because of the QL effects, then one switches to the metronomic capsetabine for one year. This option is very much there with us today. Okay. And uh, what proportion of patients have uh, uh, need dose reduction when they are on this adjuvant capsetabine? Dr. Shefali, uh, yeah. what proportion... So I generally do start with 1000 milligram per meter square BID, 1250 milligram per meter square I have not used. So after I experienced that it is not uh, feasible in the practical situation. And even uh, say 70 to 75% of my patients who receive 1000 milligram per meter square BID need a do dose reduction actually. So uh, that is how I start with generally 1000 uh, milligram per meter square BD. But uh, by the end of say third cycle, they, I generally land up reducing the dose in 70 to 75% of my patients. Okay, okay. Thank you very much. So we will move to the uh, second patient. So this is a 60-year-old female with carcinoma of breast, clinically T3N1, infiltrating ductal carcinoma grade 2, HER2 positive. So this patient had received six cycles of uh, docetaxel, carboplatin, and trastuzumab. And after six cycles uh, for surgery, it was a YPT2N0 disease. So how would you like to proceed? Uh, Dr. Shitit Joshi. Uh, Shit, sir, uh, sir, I think he's locked out, sir. Okay. Or uh, Dr. 
Dr. Vidya Ramalingam can take up this question. How, how do you think yeah. uh, we should proceed with this patient? Yeah, head to positive, received neoadjuvant uh, for, after surgery had residual disease. So according to Catherine trial, if you give uh, TDM 114 cycles, uh, they are having better uh, invasive disease for uh, disease-free survival. Uh, ideally should be given, but uh, most of our patient uh, may not afford this. Practice, how many patients would have received this adjuvant TDM1 who did not achieve a pathological complete response? I have, uh, in adjuvant sending, I haven't given it. Okay, okay, okay. Any experience from this, Dr. Shifali? Uh, yeah, so we, ha we have, uh, uh, as our institutional protocol also, we generally offer the patient who do not have a, who have a residual disease actually post NACT in the HER2 positive subset. And we generally do offer uh, on the basis of Catherine. However, um, I mean, uh, say I would say uh, generally 40% uh, or 50% would be able to uh, take uh, uh, this TDM1 in the adjuvant setting. So um, that is how in our institution, though we have not uh, analyzed the data so far, but um, we have that kind of, yeah. Okay. Uh, Dr. Dr. Pandan, can I say yeah. something? Here? Yeah, yes, ma'am. Yeah, yeah, go ahead, ma'am. Dr. Roshni, go ahead. Uh, what was the ER uh, status? Uh, See, that decides if your patient is not able to afford TDM1 and you have to continue transtuzumab, then there's a role for neratinib with residual disease, right? Yeah. So that's another option. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, uh, Dr. Uh, Hanisha, uh, what is your experience on this adjuvant TDM1? I have a couple of patients on adjuvant TDM1 right now. And okay. we usually go for 14 cycles of uh, adjuvant TDM1 if okay. the patient has residual disease post-surgery. Uh, okay. And uh, it's pretty manageable. The side effects are like mainly cardiac monitoring, just like trastuzumab. Okay. I haven't experienced any liver toxicity as of now. Okay. Uh, has anyone seen uh, thrombocytopenia or low blood? Yeah, Dr. Roshni, what is your experience? Any myelosuppression with the TDM1? Yeah, I have seen myelosuppression in one patient, but uh, I mean, we didn't really need to do anything. We gave the cycles almost on time and she's finished her 14 cycles. Okay, okay. But thrombocytopenia okay. is an issue. issue yeah. Right. So um, I had, uh, so I had just one point. I yeah, I really yeah. had uh, to some uh, the faced an issue of thrombocytopenia. So, but could manage it with dose reduction. So thrombocytopenia, I think, is a concern with yeah, TDM. Yeah, yeah. Dr. Reshma, any uh, neuropathy side effect have you seen with TDM one? Especially somebody who is yes, completely sir, especially elderly people, uh, elderly diabetic people, we do do have this concern of neuropathy, but mild, more of diarrhea and uh, thrombocytopenia. I feel. Yeah, and, I had. Yes, sorry. Yeah, please continue. Uh, Ma'am, just one point key now with the affordable option coming up, Ujvira, I think we will be able to use this molecule more often. Yeah, very well said. Uh, uh, Dr. Shafali, how do you how do you monitor uh, cardiac functions do, uh, while a patient is on TDM1? Yeah, so uh, we do not uh, differ the protocol of cardiac monitoring while on anti-HER2 therapy, be TDM1 or Herceptin or Herceptin per jetta for that matter. So every three monthly ECO, uh, we generally follow it up. And uh, uh, if somebody needs a, uh, in a further evaluation in terms of cardiac monitoring, if we see that LVF is dropping down, so we generally follow the same protocol as we follow with the Herceptin, no change with TDM1. So I was also mentioning that I had to discontinue uh, in two of my patients for the reason of neuropathy TDM1 in the adjuvant setting. So uh, my patients also suffered that issue. So that was the point. Okay. Uh, Dr. Hanisha, any opinion on adjuvant uh, pertuzumab? Uh, have you used uh, pertuzumab in the adjuvant setting? I haven't used, sir, but uh, okay. they say it is more than uh, uh, T2 disease, not positive, high risk su subset, a neosphere uh, trial. And yeah. Any experience from it? other panelists on, uh, are, are we using adjuvant pertuzumab? If so, on what subset have we used? Yeah. So I have been using adjuvant pertuzumab in, uh, like uh, Dr. Hanisha mentioned, that high risk disease, node positive, uh, heavy residual disease in the adjuvant setting also. I'm using it. So, the, I mean, I, I didn't see any tolerance issue apart for the increased incidence of diarrhea in those patients. So, uh, yeah. So how, how, how do we manage that pertuzumab diarrhea? Uh, is it so, yeah. 
so uh, generally we follow the uh, same protocols like if it is uh, three to four diarrhea we generally go for hydration as and electrolyte supplementation if it is more we generally use the uh, the uh, ridotil and if it is more than five diarrhea sometimes so imodium is into the place uh, and provided we rule out that Uh, it is a infective diarrhea and if patient continues to have that i have to sometimes stop pertuzumab and i do not reintroduce it if the patients are not optimally controlled uh, uh, with imodium also okay thank you i would like to thank all the panelists for the uh, real world discussion on practical uh, treatment sir options. i just yes, have one yeah. question yes, yes, i just yes, have one yes. question sir recently yeah. had a very young female 33 year old and uh, she was uh, i gave her the tchp regimen because she was very affording but when after uh, the, when she was operated it she showed a residual disease and the pat cr was not really good so it was just 10% so if we use pertuzumab in the new adjuvant is uh, tdm1 justified uh, because the catherine trial didn't really show a significant uh, benefit if pertuzumab has been used so if the patient has residual disease and you have used pertuzumab is tdm1 justified in that adjuvant yeah i think that study only a small group uh, they had used pertuzumab So I think yes. we, with trastuzumab, yeah. uh, even with pertuzumab, if the patient has residual disease, I think that is a very biologically aggressive disease. Definitely, we should offer uh, oh. adjuvant TDM1. I think we need more uh, data in this, uh, specifically somebody who, whom we used new adjuvant pertuzumab. Whether the, there is a benefit, I think we need more data on that. Uh, Dr. Okay. Shifali or Dr. Roshni, any other uh, any other points? Uh, final take home points. I think TDM1 points? is the way to go. And yeah. uh, like I said earlier, if the patient is hormone receptor positive after trastuzumab, we should offer neratinib. Yeah. If yeah, they any, can tolerate it, oh, yeah. Uh, anybody has yeah, the last question? Would, anybody? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, go yeah, ahead. Yeah, so I I have one question that uh, we generally face this this issue in our tumor boards also that if we start patient on new adjuvant regimen in a her two positive patient, so if we have used her septin pergeta and patient has pap cr, now we have Catherine showing that only trastuzumab in the control arm also did fairly well in patients who had pap cr, and if the patient was heavy burden to start with. should pergeta be continued in the adjuvant setting also because we have both kind of data available to support both regimens so that is how uh, we stuck up in the tumor board so what is uh, other panelists or expert comment i would like to uh, know about that particular area so where patient has a pcr after new adjuvant herceptin pergeta in her two positive subset Dr. Roshni, I think the same the, blockage yeah. should continue because you have had benefit in the new adjuvant setting with that dual blockage yeah maybe if the patient has tolerated well and uh, there was a initial high burden disease we would be inclined towards continuing uh, pertuzumab thank you very much all the panelists for the excellent discussion thank you thank you, thank you very much thank, thank, you. thank you thank you uh, thank you so much mani kandan sir and thank you to all the panelists uh, i now request the chairperson to please introduce our next uh, debater Um, well, that was an excellent discussion what we had, and now we'll go on to a, a debate section. And uh, here we have, I mean, Dr. Bavish, who will be speaking on the role of neoadjuvant therapy. No, sorry, role of neoadjuvant immunochemotherapy in TNPCs. Who will be speaking for? And we have Dr. Shiva Kumar, who's be, uh, who will be speaking against. And we will also have Dr. Nilesh, who is going to give us an expert comments on all these. And uh, sure, by the end of the session, we will know what has to be really and clearly followed. Over to you, sir, Dr. Bhavish. Okay, ma'am. I'll just share the screen. I hope my slide is slide is visible. Yes, sir. Uh, so good afternoon, one and all. Uh, thank you, the whole Moscon team, and especially Kripa Shankar, a dear friend, for giving this opportunity. Uh, so today we are here for a debate. Uh, this is the latest hot topic in uh, early TNBC: uh, whether to use a combination of uh, chemoimmunotherapy in new adjuvant setting. Yes or no? I'll be speaking uh, for the motion, and uh, let's debate. I know Kripa is smiling, just like I am showing it in this uh, picture. and uh, we both will be fighting against each other myself and shiva okay uh, so we all know that uh, tnbc is a very important subset it includes almost 15 to 20% of all breast cancers majority of them almost 70% and above are highly aggressive cancers with grade 3 and very high proliferative index 
majority when they present to us are in stage 2 and stage 3 uh, we know while treating them uh, we know expect them to have early recurrences uh, majority will come within 2 years almost 80 to 90% of them and the most frustrating part is there are no or almost limited targets in this situation and uh, we know that uh, tnbc is also having a different micro environment and sub types but uh, uh, saying all this thing we know that in tnbc what is going to uh, change the outcome is the path cr so this is the earliest possible outcome or earliest possible goal which we have to achieve in our patients with tnbc and this will correspond to long term clinical benefits in our tnbc patient this we know from almost a decade by this uh, uh, meta analysis and we know this new adjuvant chemotherapy is the standard of care uh, in our early stage tnbcs uh, and hence we use it in most of our patients to gain uh, to achieve the path cr and hence we expect them to have an improvement in the efs as well as os but uh, how how whatever said and done we know that many patients are coming back with recurrences and uh, we want to do something more for them so this is a highly uh, high unmet need for increasing the effectiveness of chemotherapy and hence combining immunotherapy to chemotherapy is probably the flavor of the season and also is the best answer till date in this situation and uh, Uh, this is a 5 uh, year fire back paper uh, which has already shown an improvement in the efficacy of new adjuvant compared to adjuvant immunotherapy uh, to eradicate the metastatic disease so this indirectly says that if you use new adjuvant chemoimmunotherapy uh, probably uh, the chances of metastasis are going to be low the recurrences are going to be low and hence the patient survivals are going to be better so i'll be uh, debating Uh, uh on the basis of this and this combination of chemoimmunotherapy immunotherapy has already shown success in metastatic setting from the keynote 355 and ampation 130 trial But there are various phase 2 and phase 3 data which are already available for early stage tnbc but i'll be mainly concentrating on a elegantly done study with pembrolizumab uh, starting with a phase 1 trial of keynote 173 which was positive and led to the phase 2 ispy2 trial and finally the current phase 3 trial that is keynote 522 so keynote 522 study design was very simple all eligible criteria uh, uh, the key eligible criteria included the age of more than 18 newly diagnosed uh, t1c n12 or t2 to t4 and n0 to 2 good ps and tissue sample was taken for pdl1 this was divided and randomized to 2 is to 1 uh, with the experimental arm having a uh, carbo plus pakli combination with pembrolizumab followed by dosi or epirubicin cyclophosphamide with pembrolizumab and uh, followed by surgery and followed by a maintenance pembrolizumab the comparator arm or the standard arm was uh, the same chemotherapy without the inclusion of pembrolizumab either in new adjuvant or adjuvant setting uh, there was pre specified stratification like nodal status tumor size and uh, schedule of carboplatin so i'll briefly uh, go through this data which is a very interesting data uh, keynote 522 was a phase 3 randomized double blind trial it recruited within a span of 1 and a half to 2 years 1174 patient randomized 2 is to 1 uh, there was a very nice co and uh, co primary endpoint i'll show it in my last slide why it is a good point uh, including pat cr and efs both together there were obviously secondary endpoints including overall survival safety and and there was a separate exploratory analysis also so the baseline characteristic were very well matched in the two groups including age ecox status pdl1 carboplatin schedule tumor size and nodal involvement uh, coming straight to the results we can see that the path cr was staggering of almost 65% compared to the 51% uh, and also the efs was uh, showing improvement uh, or 6% improvement uh, in the second analysis but the same thing in the fourth analysis which is the latest update uh, from this group has shown that there is an improvement of almost 8% in the efs uh, if we see the summary of the first efs event by category uh, whether it is progression of disease uh, that precludes definitive surgery or local or distant recurrence second primary or that rates almost everything uh, is in favor of using this chemoimmunotherapy combination Uh, when we see the primary endpoint according to the subgroups again uh, whether the nodes are positive or negative 
tumor size is T1 to T2 or T3, T4, schedule of carboplatin weekly versus three weekly. Uh, very interesting PDL1 status, whether positive or negative, age category less than more than 65, and of course the performance status. Everything we can see that the diamond is favoring the pembrocarbo, uh, the combination of chemotherapy combination. This results again in the EFS shows a differentiation between uh, patients who have achieved PATCR and not achieved PATCR. And we can see there is a difference of more than 10, almost 12% difference in patients who have not achieved PATCR and have continued with pembrolizumab adjuvant therapy. Uh, after this excellent efficacy in both the co and endpoint, coming to one of the secondary endpoint, that is a safety data, what we have till now. The treatment related advert even in the combined phases, we can see they are almost similar in both the arms. If we see the safety in the immune, immune mediated adverse event, uh, of course, because the addition of pembrolizumab, we expect a little higher immune mediated adverse events, but we know how to monitor them and uh, we know how to manage them well. So overall, uh, including all this data set, uh, I would say that uh, it, it is in favor uh, and it is a phase, uh, is a proper phase three evidence for statistically significant and clinically meaningful improvement in the patch here that was 65 versus 51% almost, 14%, which is the maximum patch here seen till date. And an EFS advantage of almost 8 to 9 percent from 85 uh, from 76 percent, it has improved to 85 percent. And of course, manageable toxicity profile. Uh, we are well versed with the uh, use of immunotherapy and we know how to tame the side effects too. So, in my view, uh, it is it was uh, the strength of this trial was it was having a very strong com uh, comparator arm, uh, including all possible what we could uh, like to use in TNBC patients. Uh, it had a double positive primary outcome. Uh, normally, we see there is a trial which is done to show a path here, and then we have a separate trial to show the improvement in survival as a primary endpoint. But this had a co primary endpoint, which was both paths here as well as EFS. So, actually, it is a two in one trial and saved the budget of one of the trial. And uh, whatever early OS data we have is showing a favorable trend. And there are certain other molecules like atezolizumab and durvalumab have shown improvement in the same way, uh, include, uh, improving the PFS from 41 to 58% and 44 to 54%. So in my view, new adjuvant chemotherapy is the best choice for all early TNBC eligible patients, and it should soon become the standard of care in all the eligible patients. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, sir. We'll now hand over the mic to our second debater, Dr. Shiva Kumar. Over to you, sir. Yeah, I'm sharing the screen. Is it visible? Yes. Yeah. So um, that was a wonderful presentation, my dear buddy. So let me see how I can turn the table tables based on the data. So we have two positive trials in the form of Keynote 522, one used platinum uh, uh, doublet with Pembro and other used Taxol doublet with Atizo, that is Impression 031. Then I got a negative trial in the form of Neotrip APD1 trial in which Napacli was used with Atizo Dizumab. So this is the trial which uh, he beautifully explained. So it has got a two co-primary endpoints, one is PCR, another one is EFS. So let me see how many of us are going to believe that PCR still is going to be the best surrogate of EFS envoys. Not anymore. This is the meta-analysis which presented in 2021 in BMJ, which included more than 32,000 and included 50, 54 trials, which clearly mentioned that pathological complete response should not be used as a primary endpoint in regulatory neogen trials of early stage breast cancer. What is the stance of our Uncle Ben? The FDA, which was a big proponent of uh, pathological complete response, had come out with a different version of PATCR. Now, the stance is that it might be a, a good endpoint at the patient level, but at the trial level, pathological computer response may not be a good uh, endpoint representing EFS and voice. So let us go into the uh, data what lies beneath Keynote 522. So Keynote 522 and interim analysis. If you see the fun, first interim analysis, that is for PCR, which occurred after uh, 500 patients underwent a definitive surgery after six months of neogen chemotherapy, we can see almost 13.6% improvement in PCR. Actually, the bar set by uh, uh, FDA for patients with early stage breast cancer in a curating setting, it's 15%. So it fell short of as the first uh, interim analysis. 
The second interim analysis was for EFS, which occurred two years after randomization. It was showed a paltry 6% improvement in the EON free survival. So third interim analysis was presented only to US FDA. Let me put the first nail in the coffin. So most of the recurrences in triple negative breast cancer are within three years. And we are way short of the follow up uh, for the trial. So adjuvant capsidabine was not incorporated into the trial design, though Bavish can counter argue that when the Keynote 522 was designed, adjuvant capsidabine was uh, not a standard of care. Of course, it is now the standard of care, even for patients who have a residual disease, we can have a worse benefit of 10%. So short follow-up precludes the mature survival data on long-term safety. Both of these are very essential when we are aiming for a curative treatment. And EFS difference, which is the efficacy bar, which is not met when the second interim analysis. So let me put the second nail in the coffin. If you see the incidence of adverse events, almost one fourth of the patients who received Im uh, immunotherapy had some form of uh, adverse events, that is severe adverse events, mainly endocrine adverse events, which are quite irreversible. 20% or close to 20% of the patients had thyroid dysfunction, either hypo or hyperthyroidism and autoimmune thyroiditis. And we have a, a autoimmune endocrine dysfunction in the form of 2.6%. We have a hypo and hyperadrenalism. So in a trial, which is done in an early, st early stage setting, in a new joint setting, four deaths in a treatment experimental arm is quite unacceptable. So what is the Oncology Drug Advisory Committee and FDA has to say regarding the uh, approval of uh, pembrolizumab. They themselves put the third nail in the coffin. New agent pembro confers only a small absolute improvement in path CR rates, which is of questionable uh, benefit. EFS and OS data are immature and unreliable. Supportive data of clinical benefit of, from any TENBC setting is lacking at, at currently. So addition of pembrolizumab, you are at the best, you are going to increase the toxicity at the cost of or a paltry increase in the path CR rates. If you see the path CR rates at the first interim analysis it is 13.6, second interim analysis it is 9.2, the third interim analysis it is only 7.5. So this is the EFS data, which is quite appealing. But the thing is that the authors had included a, a positive margins in the EFS definition. Uh, patients who had a positive margins, there were more number of patients with positive margins in the control arm and compared to the uh, experimental arm. So the FDA had asked them to negate those uh, patients and asked them to submit the fresh data. The fresh data was submitted two days back, uh, sorry, two days back in NEGM, it was published in NEGM on 10th February, almost close to 8% improvement in the EFS uh, survival. So coming to the financial morbidity, we are going to give uh, four cycles in the neogen and four cycles in the neogen setting and nine cycles in the maintenance setting. Even if Merck or MSD come up with some sort of uh, um, patient support program, the cost is exuberant, almost 35 lakhs for paltry increase in path CR. So definitely I won't consider it as an option in the Indian setting. So I would like to consider this as an industrial push rather than a true benefit to the patient because you are going to see uh, pembrolizumab anywhere from head to foot because soon we are going to find pembrolizumab even best supportive care also. So what does our big daddy has to say? EFS data is immature, improvement path CR rate is small, addition of pembro is uh, to neogen setting is severe, irreversible and require lifelong medications. FDA considered path CR response is not clinically meaningful. So some points about impassion 3.1. We have some EFS data, which is marginal improvement in EFS data, but this is based on very few events. And we have got uh, Neotrip PDL1, which showed that uh, similar path CR rates between the experimental and control arm, which used atezolizumab. So why is it so? Because more amount of tumor infiltrating lymphocytes in the control arm. For those patients who had a tumor infiltrating lymphocytes of more than 40%, the path CR rate of 71% in the PEMBRO and 63% in the control arm. So it is not the expression of PD1 that matters. It is the expression of tumor infiltrating lymphocyte that matters. If you see the uh, bottom part of the slide, you can see the patients who had uh, less than 40%, the PCR rates down to close to 30% in both arms. So data supporting checkpoint inhibitors and neogen setting is close, but not quite the rate. Given the risk of hypothyroidism, the bottom line for now is should be very cautious. We have to think twice before choosing clinic. The time is up for ECA. Definitely, I will say no. I'd like to thank Kripa and Maskan for this opportunity. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, sir. Uh, we'll now ask uh, Bhavesh sir to give his rebuttal. So we request you to keep it under 30 seconds, please. So, Shilkumar, uh, I would say that uh, EFS is just not yet mature, but it is showing a very promising result in the fourth analysis, what they have come up with. And even the OS, which is going to be a very hard uh, endpoint, which is, which is showing a positive trend and probably will become a positive outcome. 
and once we have this batch cr translating into efs and os uh, your 50000 patient and 30000 patient data will not be of very significant value uh, coming to the side effect uh, you have uh, made the thyroid as a very big uh, issue uh, i think if you can save life uh, and give one simple tablet every day for thyroid control it is not a big deal uh, anybody if you explain this they will say yes i want the immunotherapy i am ready to take one extra tablet and uh, definitely there is discrepancy uh, in the different data sets and trials because we all know that tnbc is not a single disease we need to uh, segregate this in near future probably on the base of uh, cut off of 40% uh, above and 40% below uh, yes i take that point very well and uh, over to you uh, thanks bhavish um, yeah uh, the, i read the recent uh, data on efs uh, published two days back it is quite impressive but thing is that we cannot offer uh, uh, pembrolizumab in university for not everyone maybe we can define that high risk group who are uh, who can be benefited from this pembro so the thing is that uh, that's why the debate the topic is that can we offer uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors to everyone i would like to say not everyone maybe the high risk patients who might or the small chunk of patients who might benefit maybe this triple negative setting where we are going to see recurrence as early as 3 years maybe why can't they set an um, end point of overall survival because uh, long term follow up is also easy maybe os might be the meaningful end point rather than keeping path c r Uh, thank you so much, sir. I now invite our expert, uh, Dr. Nilesh Lokeshwar, medical oncologist from Mumbai, to please give us expert comments. Over to you, sir. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you for inviting me, and uh, thank you, Dr. Bhavesh Poladia and Dr. Siva Kumar for giving a very balanced debate to a very important topic. So, what we have discussed today is the role of uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors as new adjuvant therapy for all patients with TNBC. Now, there have been considerable paradigm shifts in the management of TNBC, uh, right from the uh, start of using total neoadjuvant therapy with anthracyclines and taxanes before surgery, to the use of platinums in selected populations of patients, the use of capecitabine in patients who are non-complete responders, and now this recent data regarding the use of immune checkpoint inhibitors in this setting. We have uh, serial evidence from several trials, some of the initial trials being the Keynote 173, the iSPY2, the NeoTrip, uh, the, the IMPassion uh, 031, and finally from the Keynote 522, which was published just two days ago. Now, this trial has definitely shown an impressive improvement in the pathological CR, the EFS, and the OS, although the data, survival data is yet immature. So what is the crux of the discussion here? Um, do we have a good biomarker? Unfortunately not. PDL1 still remains an imperfect biomarker. And what is important to note that there is a discordance of the importance of PDL1 in the new adjuvant setting where it is not important, as opposed to the metastatic setting for the same disease where it is significantly important. So that makes us really doubt the importance about uh, this biomarker. There has also been another important uh, note that pembrolizumab seemed to have a greater impact uh, on the pathological CR in patients who are node positive disease. And very importantly, how important is path CR when we use, use it in the clinical trial setting? So in the uh, presentation done two days back, it has been shown that the, the three-year EFS has been independent of both the PDL1 and the abscess of pathological CR. So do remember that these points need to be taken into consideration. What the current data also does not address is, number one, the use of adjuvant capsidibines. It was not there as standard of care at that time. And that we also know significantly improves the survival in patients who do not achieve a pathological CR. That is the not so good prognosis patients. And also a subset of patients, which may be almost 30 to 40% of this group of patients who will be BRCA positive. And we know about the uh, role of adjuvant PARP inhibitors in this set of patients. So how do we uh, include uh, this consideration in our analysis of who do we give uh, new adjuvant immune checkpoint inhibitors? Now, this is even more difficult in a country which is resource constrained. Remember that not only do patients get eight cycles of uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors before the surgery, but also nine cycles after surgery. And this is uh, affordable to only a limited number of our patients. 
I think in our setting, platinums and adjuvant chemo, uh, capsaicin for non-responders would be what is considered for most patients. Also, patients who are low risk disease, that those who are T1 up to T1C, have also not shown benefit in this clinical trial. But would I consider immune checkpoint inhibitors at all for any patients? Definitely yes. In the high risk patients, based on the data we have, I am convinced that they will make a difference. Uh, of course, we require longer follow up. And there are issues regarding higher toxicity, although Bhavesh mentioned that they are not significant. Almost 14 or 15 percent of patients in the Keynote 522 arm dropped out from the pembrolizumab from the pembrolizumab arm. So we need to keep these factors in mind before deciding. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, sir. Uh, 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 in our request, our next speaker. Dr. Somya Surat Panda, medical oncologist from Bhubaneswar, to please give us talk. Over to you, sir. Yeah. Thank you, Prasit. Thank you, Arminder. So I hope my screen is visible. Yes, sir. Your slides are visible. Thank you, everyone. So I thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to speak on this important topic. I request everyone to pay attention because there is a very important topic and evolving topic. So my topic is approach to de novo heart to positive metastatic breast cancer with brain metastasis. What is the ideal treatment strategy? Heart to new overexpression is associated with increased risk of brain metastasis. In targeted anti heart to therapy era, it reflects the prolonged survival, biologic predilection for the CNS, and a sanctuary site for metastasis in CNS. So the increased uh, prevalence of brain medicine in HER2 new is not only associated with overexpression, but it might be that the anti HER2 therapy is improving, and that is why the patients are living longer, and that is why we are having more of brain metastasis. Also, it was also a concern that more of HER2 anti HER2 therapy use might be increasing the use of brain metastasis. Coming to the brain imaging, so the guidelines is that patient, whenever he is symptomatic, you use a MRI. So you do a MRI. For asymptomatic patients, Though it is very compelling to use, it is still not recommended. Trials are underway looking into this particular area. So what happens is that if we are not using it in asymptomatic individuals, we are not doing an MRI, the underreporting is there. So if we uh, pick up a brain metastasis early, then there, we might choose a separate drug. So systemic therapy alteration might be there if we detect a brain metastasis in asymptomatic individual. But whether that is having an impact on the OS, that is yet unknown. So right now in asymptomatic, MRI is not recommended and trials are looking into that. Coming to preventive strategies, whether prophylactic cranial radiation is having any role, answer is no, there is no role. And regarding adjuvant approach, whether it is decreasing the CNS recurrence, unfortunately, answer is no. So unfortunately, no adjuvant approaches, including trastuzumab, pertuzumab, lapatinib, or adotrastuzumab have demonstrated an ability to prevent CNS recurrence. So what are the preventive strategies that was looked into? In the HERA, trastuzumab is used. So 2% in both trastuzumab and the observation groups. This was after four month, four years of follow-up. Coming to the ALTO trial, 2% in both lapatinib plus trastuzumab and trastuzumab alone group. Coming to the very important Catherine trial, that is 5% in both the arms. And extended trial, again neratinib, 1.3% in the neratinib group and 1.8% in the placebo group. So having said that, we must remember that we are discussing in the adjuvant setting and not in the metastatic setting. The same drugs might have been, might be efficacious in the metastatic setting, but when we are discussing adjuvant, so these are not working to decrease the CNS recurrence. So coming to treatment approach, when we are detecting a brain metastasis in a de novo patient. So most important is that estimate the patient's overall prognosis to identify the goal of care. I think this sentence is very important. Because you have to look at the number of brain metastasis, the size of metastasis, the site of metastasis, again to the patient factors like patient's performance status. So multiple factors have, been, have to be taken into account before deciding what is the uh, treatment modality that we, the patient should be given. So despite advances in anti heart directed therapy, survival time can still be highly variable. So there have been many advances, but still survival times can be sought sometimes. So sequence for local control, when you have got multiple options like surgery, radiation and radiation either SRS or whole brain RT and systemic therapy that should be made with an experienced multidisciplinary team. 
So for the local control, we will discuss some general principles. Like where should we choose a surgery? So surgery is especially choose when you have got absent or controlled extra canal disease. Suppose say a single brain metastasis is there, and it is associated with larger uh, or is associated with edema and mass effect, then surgery is preferred. Once surgery is completed, post-op RT definitely gives a benefit. So post-op RT to the surgical cavity that improves the local control. And when should we choose a SRS? SRS is an alternative to surgery for single, small, or inaccessible tumor. So if it is a single and small and is not accessible for surgery, in that particular scenario, uh, choosing a SRS over surgery is beneficial. Again, the nature of the lesion, whether it is solid or cystic. So solid are more amenable for SRS. Coming to cystic lesions, metast cystic metastasis, uh, they are more preferable for a surgery. The benefit of surgery, we must always remember that if it is a uh, single site of disease, it provides the tissue as well. Or say after a long DFS, you want to see that there is an evolution HER2 negative to positive, positive to negative, or more, more of molecular biology provides the tissue. That is the advantage of surgery. Coming to um, brain metastasis, up to four brain metastasis, SRS alone is an option for up to four brain metastasis. This is proven in a randomized trial. Coming to five to ten brain metastasis, many centers prefer SRS. However, uh, again, this is based on a prospective but non-randomized trial, 5 to 10 millimeters. So up to 4 millimeters, the EA is very, dictum is very clear, it is SRS, but 5 to 10 millimeters, SRS is preferred in most of the centers. Whole brain RT, when should I choose? If there is extensive number metastasis or there are very large tumors and multiple tumors. So at that uh, point, you choose a whole brain RT. Coming to systemic therapy. So uh, sometimes when the already patient has been irritated multiple times or patient has undergone a surgery in the RT prior, in that case, if it is progressing still, then you prefer a systemic therapy or extracranial control is uh, not good. You have got multiple systemic disease as well. In that case, you prefer a systemic disease. And in newly diagnosed asymptomatic limited brain metastasis, it can still be considered. So summary of the discussion that I have made, you have to look at the number of brain metastasis, whether it is solitary or limited. Solitary, you go out of the resection and if it is resectable. If not, then go to the radio surgery. If it is limited, say 2 to 10 plus, then it is a SRS. If it is multiple or diffuse, go for a whole brain RT, especially considered with hippocampal sparing. Post RT, what do you do? So post RT, uh, as per the ESCO guidelines, patients who have, uh, ha have a stable extracranial disease, you continue the same therapy. And if it is a de novo metastatic, as, it, as the discussion in my topic, it is a de novo metastasis. So you give the, after the RT is over, you give, go, go to the first line um, with a pertuzumab, trastuzumab, and a docetaxel. Second line, you have got the option of TDM1. And third and there is a tucatinib or trastuzumab capacitamine. And other options are delustican, neratinib capacitamine, and lapatinib capacitamine. So systemic therapeutic approaches, if we look and classify, it is small molecule TKI, like caplap or neratinib capacitamine, or tucatinib capacitamine plus trastuzumab as per the HER2 client. Or you have got antibody drug conjugates, that is TDM1 and trastuzumab delustican. If you see the slide, in India, right now, caplap is available and TDM1 is available. Most of the other molecules are difficult to find. Coming to the caplap, so that has been the capacitor lap, uh, lapatinib or say lap. So that is one of the favorite in case of brain machines for most of the physicians. In pre irradiated uh, suppose radiation is not been there and if there is a brain machine, the intracranial response is 38%. But if it is treatment naive, then the response rates are close to 66%. Per so, so seeing the response, the combination was attempted as a preventive strategy in cerebral study. But as a preventive strategy, it failed. The other arm was trastuzumab and capsulin, and the, this one was lapatinib and capsulin. This was not so that uh, it is preventing a brain mets. But if you have already got a brain mets, then capsulin is a very good uh, drug uh, combination to look into. In so, neratinib, the phase three NALA trial that has shown clearly that if you have got neratinib plus capsulin, it is better than your lapatinib plus capsulin. And the median CNS was 12, PFS was 12.4 months versus 8.3 months. Coming to the tucatinib, so this has been uh, of a uh, lot of interest in brain metastasis, looking at the hard to climb uh, updated analysis. So it has been used both in stable brain mets as well as active brain mets. And if you have got active brain mets, then your uh, responses are much better. You have got a 9.6 months overall survival improvement. If you have got stable brain mets, then it is 5.2 months overall survival improvement. This is a median OS improvement. So looking into the data, tucatinib plus GDM1, is right now uh, the trial is ongoing for the heart to climb 0 2. So, the two potent drugs, one antibody drug conjugate, another TKI has been combined in the heart to climb 0 2. For the newer approaches, 
one is high dose trastuzumab, six milligram per kilogram weekly plus pertuzumab. This is the Patricia phase two study. Next is the trastuzumab derostican that has got better intracranial control than TDM1, destiny breast 03. Next is pyrotinib plus capacitabin in the permeate study. In this, uh, and the CNS overall response rates is very high. It is 75% if it, there is no radiation and 40% if already irradiated. And then the nivolumab plus ipilumab and intrathecal trastuzumab plus triple IT in an option in leptomeningeal metastasis. So the future looks very encouraging. This is the, on the left side, the clap plan mayor is a trastuzumab derostican doing much better than the TDM1. TDM1 is active drug, but trastuzumab derostican has got a better intracranial response. The median PFS is 15 months versus three months. Then the Patricia Patuzumab plus high dose trastuzumab, as I told you, six milligram per kilogram weekly dosage. Again, a very good option. Patients who are heavily predated and still we have got a clinical benefit rate close to 60%, though the partial response and CR response were modest, something like 12%. Then the Nivolumab plus Ipilumab that has recently come in the leptomeningeal carcinoma disease and the permeate study of pyrotony plus is also encouraging. So in summary, utility of screening for CNS metastasis in the era of MRI and novel NTR patients should be revisited. Need for prophylactic strategies to address CNS metastasis in HER2 positive breast cancer. So prophylactic strategies has also to be looked into. And third point is inclusion of patients with CNS disease in trials with novel NTR patients is critical. So if we exclude the CNS patients, then I, uh, I don't think that is a justice for the NTR2 trials because your patients do relapse in the brain. So it is very critical to include them in the NTR2 trials. So thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Soumya, sir. Uh, before we conclude for the session, I invite our chairpersons to please give their final comments. We'll start with uh, uh, Akila, ma'am, and then Sudip, sir. Well, I think, uh, good afternoon, all of you all. I think it was an wonderful breast sessions which was going on. From the start of endocrine therapy, its duration, uh, the adjuvant uh, CDK4 inhibitors, had two positive brain meds, and uh, I mean, the immunochemotherapies, which are of recent advance, it was a very well discussed session. And all the panelists, all the speakers, moderators, all had done their job very well. And it was interesting to know a few facts. And I'm sure all of us would go into practice with the latest available knowledge. Thank you all. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, I now request Sudeep sir to please give his comment. So I have nothing more to add except to say that I had the best ringside seat in this uh, in this whole show, and I thoroughly enjoyed it. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, ma'am, and thank you to all our faculty members of the breast oncology session. We'll now move on to our next session. This session is sponsored by Eli Lilly, and I. Sorry. And I now invite our chairperson, Professor Dr. Suresh H. Advani, uh, senior medical oncologist from Mumbai, to please uh, start the session. Over to you, sir. Yeah, good evening, colleagues. Uh, first of all, I'm thankful to the organizers for giving me this opportunity to participate in this uh, meeting. And as you know, we are discussing a lot about CDK4 and CDK6 inhibitors. All of us have used these molecules and we know that how these molecules have made a big indent in terms of the landmark results after using it along with the endocrine therapy. And I think uh, to such an extent that I feel sometimes that chemotherapy is much less effective, particularly in this group of the patient, hormone positive and uh, HER2 negative. The response to chemotherapy is not as good as the response to CDK4 inhibitor and the, also the uh, aromatase inhibitors. Now today in this session, we are going to uh, discuss about uh, the Abama syslip. All of us know that's one of the drugs which has got also the CNS activity. It is also to be given regularly and probably it is also more effective in the high risk group. And to discuss this, we have a very good speakers. 
and I will request uh, uh, Professor Ganesham Biswas to uh, move forward on the session. So respected Advani sir, thank you. So, so you have been a forefather for everybody in oncology. So now, so we have Abhima cycling. So we know the third of its kind in CDK46. So we say that different by design as Advani sir alluded. So there is, so cancer has no holiday, no vacation. So why the drug has? Next. So this is my disclosures. So we have two experts, both V, V stands for victory. So Dr. Bijay Agrawal and Dr. Bikas Talreja. So I'll take their inputs while I go through the case. So it's almost a four years back. So quite long pre-COVID time, a 40 year old lady, known hypertensive controlled pre-menopausal lady at that point of time, no addiction, no positive history of malignancy in the family. So presented with a mass in the left breast, April 2018, showed it to a, a, a personal or a family physician, FNC was done negative. Four months later, so she had some suspicion, so she changed her physician, did a mammography, which showed a T2 lesion in the two o'clock position that was in August 2018. This time, FNC showed a ductal carcinoma. Next. So, subsequently, uh, she underwent a true cut biopsy. So, it was a IDC grade two. And if you see the IC report, it was ER positive, PR negative, HER2 negative, KI67 for a 20%. So, September 2018, she undergoes a PET CT evaluation, and that shows there are two primaries in the same breast, probably which were missed in the mammography. So it was a 4.3 into 2.2 centimeter, other mass of 3.3 in the 3.1 centimeter in the same. So multifocal disease, and the PET also showed a hypermetabolic left axillary nodes of 1.5 centimeter. There were few liver lesions, which was supposed to be a cyst, benign cyst. Next. So since it was a hormone positive, so she, they went to an oncosurgeon that is in Ames, Bhubaneswar and got operated. So post so a left MRM with axillary dissection. So you can see the histopathology report, September 2018, extensive LVI, PNI, margins were free. So it was a grade three tumor, which was on a two curve biopsy grade two and out of 42 nodes, so 19 nodes were positive. So finally, it is an IDC, grade three, and the pathological staging was P, T3, N3, and M0. And that's how she came to me uh, for the adjuvant therapy. Next. So uh, we looked at the BRCA1, BRCA2. It was a germline because she was 40 years premenopausal lady. And BRCA1, BRCA2 germline came negative. Next. So we did a baseline echo, so it was normal. So we planned for a two weekly dose dense anthracyclines and a weekly taxins and adjuvant therapy, followed by the plan was to give an adjuvant radiation and then an extended hormonal therapy. So she completed uh, four cycles of EC100 uh, without much problem. The problem started on a weekly paclitaxel. She, however, managed to have six doses of weekly packly. Then subsequently, she had lots of pain, severe weakness, continuous skin toxicities, which was not going away. So, so there were three, four days delays for in last few cycles. Then we convinced and moved into a two-weekly paclitaxel. So anyhow, she managed under two doses. So six weekly doses and two weekly, two weekly doses. And thereafter, we had to close the chapter for chemotherapy because of tolerance issues. Next. So now, so the patient uh, was uh, doing good. So, so slowly and improved. So she wanted some time, some a month or time to improve. So we get some, some supportive staff. So he came with a PET scan. So before starting a radiation, so there was no abnormality. So she subsequently received adjuvant radiation, which finished in April, 2019. And subsequently, we started the patient on tamoxifen on a usual dose. So that was April 2019. So three months later, she came with some nausea, dysphagia, pain. So it looked like some uh, 
um, vague symptoms. She was very always apprehensive. She had insomnia, all those. So we did a CT scan. So of thorax, so normal study. Next. We also did a, a CT abdomen that is July 2019. It showed a right adnexal mass. And we did a, some, some tumor markers, CA125, CA1523, which was also normal. Otherwise, there was no other abnormality. So we showed it to a gynec surgeon. So uh, the gynecologist told that it looks like a benign. So mm -hmm. she gave some medications. By this time, she already had a ke chemical um, post-chemotherapy uh, amenorrhea. Next. So then, then, uh, so, uh, then she started to have some menstrual disturbances on a follow-up ultrasound, January 2020. So just before the COVID, she had an ultrasound or uh, thickened endometrium of 13 millimeter, rest ab absolutely normal, pap was negative. So she, she undergoes a biopsy from the endometrium, which was, uh, which was uh, benign, next. So we counseled uh, this patient for a THBSO. So that was March, 2020. Again, just uh, less than a month before the COVID. So the, she underwent a TH and BSO. So that was also absolutely non-remarkable. So absolutely uh, benign, next. Then she, uh, she could not follow up and everybody knows. So March, 2020, the first COVID wave, so she continued tamoxifen at home. So by that time, the COVID-1 wave just was getting slower. So she came to me with an abdominal pain. We did an ultrasound. We showed a single liver lesion. We did a PET scan. So that was October 2020. So PET scan showed a liver lesions of 4 in 4.1 into 4.3 centimeter in the segment 8 and segment 5. So otherwise, so there was no other metastasis. So now I come to Dr. Vijay. So what do you do now with this patient? Thank, thank you, Dr. Gashyap. Uh, I think we really need to look at more hormone therapy. Uh, can I just check what was the duration of tamoxifen to, to relapse now? So we can say, see, on seven months now. Seven months. Right? So March, March. 2020. Now this is October 2020. I would certainly like to ten months. Yeah, I would certainly like to rebiopsy to see if ERPR is still expressed. That's quite a very quite an early relapse. Okay. And then and then take it forward. If its ERPR is is clearly uh, still positive, uh, then we really need to look at CDK46 uh, plus of Yeah, we'll come to that. So next slide. So because. So, so this patient undergoes a biopsy. So that shows a metastatic polydiffusion carcinoma, as Dr. Right, Vijay Raiji said. So this patient, we repeated the ERPR her to new. So she was ER positive. She continued to be ER positive. She was actually PR negative. So now this report shows PR positive and her to uh, continues to be a negative. So uh, your inputs, Dr. Bikash. Uh, I also uh, would agree that uh, we usually tend to re-biopsy because it was a very short DFI, uh, very bad prognostic, I must say, very short and uh, DFI. And when we went inside, it was a multifocal disease and there was a high nodal disease burden at baseline. So okay. definitely to start with, it was a very bad disease with multiple poor prognostic factors. So I, I could peep into the plan, uh, what you uh, have written and... I would also solely agree with it that uh, if this patient walks into my OPD next, I would do the same uh, because considering the multitude of prognostic factors. Absolutely. She's right now. So she's a young lady, premenopausal, grade three tumor, multifocal, LVI, PNI positive, initially PR negative, grade three tumor. So all, all said bad prognosis. So Dr. Bijay, any thoughts on local therapy? So since the liver is the only site here, any, 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 any take on that? Uh, not really. I mean, this is a systemic disease. She's got, even if you look at her initial histopath, uh, there was vascular involvement, uh, LVI positive, heavily load positive, and now level lesion. I mean, this is a systemic disease. I'm not so sure how a local therapy just to the liver will help. Okay. So, 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 Dada, because, so any, any, any form of local therapy, like uh, surgery, like, uh, so we always say the oligometastatic. So, 
to me it looks like an oligometastatic disease so so definitely we are going to give a systemic therapy because we know the background of the disease so any any ways any chances that you will offer any local therapy uh, i i would also agree with dr vijay sir and uh, your uh, opinion but uh, when when it is a systemic disease we have to address it systemically it is important that we we take it into account uh, it is a systemic relapse there is a visceral disease no matter it might be uh, right now only few, uh, places but then again at the end of the day it is a system disease relapse with so we need a systemic treatment uh, the, right, the baseline right. is so, absolutely so I, I agree with dr both the v's so actually so this patient underwent an rfa so next slide and subsequent to RFA, so 10 days later, the patient was started on letrozole. So by this time, the patient had the TH and BSO, the hormones were postmenopausal and, and abimacycline. So initial, uh, initial, I can say in the first three months, so the patient had grade one, grade two diarrhea. And subsequent to, subsequent to that, the patient absolutely tolerated well. She even said that I have not opened the, uh, the newer strips of lopramide. Otherwise, some fatigue, some uh, psychological issues because of an early relapse was always there. So on a follow-up, you can see, so the ultrasound in September 2021, she continues to maintain a remission. So the only lesion that was seen, so that was post-RFA lesion. Next. So by this time in February 2022, so she has already completed 15 months of therapy. So this was the last updated with the Eli Lilly. So that was post 11 months. So you can see a PET scan. So absolutely the patient continues to remain in remission. So with letrozole and, and, the, and Ramivan. So now she's already on the support or the PAP of Ramivan. Next. Yes, yeah, so over to Dr. Vijay. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Bishwar. Thank you. Uh, uh, so we will uh, we'll look at uh, another patient. So what Dr. Bishwar Bishwar presented was a patient who uh, who was relapsed on, on hormone treatment. So the patient we'll look at today uh, is a patient who presented with de novo metastatic disease. So can I just uh, request control? Okay, this is a 52-year-old postmenopausal female who presented with a... Sorry, can you go back? who presented with a lump in the left breast for about 18 months duration with fatigue and, and cough. Uh, and the biopsy was suggestive of an invasive ductal carcinoma, ER positive, PR negative, HER2 negative, grade three, KI67 of 35%. So all poor prognostic markers. So we know PR negative and grade three and a higher KI67 all poor prognostic markers, even in a hormone positive tumor. The PET scan showed about eight and a half or nine centimeter lesion in the left breast with both skeletal as well as pulmonary metastasis at the time of presentation. Lab parameters were normal. Uh, clearly, the prognosis of the disease was explained to the patient that this is a stage four disease of a non-curable nature, and the intent to treat was to maintain quality of life and improve survival. Next slide. Uh, so the question is, is I mean, we won't do an audience poll, but Dr. Dr. Ghansham or Dr. Vikash, uh, Dr. Ghansham, can you take this as to what next now? So you have a patient was presented uh, with the ER positive grade three breast tumor with uh, lung and liver meds. Uh, would you consider chemotherapy or hormone therapy and what would be your choice and what's the reasoning behind it? So absolutely, so so so, uh, so mm -hmm. this is, this is a, a regular issues now. So after understanding, so so we'll choose an hormonal agent. So either letrozole or uh, anastrozole with any of the CDK4-6 inhibitors. So, Dr. Vikash, can I ask you whether you would have a particular choice of a CDK46 inhibitor or anyone would do? I would agree with uh, Dr. Gansham Biswas sir, right now. But yes, I would love to see a scan right now because uh, try to understand that she has a symptomatic cuff, those pulmonary metastasis. Um, uh, I, I can't see probably my... Uh, the, uh, I want to see the number of those meds and is she in some sort of crisis or not? If she's not in the crisis, probably uh, that's fine. But then uh, if there's always a tendency for us that to give some form of chemos uh, if she's in visceral crisis. If she's not in the visceral crisis, my preference would be a CD 
46 inhibitors plus AI, as Dr. Ganshan Biswas has clearly elucidated. And I would would have an inclination for uh, probably um, um, Abima Cyclic in view of the extensive disease she has. And the problem is the skeletal meds she has. Again, I would like to look at the scans as the myelosuppression uh, it has because many of the CDK4 inhibitors are known to be myelosuppressive. So again, if it's a skeletal extensive disease, then uh, I would have apprehensions of giving CDK4-6 inhibitors, uh, the palbo and the ribro, in view of the myelosuppression it has. I would have inclination of giving a continuous by uh, uh, abima cyclic as compared to the, the same. And uh, thank you, Dr. Bikram. I mean, this patient was not in crisis in any form, uh, either skeletal or, 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 or pulmonary. Base. She has a cough, but that's about it. Uh, and she had bilateral small tiny pulmonary nodules. So we'll look at some of the scans as we go along. There's no risk of fracture and a blood counts are normal. But I take your point that uh, you may consider some chemotherapy in a crisis, but I think uh, a lot of discussion now goes around that even in a crisis, in the presence of a CDK46 inhibitor, the, the quantum of response or the depth of response you get is, is probably equal, if not better, uh, than chemotherapy. And I think Dr. Govind Babu just put it on the chat as well. Uh, that even in crisis, he would probably consider CDK46 inhibitor. But I think uh, when we define, uh, it's quite important to, for us to understand as to how we define visceral crisis. The presence of a visceral metastasis, as Dr. Vikash pointed out, does not necessarily mean a crisis. It has to be uh, a, an organ failure, an impending organ failure that defines, uh, that defines a crisis. And one can consider some form of systemic chemotherapy uh, in, those, in those patients. But I think uh, uh, as with more and more experience and more and more uh, key opinion leaders, and I'm sure we can ask Dr. Advani later on to, to chip in to see what his viewpoints would be uh, in those patients who've got uh, visceral crisis, whether we would consider some form of chemotherapy or continue with, uh, uh, with uh, hormone therapy in the presence of a CDK for sex Yeah, this, I think... Yes, Dr. Advani. Yeah, I think I'm very clear and uh, I'm really in practical terms, when you use it, you will find that even in the crisis, the response to the uh, CDK4 and 6 inhibitors with the endocrine therapy is remarkable. There's no way. I, I don't see any reason to use the chemotherapy at all, even with the crisis. So personally, I feel postmenopausal, uh, HR positive, and... Uh, her two negative metastatic disease, whatever may be the extent, needs the CDK4 inhibitor and uh, the endocrine cell. Thank you very much for that, Dr. Advani. Thank you. Thank you. So anyway, this patient went on to receive the hormone therapy uh, uh, with letrozole and abemacyclib with monthly zolindronic acid for bone protection. She tolerated treatment reasonably well, did not ha have any, any adverse events. We didn't even really see much diarrhea uh, coming from, uh, from, from abimacyclic. The question is, how is it, why did we choose abimacyclic for this patient? And we'll run through some of the uh, data, particularly with regards to the MONARCH 3 study, which this patient ideally fits in, who was a hormone receptor positive, metastatic breast cancer at presentation, postmenopausal, and did not have any prior treatment in this uh, in this study, if patient had to have a new adjuvant therapy, they should have been disease-free for more than 12 months. There was a two is to one randomization for, for abimacyclic versus placebo, along with anastrozole, the primary endpoint of progression-free survival and various other secondary endpoints. And we can see quite clearly that the curve split pretty much earlier on within the first, first one or two months. Uh, and the progression-free survival doubles from 14.8 months to 28. Uh, two months uh, with a hazard ratio of 0.5, which is statistically significant. So excellent data in terms of meeting their primary endpoint of progression free survival. When we start looking at uh, pre-specified subgroup analysis, uh, we can see that the hazard ratio is 0.5, which is, uh, which is on the left, that is for all patients. And we start looking at subgrouping and we start to see a, a kind of a pattern uh, that patients, for example, all the higher risk factors, so patients who've had prior aromatase inhibitors uh, on the left of the, of the hazard ratio versus those who had other endocrine therapy on the right. When we start looking at de novo metastatic disease, they tend to be on the right, on the left, again, and who've got relapses on the right. 
we start looking at younger patients on the left of this group and, and, and the older patients on the right. Similarly, progesterone receptor status, we know that uh, PR negative is associated with poor prognosis and they are again on the left as opposed to the right. So when we start adding these, uh, looking at these smaller uh, fine prints in terms of subgrouping, we see that this, uh, maybe one should start looking at using a uh, clearly in all patients, but more so in those patients who've got poor risk factors, such as PR negative, younger patients and so forth. And we'll look at some of the uh, data we with it. Uh, so when we look at the uh, poor prognostic group, when we start looking at mainly the liver meds, uh, PR negative, higher grade, we see that the delta in favor of abnormocyclib is quite high. Uh, in, in fact, uh, it's about it's more than 30%. Uh, and when we look at Monarch 3, which is this patient fits in, but even with Monarch 2, uh, which the study with Dr. Ghanshyam has showed, or uh, 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 the case he presented, you can see that the quantum of benefit is much higher in those patients who have these higher risk factors. Uh, this is the same thing in a, in a Kaplan micro. So I'm gonna skip these three. Uh, so anyway, this patient after three months of treatment had significant, uh, significantly good partial response to treatment. There was a reduction of about 35% in the breast mass uh, and about 50% in the other metastatic diseases, as well as metabolic uh, act, uh, resolution of metabolic activity in all the skeletal medicines. Skeletal medicines. And you can see that the benefit I mean, is within three months. It's quite dramatic. It's quite striking. Uh, on the left is, is the pre-treatment. On the right is the, is the post, uh, post three months of ibamacyclib and letrozole. Uh, and uh, we can start look at the lung lung lesions on the left as a, as a, again again on the right uh, significant reduction uh, is there. So next slide. Uh, you can start looking at the axillary lymph nodes again complete resolution or uh, more or less uh, more than fifty percent reduction in the axillary nodes. So overall fantastic response in the breast metastatic sites as well as the axillary nodes. Next slide, please. Yeah, so uh, anyway, this patient continued on letrozole and ribocyclin uh, along, along with zolomirinic acid and currently patient remains on treatment. She's doing exceedingly well uh, uh, with, with virtually no symptoms and carrying on our activities of daily living. Uh, this is an old slide. So we've got over 10 patients now with uh, uh, ribocyclin on first line treatment as we've had very, very good uh, uh, early experience with this drug. They tend to be reasonably well tolerated. I know a lot uh, has been said about uh, or discussed about diarrhea, but our patients don't really end up with any grade of grade three or four diarrhea. Most of the diarrhea, if it happens, is usually grade one or two, which can be reasonably well controlled with, uh, with medications. And next slide, please. Uh, I think that is it uh, from us. Thank you. Uh, any, any, any viewpoints on this, uh, Dr. Gansham, uh, Dr. Vikash, on this page, on this case? Yeah, so, so now since uh, the whole discussion is that now we have all the three drugs in the same same space, so how do you differentiate? So are, are you going to uh, uh, differentiate each of these in a different situation? So now, so since uh, my patient and your patients are, are really a bad subset of patients in regards to um, a bad biology amongst that cohort, so probably we choose those uh, abimacyclib as a continuous dosing and looking at, uh, so you looked at the monarch uh, with three. So, uh, so, uh, so, so that that's the take. So probably, so this drug uh, amongst the CDK forces is is, is uh, clinically also behaving the different. And we Indians have not been so so uh, in, in regards to uh, GI toxicity diarrhea. So has not been so. I have now uh, three patients. So all those have been doing good. Dr. Vikash, your viewpoint on this? I, I would also agree with Dr. Gansham and uh, your point that uh, we have been managing Jeff throughout. We have been managing patients with afartinib. We have seen capacitor being toxicities. I believe uh, who has used Remivan Abima Cyclib hasn't had grade three experiences because it's a very well tolerated and with continuous dosing. You are um, in any case at the back of Mind well prepared area. Um, the Lopramide does a very well, uh, good job. And uh, when when you give it continuously, I, I especially uh, tell everybody that uh, when when we practice in places where uh, they are tier two, tier three cities, where people come from different parts, they travel a lot. And when um, 
when you extend them the three weeks on one week off due it is sometimes very tedious to uh, explain these things to the uh, illiterate patients as how to take it with abima um, we are well uh, reserved at the end of the day it's a continuous uh, dosing you give them uh, diarrheal medications and they they come every month and it is a well tolerated drug and uh, especially in a bad prognostic uh, subgroup where uh, liver meds are there pi activities there extensive skeletal meds are there you don't need much monitoring of those uh, ecgs qtc intervals it, it is a safe drug myelos safe uh, bone marrow safe so uh, definitely uh, a, a, a medical oncologist friendly drug i would say for for the thank you uh, thank you dr vikash yes sir medical oncologist friendly and patient friendly so thank you very much for that uh, over to you dr alwani sir for your comments yeah i think we had a very nice discussion and everybody agrees that these new armamentarium in our hand has really changed the treatment landmark of the treatment in such cases actually in the last one minute i want to ask the question to the experts that you know for metastatic disease hr positive and her2 negative we are using the drug uh, with a remarkable response and you saw in last case the primary also almost disappeared why are we not using the same thing a locally advanced breast cancer sir sir ghansham yes so, so we don't have much data at this moment so so we can use so probably in time to come we'll have more of a new adjuvant more of an adjuvant data because this is outside the scope of today's discussion but yeah so so future holds good for these drugs in those settings so we are using new adjuvant hormones so why not hormone with cdk46 so so that will be there in future thank you very much so i think we had a good discussion and i would like to thank all the panelists for giving us this uh, opportunity opportunity to listen to everything about abama uh, thank you very much thank you dr ganesh thank you uh thank you so much sir uh we'll now move on to our next session this session is sponsored by janson and the topic is overall survival leading a new way for front line myeloma management and our speaker is dr biswajit dubashi medical oncologist from puducherry over to you sir uh thank you kashish and uh, thank you kripa for uh, again giving me an opportunity to uh, speak here and uh, just give me a time minute to share the screen yes my screen visible yes sir your screen is visible sir okay uh, uh thank you uh, kripa and uh, i think uh, the topic has been very well uh, crafted out it's a very uh, interesting uh, topic for discussion Uh, more of a kind of debate than a talk so the uh, topic given to me was an overall survival leading a new wave of frontline myeloma management uh, so we know uh, the myeloma over the uh, uh, years have uh, uh, over the survival over the years have improved and clearly we have uh, we see that in 2011 15 you get a, a very uh, high survival rate at 8 years you get even 60 to 70 uh, percent of this patients are uh, alive and uh, we can also see uh, that it's across the age group uh, that it has improved and uh, though over the last few years there seems to be some plateauing because uh, plateauing uh, of the survival uh, so this is uh, the previous one was on the sear data it is also true through the uh, swedish myeloma registry again showing a similar kind of pattern and you can also see this timeline of the drug discoveries uh, uh, which actually closely correlates with the uh, improvement in the survival uh, starting with just steroids in 1960s uh, to monoclonal antibodies in late uh, 2000 uh, uh, 2010 uh, now uh, when we design uh, trials uh, we need to keep into uh, mind multiple factors um, so we need to also look at the quality of life we need to uh, look at the comorbidities 
we, look, we need to look at whether the drug is going to cause uh, toxicity and also look at finally when the drug comes out uh, we also need to look at the uh, financial uh, aspects so all these things are kept in mind when uh, a study is uh, designed and the uh, point of debate is uh, what should be the appropriate endpoint in uh, myeloma trials so the uh, question is whether overall survival should still be the uh, should be the uh, standard uh, endpoint in myeloma trials now what there was an interesting uh, paper by uh, dr vincent rajkumar and uh, and his team where they looked out uh, at what are the endpoints in multiple myeloma over the last uh, 15 years uh, and they did a systematic uh, review so if you see this uh, paper uh, they have actually looked at 151 uh clinical uh, trials uh both phase 2 and phase 3 uh including the pharmaceutical as well as the cooperative group or uh, single center studies and they also looked at whether it was used as a front line or in relapse refractory uh, setting now uh, what was the uh, key uh, summary points in the paper uh, they looked at uh, that the uh, uh, total 101 151 studies the overall survival as the primary endpoint was actually there only in 10% of the trials and uh, most of this overall survival was uh, taken as a primary endpoint as either as a co primary or, or as an uh, as, uh, as a specific primary endpoint in phase 3 studies only one phase 2 study had an overall uh, survival as the primary endpoint now the other endpoints which most of the some of the phase 3 studies looked at uh, some uh, some things were in the um, uh, transplant uh, papers where studies where they looked at stem cell mobilization quality of life uh, and the other events like uh, skeletal events and mucositis now if you see between the pharmaceutical versus the non pharmaceutical uh, companies it is very uh, uh, clear that actually the pharmaceutical companies only took three uh, studies had primary endpoint as overall survival and most of them had progression free survival uh, as the endpoint Uh, whereas uh, in the non pharmaceutical studies at least there were few studies which uh, looked as uh, os as the primary endpoint either as co primary or primary uh, now if you go through the uh, frontline phase 3 studies now we we can see that most of the frontline uh, at least the frontline data uh, people have used os as at least the primary or a co primary endpoint so these are something very interesting that actually over the last so many years overall survival has been the uh, end point in myeloma in only 10% of the studies now if you actually see the trend over the use of uh, overall survival as end point you can clearly see that the uh, overall survival as end point is coming down and uh, it's becoming much uh, smaller and smaller with more surrogates becoming the uh, standard of uh, end points in this group now the next few slides what i'll try to uh, tell is that uh, we will see whether an os as a primary end point for uh, and against why uh, the os should be uh, considered as a end point so uh, the first few slides will be why we should actually consider os as the primary end point let's take the example of uh, daratumumab now the question is should a drug like daratumumab the end points actually be os or should we just be uh, response rates so my understanding and as well as the authors or i think most of us will agree that response as an endpoint for a frontline uh, monoclonal antibody may not be an appropriate endpoint and uh, so i will just go through the examples of uh, how the uh, daraptumumab studies have come across now uh, a uh, the first study was the alcicon uh, study uh, where they uh, looked at in frontline ineligible patients and the primary endpoint was a pfs still a okay reasonable kind of endpoint but if you see the cassiopeia uh, and the griffin where they used in the frontline eligible look at the endpoints which they have used and they have used stringent cr as a primary endpoint is that acceptable uh, i'm not sure whether that is acceptable so if you go by the study design uh, if you see the alcyon uh, study design the primary endpoint was pfs they used other endpoints os though was included at least as a secondary endpoint now this had dara vmp versus vmp and on actually uh, they had some data on the os though it was a secondary endpoint and at least the there was a difference in the uh, dara vmp versus vmp so at least 
PFS at least they have used, so probably an okay endpoint. But let's go to the next study, the Cassiopeia study, where actually the primary endpoint was a stringent CR. And if you actually look at the overall response rates, 93% and 90%. And if you go by the uh, stringent CR rates of additionally 9% increase, would this ultimately translate into a survival benefit? Not sure. So whether this uh, drug should get an approval on this basis, again, not very clear. Similar uh, is the uh, data with the uh, Griffin study. Again, if you see the Griffin study with uh, uh, DRVD versus RVD, again, the endpoint was on uh, stringent CR. So the uh, question again uh, is that whether such surrogate endpoint should be allowed to be uh, taken as endpoints. Now we will uh, again jump to a different uh, area, which is the maintenance uh, therapy in uh, uh, multiple myeloma. Again, whether multiple myeloma maintenance therapy should always be an endpoint. Actually, if you see all the maintenance studies still done till date, they did not use uh, OS as an endpoint. They Many studies use PFS as an endpoint. Now, the question is, after the CalGB, the landmark study, which used lenalidomide, though it was a secondary endpoint, they have clearly shown an overall survival benefit of nine months. So, uh, sorry, uh, uh, of 9%. Uh, that is uh, three years of uh, 88 versus 88%. Now, whether based on this, our new benchmark in post transplant, any maintenance new drug gets approval. Should we still go with PFS or should we still, should we keep OS as an endpoint? Again, uh, something to think about. The uh, third is a very interesting for uh, is whether surrogates, including PFS may sometime mask late toxicity resulting in death. And classical examples are two trials. I'll give an example. One is the Bellini trial and other is the Keynote 183185 trial. And it was clearly shown in these trials that the late toxicities uh, in terms of infection in the uh, venetoclax arm had a poor overall survival, which led to the actually uh, putting a black, bo uh, black box warning on the by the FDA. Now, the Keynote study, again, the pembrolizumab study, again, did not take off because these patients had intestinal ischemia, cardiorespiratory arrest, pulmonary embolism, pneumonia, and many other uh, uh, causes of late death. So again, if you see the Bellini study, uh, they used venetoclax plus bortezomib plus dexamethasone against bortezomib with dexamethasone. And you can clearly see the primary endpoint was PFS. And uh, when venetoclax was added to uh, bortezomib and dexa, it significantly improved PFS overall response and MRD negativity rates. So again, if you see that if you would have taken PFS, ORR and MRD, this drug should have got an approval. But it turned out that these patients later on had worse OS outcomes and there was an increased incidence of death attributed to infection. So similar uh, is the data from the Keynote 183 uh, study uh, and the uh, uh, which actually looked at pomalidomide uh, with uh, dexamethasone in relapsed refractory multiple myeloma. Again, very clear that uh, actually there is no, uh, actually the pembrolizumab arm did worse than the uh, standard of care arm and hence it got, uh, was disapproved. Again, if you see, this was a study where pembrolizumab was approved as a frontline and that again included uh, SCR as your uh, endpoint and MRD as your primary endpoint. And you can clearly see that the OS is down with pembrolizumab. So again, I thought whether OS should still be the standard of care and not some surrogate uh, marker. The other question about is uh, whether early endpoints may not, so something with uh, OS, this is a, a counter argument again, that sometimes an endpoint uh, as a surrogate endpoint may not show an benefit, but subsequently as you uh, uh, prolong the uh, follow-up, you might see an overall survival benefit. So this is exactly opposite to what I was discussing before. And hence again, whether OS should be again, the primary endpoint again comes into play. This is the study design for Ford where they looked at uh, uh, carfilzomib, cyclophosphamide, dexamethasone followed by uh, transplant. Again, uh, KRD injection followed by transplant. And there was an uh, arm where they did KRD without uh, transplant. And actually, if you see the uh, response rates, and you would have gone by this, there was no difference. So you would have actually told the study as negative, transplant may not be beneficial 
if you are actually uh, doing a krd but then you look at the survival which uh, subsequently when they followed up with the progression free survival you can clearly see there is a survival benefit so you can't actually take away a drug uh, so early saying no response when uh, actually uh, either a drug or an intervention uh, without having an appropriate endpoint now a few slides on why os uh, should not be kept as an uh, primary endpoint uh, now we know that uh, there are numerous effective treatment options that are available and new drugs are getting approved rapidly so establishing an os benefit remains costly and time consuming and classical example was the swog 0777 trial which first established vrd as the first line of treatment for multiple myeloma so we can see that uh, the swog trial was basically the landmark trial where vrd became the standard of care and they used pfs as the primary endpoint and secondary endpoints as os and rr now if you would have kept let's say os as an endpoint in that study the pfs showed a difference very clear cut 13 months difference in 2015 but imagine your data for the os came in 2020 which showed a difference so you would have waited for five long years before you would have approved the drug for an overall survival benefit and the patients would not have benefited so this is a counterpoint against why os should be should not be kept as an endpoint now the second question is are there good surrogates to uh, reflect against uh, to show that os can be kept as a primary endpoint and if you are appropriately <coughs> validating os then you could actually use this for early approval of the uh, drugs uh, and uh, this comes from uh, actually the data recently uh, published by uh, dr munshi where a large meta analysis clearly establishes the role of mrd negativity in in predicting uh, survival so if you see the uh, progression free survival in patients who are uh, newly diagnosed and transplant eligible there is a clear cut difference between who are mrd negative versus who are mrt positive similar thing was seen even in the transplant ineligible patients and also in the relapsed refractory myeloma now if you actually see the uh, os data that also clearly uh, shows that if you are mrd negative there is a very good uh, chance that your survival is going to be very good so if you have a very robust endpoint we have good data to prove that Uh, you have a good robust endpoint then why at all wait till you wait for a overall survival benefit and you lose the uh, time uh, for approval of a drug so with the new prognostic and uh, predictive biomarkers which are coming up probably we also have to uh, balance between whether os should get uh, an approval uh, of, should be a primary endpoint or we should uh, let it go now the question number 3 uh, is that uh, the initial question may uh, become irrelevant by the time you actually uh, uh, you get the drug approved and subsequently the uh, uh, the control arm may not be the standard of care so actually you lose out so much time that the relevance of that particular uh, drug then goes off and uh, also the, must understand that when you are doing an overall survival the availability of salvage therapy across different time periods and various countries again vary so you may not actually be able to prove an overall survival benefit even though the drug is quite effective so my last slide uh, the take home message is that os as primary endpoint was numerically lower in pharmaceutical rcts compared with non pharmaceutical trials the points which i would say that os still should be the primary endpoint is that any new drug which gets uh, which wants an approval i think we should still do an overall survival because we have we require only a very less time for proving whether an overall survival benefit is there or not at least in a relapsed refractory and when the drug moves up then i think we should then make sure that we uh, we can use some of the surrogate endpoints now the trials aiming to move an established agent in an earlier line of treatment <coughs> should definitely use os maintenance studies i think we should use os and even if you say that we will use surrogate Uh, then the os data should be followed up by the authority after initial approvals uh, so that we don't lose out some of the infections as we have uh, seen in couple of trials uh, if you have a well validated surrogate endpoint like an mrd then i think this is uh, this is a food for thought that we could still use this as a uh, endpoint so i think os will always be a robust endpoint but should it necessarily be used as primary endpoints in all trials is questionable thank you
Thank you. Am I audible? Okay. Ashish, am I audible? Yes, sir, sir, you're audible, sir. I think Ashish has got some uh, connectivity issues, net issues. Okay. Uh, thank, thank you very much for that wonderful overview, sir. It was also was a pleasure you. listening to you as always. So, sir, am I audible now? I'm so sorry. I yeah, Kashish, you're audible. The, sir, uh, so, if any any of our, uh, we still have some time. So, if any of anyone from the audience has any questions, I would request uh, Dr. Besuji to please take them up. Yeah. You can just raise your hand and uh, uh, we can continue. We'll just wait for another 20 seconds if anyone has any questions. Um, this visit, sir, uh, Kripa here. Yeah, Kripa. Again, uh, probably if I could just ask you a question, sir. Yeah. I mean, like, uh, you spoke about OS being the gold standard, obviously, sir. But we know in a, in a chronic, uh, probably, in, I mean, like, incurable disease like myeloma, would we accept PFS as a probably good enough surrogate endpoint, sir? Or would we still say that, okay, fine, we only have to rely on overall survival, sir? What would be your take home? Yeah, so PFS is still okay as a... Uh, closer surrogate but the problem now is happening is that we are actually the recent trials have been moving towards using more surrogates like MRD negativity you are looking at response rates and giving approvals for drugs and that could be seriously an issue and uh, I have shown you two uh, trials where actually the drug Venetoclax uh, the Bellini trial very clearly proved actually the PFS also was superior but then when they actually looked at overall survival over a period of time, they found that there were relatively more deaths in the venetoplax arm when compared to the other arm and they had to stop. So, uh, so it's, it's important that you we need to understand the importance of the OS and not completely uh, shoo it off. Uh, though we can keep uh, the PFS as your primary endpoint, the OS should still remain in your secondary endpoint and probably uh, the drug authorities have to take care and follow that up. Uh, on long term and keep a track on it. Uh, absolutely, sir. Completely agree with you on that. In fact, if you look at the recent approval for Melflufen as well, that was also recently uh, taken off the market based on the phase three data from the Horizon study as well. So I think yet another example of what you've just illustrated so far. Thank you very much for that, sir. Uh, thank you so much, sir. Uh, we'll now move on to our next session. Uh, this session is on hematology, and it gives me great pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Dr. P.K. Jayachandran, medical oncologist from Chennai. He'll be talking on the topic, role of molecular testing and targeted therapy in AML. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Prashish. I'm now audible. Is my slide visible, Tashish? Yes, sir. Your slides are visible, sir. Yeah. Good afternoon to everyone. I, it's an afternoon presentation on a Sunday afternoon. So I thank, uh, and it's my, always my pleasure for me to speak in one of the conferences, which is organized by my close friend, Dr. Kupa Shankar. And uh, being a part of the organizing panel also, I'm very much uh, take this slide and present this topic. The role of molecular testing in AML and also the role of targeted therapies. We all know AML is a single disease about a couple of decades ago. And now, uh, so warm welcome and warm greetings from the Cancer Institute. And thank you. And this is the molecular heterogeneity of AML today. So if you look at uh, the molecular subtypes, there are various molecular subtypes we have about a decade ago. We were looking at a lot of uh, stratification on 821, inversion 16, and then 922 rally, the NPM mutations, IDH. These are all the various uh, subtypes we were thinking about. And each subtype has a varied presentation and varied uh, amount of mutations in the, in, uh, differ in the number of mutations and differ in the frequency of mutations, and even inside the each subset. 
So mm-hmm. this is how uh, the molecular, molecular heterogeneity of AML on this day. So uh, with this background, we'll go into the topic per se. <clears throat> so why do we need to do a molecular testing in AML? Basically, we need to risk stratify. By risk stratification, we look at prognostic significance and we do modifications in therapy. So when you do risk stratification based on the risk stratification, you give an additional uh, stem cell transplantation, consolidation, intermediate and poor risk. You add a few therapies like FLT3 in this. And you also use targeted therapies, that's for FLT3 inhibitors in first line. And in relapsed patients, you can use IDH inhibitors, uh, again, FLT3 inhibitors. So these are things which you can do. And one more thing which is coming up is the response assessment. So we were morphologically assessing the response and now we are slowly moving over to the minimal residual disease. So it is helpful that molecular testing in AML is also test- useful in minimal residual disease. So moving up, what are the modalities used for convention- uh, molecular testing? The one is the conventional karyotyping, which is a good old Almost more than five decades this has been in practice. Then comes the fish fluorescence in situ hybridization. And then comes the PCR and then the NGS of it in the market. So we do various uh, testing. So why do we do the various testings has come up over and over time, uh, newer and newer testing is coming up. Once upon a conventional karyotyping it has a very low sensitivity. Again, uh, sometimes metaphase growth will be an issue. And uh, even if there sometimes there, there can be an <clears throat> cryptic translocation which cannot be picked up and it does not pick up any mutations. So this is the risk stratification. We all know this has been, been, been following for the past few years, this 2017 ELN guidelines. Your adverse risk cytogenetics are slowly increased in number. You have one mutation, mutated ASXL1 mutation and mutated P53 coming into the picture and various other changes have been incorporated and this is the latest stat of that. There's no, no other newer stratification has come into picture. This is one which we are following. So with the use of karyotyping, again, we cannot pick up the point mutations. We cannot be picking up the NPM mutation, P3 mutations, ASXL1, TET2, P53, the X1 mutations. These all cannot be picked up. Even the conventional uh, karyotyping, again, you can on uh, these translocations sometimes get missed due to various uh, uh, metaphase growth issues, or sometimes there can be a cryptic translocation in version 16 which get missed. So, karyotyping is a good one and the old one, but it's never been still been practiced. I'll say why it is. And coming out of the fish again, fish is very good for translocations, and also you can use the break apart fish. And it does not pick up the mutations like NPM 153, TP53, and the other point mutation, the ASS, ASXL1. Again, one more thing is it cannot pick up the complex karyotypes, which is the, which one you can be picked up by the karyotyping. Coming out of the PCR, it gives a more wider range. Again, PCR, again, TP53, ASXL1 mutation, and all. There's no standardized PCR available for that, uh, for AML per se. Per se. So again, if you can develop and you need to standardize again <clears throat> and multiplex PCR, you need to a lot of primers uh, are required. So again, complex karyotype cannot be picked up and uh, monosomic 7 cannot be picked up by the PCR. So coming on to the NGS, again, NGS has a different panel uh, again, can detect all these things, uh, but it cannot give the FLT3 ratio, the sense ITD, high or low allylic ratio. It can, again cannot pick up the complete karyotypings. Uh, karyotype based abnormalities. Again, these things which are all translocations are also RNA based translocations. Again, there's a lot of issues in RNA based translocation and standardization. I'll come to the subsequent slide about what is the issues. So, uh, as on date, the best choice for going for molecular typing is a combination of conventional karyotyping and PCR and plus or minus NGS. So I would say uh, everyone should do uh, conventional karyotyping under P- multiplex PCR looking at the standard 821 innovation 16 NP1 plus 3 ITDA at least. And also the ADPAS This, these all these, uh, if you do all these three, I think about nine, more than 95% of the times, you would be able to stratify exactly a, patient, a given AML patient. So <clears throat> what are the various hurdles in molecular testing? So one is the availability and accessibility. 
and as on date uh, the a lot of f- first tier cities are having the accessibility easily uh, i think only the second tier cities and the other smaller towns need to have this issue of accessibility because various other uh, corporates have come with the uh, ngs pcr testing panels widely available and the cost has also significantly come down from what has been before a couple of years ago the cost were very huge 30 40000 now it's come down to 20000 rupees and when you're going to treat the patient for a few lakhs i think it was in the big deal <clears throat> and only the next is the issues with the sample transport again sample transport a lot of th- things are based on rna based testing so rna stability is very important uh, the longer the transport you take and again the rna stability goes down and uh, again you can have uh, issues with the uh, ice means, transport in the uh, cold chain so this has to be kept in mind the standards of reporting there's no proper standards of reporting in fuel labs so there's a different standards have been maintained different reagents have been used there's no common there's no single common reagents or single common primers or not there are no standardized primers so there must be that should be related to the caution you should be reporting standards are not uniform among all the labs so each one have their own standardization and there's no centralized standardization for all these labs like bci bell quantity pci you have an is and again this does not have any is or something like that so again that is one thing you should keep in mind when you are looking at the pcr panels of various again looking at looking at the ngs again the bioinformatics makes a big deal the person who is going to do the bioinformatic analysis have to be very clinically knowledgeable also to give us a proper report regarding this so again why we do this stratification is to prognosticate the patients this is one of the uh, you can see this curve in most of the aml patients wherever you go this curve is almost the same the good risk is always having a better prognosis intermediate risk next and then comes the poor risk sometimes you can have intermediate and poor risk almost nearing the equal uh, uh, survival also so good this is one thing which is said that the most standard of intermediate and poor risk and this is a algorithm of therapy which is commonly uh, been proposed by the western people that this was published in the blood cancer journal in 2020 but unfortunately in india we don't have a luxury of uh, using all the targeted therapies we do classify the patient to either eligible for intensive induction or ineligible for intensive induction the patient is ineligible for intensive induction we offer them hypomethylating agents or sometimes low dose rc or if you have a patient uh, affording for venetoclax then import and use so the usual protocol we use if a patient is eligible for intensive induction therapy we go for intensive induction using 3 plus 7 and few centers we want to use pragaida for poor risk patients in rackley directly and addition of fl2 inhibitor if is possible because we do have a uh, fl2 inhibitor medostar in our india about two years ago and now with the available of generic small people can be into a fl2 inhibitor with the standard 3 plus 7 so this is what our class, our maybe after few years when we have all the other newer drugs maybe uh, we will be using this protocol or maybe uh, what about a new drug Uh, new drugs may come into the picture always so coming on to the response response assessment this is also another part of the spa, another part of the molecular testing so response assessment was molecular assessment subsequently we went on to have a mrd mrd is more spoken of in all acute lymphoblastic leukemia and it is a standard protocol to do an mrd assessment along with uh, a morphological assessment in acute lymphoblastic leukemia but in aml it has been slowly coming up in the past two years a lot of studies have proven that uh, mrd assessment should also be made as a standard of treatment even though even has also brought in a lot of thing a lot of uh, guidances for doing mrd assessment and most commonly mrd assessment is done by a multi parametric flow cytometry based either eight color 10 color 12 color flow based testing is being done and the cut off widely accepted for aml is 0.1% please keep in mind that's 0.01 Point zero one percent is kept for for ALL. So ALL is the first point one percent. So other modalities other than flow cytometry is where you use the PCR uh, use and molecular testing for MRDs. 
that is a real time quantitative pcr you can use as a, a modality for testing mrd digital droplet pcr you can use as a modality to test mrd and next generation sequencing can also be test, uh, used for testing mrd so regarding few studies on real time quantitative pcr there's a npm1 quantitative pcr is being widely acceptable as a mrd assessment so this is a study which is a the study showed that if you have a better log log three more than three log reduction your survival is going to be better than patients who have less than three log reduction in npm1 quantitative pcr at the end of consolidation and also for cbf core binding factor leukemias you can even do a quantification of 821 inversion 16 pcr this also showed that if you have a good uh, log drop copy level drop from the upfront to the consolidation at the end of the treatment Uh, you say the MRD positive patients have a higher risk of relapse, and patients who have a deeper response or uh, more than three log reduction in the copy numbers, then they have a better better risk of uh, lesser risk of relapse. So both in A21, this is a study which is from uh, 2014, and subsequently multiple studies have proven that the CDF leukemias using RQPCR and also MPM using RQPCR have a data on using. RQPCR quantitative as a uh, as a MRD assessment routinely. Another modality which I told is digital droplet PCR is more accurate. It gives a exact number of copies rather than giving uh, in a real time quantitative PCR. You compare it with the standard gene, but here you have an exact number of copies what is uh, available. So it will be more deeper assessment, but it's very accurate and high cost. but the problem is not widely available for clinical use more laboratory laboratory use only it's still and again standardization must be there because uh, we don't know what is going to be in digital droplet pcr whether it's going to be very deep response how deep we should allow or how the uh, real standardization issues should be there regarding ngs again stability and quality uh, quality is a very important thing because uh, these all things are uh, most of the pcr c21 pcr a21 under ngs I mean, NPM and NGS are all being assessed by using a RNA based assay. So again, cost is an issue. Uh, even larger mutations like internal tandem duplications, large lesions like monosomy cells cannot be assessed using a uh, NGS based assay. Uh, again, it's not standardized widely. So how much number you should report? What is the percentage of uh, VAF variable uh, frequency should be reported? Everything is a question, and it's really it's not standardized yet to come into practice as a standard. clinical pack but still we can use it for few mutations like ng uh, npm1 mutations and adh and all you can use it still use it as a and uh, use it for assessing the mrd so coming on to the second part of the topic the targeted therapies in acute myeloid leukemia so there are various targeted therapy in uh, acute myeloid leukemia uh, slowly coming into the landscape into the treatment over the past decade uh, previously we didn't have much of uh, For four decades, till 2012, 15, we didn't have no much of uh, newer drugs coming into the AML except for gemtozumab, which was initially put in the market and then back out again, back out in 2008. And uh, we didn't have much of change in the therapies. And uh, in the past five years to six years, we have a lot of drugs which has been pushed into the uh, AML portfolio, and one such as three inhibitors, IDH inhibitors, and the venetoclax. And the uh, other drugs like a glassy day gave has been put into uh, approved drug. <clears throat> so we'll come into one by one as briefly. So regarding the FLT3 mutation, you can see that this is a, com- a study. There are multiple studies for patients. The different FLT3 inhibitors like metoclopramide, sulfonamide. You can resort in the quinoa and a gilteplatin. So most of the drugs have been approved for use in the second line, and only this metoclopramide has been used in the first line treatment. This is a study which compared uh, the phase three randomized study where three plus seven with metoclopramide versus three plus seven with placebo was given, and it was continued till consolidation and maintenance was given with metoclopramide. And for patients undergoing stem cell transplantation, metoclopramide maintenance was not allowed. And the primary endpoint was oral cell, which was met with this study, the ATP study. And there was a 21 percent risk reduction in terms of death, and the statistically and clinically significant. So regarding the IDH mutations, a uh, couple of IDH mutations: IDH1 and IDH2. The IDH1 inhibitors are uvacitinib, IDH2 inhibitors inacitinib, and these are various studies which has been done in the 
background of IDH mutation, the ivocytinib, inacetinib, and IDH1 and 2 respectively, the hypomethylene agent with metoclax, glossalc with metoclax, Azza with ivocytinib, Azza with inacetinib, and metoclax with ivocytinib. These are various phase 2 studies, phase 1B, but phase 2 studies been done and have been shown to be uh, having a very good response rate. And as on date, ivocytinib and inacetinib has been approved for use in patients with respective IDH mutations either in the second line or the first line in patients who are not eligible for intensive therapy. So coming on the TP50 mutation, these are a group of patients where they are going to do very badly. Uh, their prognosis is worse. And even Benidoclax study-based studies did not prove that, uh, did not have a very good activity against the TP53 mutation. The APR246 is a uh, drug which is targeting the TP53 mutation. And Maglodimab is a monoclonal antibody, which is anti-CD47 antibody. These two drugs are promising in the phase one and phase B, phase one B and phase two trials, and have a very good response rate in patients with TP53 mutations yet to come into the clinical market. So coming on to, I think probably everyone would have watched this movie, uh, rice, the rice, Shpa, the rice. So Vendroclax is the something which is awesome in the past couple of years as a, a very game changer in the treatment of uh, AML, which was nowhere uh, been, endoclax has been, uh, has been started to use as uh, some other, came to use for various other, like follicular lymphoma, like local lymphoma, slowly CLS, and then it was, uh, and now it has clicked and it has come into uh, as a game changer in the AML treatment. These are the various studies which has been uh, done as on date with the combination of venetoclax. So we have the venetoclax being approved with an hypomethylating agent, azacidinib with venetoclax in patients who are not fit for treatment. Since elderly patients who are not fit for treatment as a first-line treatment. And also it has been approved along with low dose RRC, again in patients who are more than 60 years not fit for treatment. And widely it has been used as a second-line chemotherapy in patients who are not fit for standard salvage treatment. So it has been studied with the uh, hypomethylating agents, low-dose RRC, and it has been studied 2 plus 5. It has been studied with Flagida, Cladribin, Cobimetinib, Enansutlin. Uh, so various drugs uh, has been combined with Venetoclax and it's been studied. And the Venetoclax in this group of patients, the ST trial with the hypomethylating agents, with Ventoclax and a lot of cells, he has shown an excellent EFS and wise benefit in these patients who are not eligible for chemotherapy. And but apologies, moving can I forward, you to conclude, sir. So we yeah, couple of slides, our time. A couple of slides, more. I think uh, we are already having some more time from the previous symposium. A couple of slides more, I'll finish it off. Ventoclax okay. uh, has been tried with multiple doublets and triplets, uh, hypomethylating agents, lotus RC. FLT3 inhibitors, IDH1 inhibitors, MDM2 antagonists, CDK9 inhibitors, MCL1, and various. It's also been tried with azacidinib and Ventoclax with and triplet based backgrounds. And this is also various ongoing trials with uh, Ventoclax. And in the next few years, I think um, about three to five years, we will have a lot of change in the treatment landscape of AML with the availability of Ventoclax. And the only issue is Ventoclax is still not available in India. It has to be imported to India. And as a conclusion, uh, molecular testing gives us better risk stratification in AML patients to offer a stem cell transplantation or all and targeted therapy. And also it is helpful in MRD analysis, but still needs more refining and standardization in terms of MRD analysis. So how to choose molecular testing, I already dealt up. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, sir. I now invite our expert, uh, Dr. Jos M. Iso, uh, senior hematologist from Chennai, to please give the expert comments on this talk. Thank you, uh, Dr. Jay Chandran, for taking us through this. Uh, a very complex uh, uh, disease, uh, acute myeloid leukemia. Um, so um, um, it's it's really uh, good to 
uh, find uh, uh, and predict why uh, some patients do good and why uh, some don't do so good. But even in the good risk, unfortunately, uh, many do relapse. So uh, uh, in the field of medical oncology, um, everyone is uh, talking about a tumor board. I think if there's one disease uh, that needs to be, uh, uh, that needs to have a tumor board would be acute myeloid leukemia. For example, each molecular target, there should be an expert. Uh, so that's how complex uh, this disease is. Um, uh, uh, so we have nicely evolved from karyotyping to um, CBP-alpha, NPM1, FLT3 and so forth. And now we know um, there are other uh, mutations that is equally uh, important such as P53, DNM, T3 and, uh, and some more are there, for example, ASXL1. Now the new thing is, um, uh, uh, I'm not sure when we will come to this, looking at the uh, micro RNA. For example, we feel some AML patients may be at a high risk, for example, FLIT3 uh, mutated. But if they have a micro, N N micro RNA expression that is um, uh, 181 alpha, they are good. Whereas if they have 155, they are poor. So that's how this uh, field is uh, uh, progressing. So sometimes, if you don't have these tools and techniques, we may uh, we may um, um, uh, tell a, a particular patient they fall under the under the bad risk, and then um, they may uh, uh, get um, uh, extra treatments. But anyway, I think we'll have to wait for that till we get these tools to refine uh, further. Similarly, uh, comes the treatment, as uh, Dr. Jayachandran has uh, nicely elaborated all these uh, um, uh, magnificent uh, trials. Uh, for example, the FLT3 inhibitors, where to use them, uh, the BCL2 inhibitors, where to use, and then the IDH1 and the IDH2 inhibitors. Uh, um, I, uh, and then uh, uh, how to choose chemotherapy and whether to use uh, low intensity therapy for select patients, uh, especially the ones who cannot afford and so forth. Um, uh, uh, so thank you, Dr. Jayachandran, for uh, taking us through this topic for, uh, for, uh, for the given time that you had. Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you so much, sir. Uh, I now invite our chairperson, Dr. Raghu K, to please introduce our uh, two debaters. Raghu, sir, are you there? So this, uh, I'll just go on. We'll, uh, so this debate is on the topic role of ASCT in the first line treatment of multiple myeloma in clinical practice. And our two debaters are Dr. Deepan Rajamanikam, medical oncologist from Namakal, in favor of the motion. And against the motion, uh, Dr. Nikita Mehra, medical oncologist from Chennai. Over to you, Dr. Deepan. Kripa and Moscon 7 organized community. Uh, thank you for having me. Good evening to the chairpersons. I'll just start off. So we'll just get on to the topic. So multiple myeloma, the treatment paradigm, usually the patient is diagnosed, stratified, and then stratified again as transplant eligible or ineligible. They go through induction, consolidation, followed by maintenance, and then wait for the next relapse and then treat it again. So what we are going to concentrate today is on the consolidation part, that is post induction after you get a good response. And then you want to want to deepen the response. So what do you actually want to achieve in multiple myeloma treatment? This good response, you need a good induction regimen. It can be either a triplet or currently it has been uh, in work for quarter, quarter plate. And how do you want this response to be going in deeper? You either choose an autologous transplant or you want to continue the same drugs as consolidation. And you need to maintain this response 
we need a sustainable response so that is where maintenance come in all this why this is to improve the first pfs if you improve the first pfs it uh, almost supposed to show that you have a better os and improve rates of mrd negativity ultimately what we want to achieve is an improved overall survival now is aact uh, standard of care in myeloma yes it is historically speaking all these studies before have already been uh, it's uh, time and tested and all these have shown better pfs uh, pfs rates with uh, transplant rather than chemotherapy alone now uh, dr biswas has already introduced you to all the new agents that are there coming up and uh, latest being bi specific antibodies and uh, binary candidate receptor car t cell therapy which are in the which are uh, under evaluation right now so in the era of novel therapies does the benefit of acd in first line still hold true that is the question of today so there was a study published in 2017 in the NEGM IFM BFSI uh, 2009 study it was done in US and France basically patients newly diagnosed uh, multiple myeloma were uh, randomized to receiving induction both received rbd three cycles followed by one arm received the autologous transplant and one arm received five more consolidation cycles of rbd which was followed by maintenance lenalidomide in both arms and those patients who actually relapsed in the non autologous transplant arm they were subsequently subjected to late transplant so the end point was pfs in that study and you can see the graph is clearly delineating and uh, there is a significant progression free survival in the autologous transplant arm rather than the um, uh, chemo arm which was around close to 36 versus 15 months so the minimum follow up of 4 years there was no survival benefit 81% and 82% but there was significant improvement in median pfs 36 versus 50 and mrd negativity uh, mrd was uh, much higher in the transplant arm 79 versus 65% why there was no survival benefit is because of all the patients who relapsed uh, 172 out of them 136 were subjected to a salvage transplant now is mrd the holy grail in myeloma mrd in myeloma is uh, currently done by ngs or a flow cytometry or and and also if required pet ct to be complementary but there are certain issues which are still uh, in this uh, like well, how do you call it or when do you call it sustained mrd negativity what are the tools do you use to say this is mrd negative is it standardized so all that questions are still in play but if you see, see mrd status in the ifm study 2009 at the end of 4 years the stratification is between mrd positive and negative post transplant and mrd positive patients did very well off rather than the mrd negative patients there was a forte trial uh, this was a pre maintenance analysis it was a multiple randomized open label phase 2 study you can see the first two arms underwent uh, transplant and the last arm did not undergo transplant they and uh, the arm was uh, krd followed by krd consolidation followed by maintenance uh, so in this study if you see we are, what i'm concentrating here is on the whether the autologous transplant or the 12 cycles of krd was similar and according to that uh, the response rates as well as mrd negativity was similar in both groups just four points difference but when you see after one year the mrd negativity the there was a difference in between the autologous transplant time as well as krd which is 90 versus 72 in the high risk group but in the low there is rss rss low risk group there was not much of significant difference but in the high risk group there was lot, there was significant difference early relapse in the study was uh, taken as 18 months and if you see uh, high risk patients were uh, highly likely to relapse earlier uh, and uh, there was a significant difference between the transplant arm versus the non transplant arm 11 versus 22 relapses and if you see odds ratio uh high risk patients were uh, relapsing faster and uh, autologous transplant 
and MRD negativity had a decreased chance of early infection. This is the Cardamon study. Cardamon study was uh, uh, presented in NASCO 2021. This uh, had a different induction regimen using carfilzomib as the uh, proteasome inhibitor. And they wanted to see if it induces deeper response and MRD negativity, raising the question of the benefit for blood uh, front transplant. And carfilzomib maintenance has not been explored so far, so they wanted to explore that. So uh, transplant eligible patients were uh, randomized to receive KCD induction four cycles followed by transplant or no transplant, but they received four cycles of KCD again and maintenance carpal zone uh, after that. MRD also was assessed at different types of one, post uh, uh, collection, post transplant or consolidation and post uh, one year of maintenance. So can I request you to conclude please? Yeah. So the response rates and MRD were found to be much higher in the transplant versus the non-transplant. And this was a non-inferiority trial. So uh, they concluded that it was not non-inferior. There was minus 5.8 difference. And uh, by MRD status, if you see, there was a significant difference by risk study, uh, by MRD status and randomization pre-consolidation. Uh, there was a statistical difference in MRD positive patients. So this was one that they took that if you are MRD positive after induction pre-transplant, they probably benefited from, from transplant. This was the, and the Indian, Indian uh, data, the, this is the regional challenges. This was published in uh, 2017 uh, regarding patients acceptance to transplant, availability of transplant, financial constraints. And this is another article by uh, Lalit Kumar sir, uh, 1,658 patients, but we don't know how many of them got transplanted. So tra transplant data in India is actually uh, lacking uh, because it's a scientific making. I wouldn't like the cost to come in, but still, ASCT is the first line of uh, ASCT in first line is still not over. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, sir. I now request uh, Dr. Nikita Mehra to present her side. Over to you, ma'am. Can you see my slides? Not yet, ma'am. Just one second, I'm sorry. I think I'm gonna have to um, email it to you. I'm somehow not able to uh, open it. Oh, Ma'am, we request you to please uh, email it with the Moscon ID. Have you received it? Yes, yeah. Not yet, ma'am. Uh, it says uh, sent to the seventh Moscon conference at Gmail. Yes, ma'am, it'll probably take another 20, 25 seconds. Yeah. Yes, ma'am, we've received it. I'm extremely sorry about uh, uh, the glitch. Thank you uh, so much to the organizing team for uh, inviting me to this uh, uh, really very nice uh, conference uh, that we've had over the last uh, three days. Uh, thank you, Dr. Krupa, for the kind invitation and um, good evening to all uh, and the chairpersons. So Dr. Deepan has already agreed that the ultimate goal of uh, of uh, myeloma treatment is um, an overall survival improvement. 
Uh, so let me show you um, some of the slides I have. And let's really see if um, uh, OS, uh, if there was an OS improvement uh, with uh, uh, with transplant in multiple myeloma. Uh, so of course I'm speaking against um, uh, the motion uh, for transplant in the first line setting. And I must uh, uh, mention my disclaimer and that is that we've done about 142 transplants for multiple myeloma at the Institute. Next slide, please. Um, so what is the most important primary endpoint in uh, a phase three RCT? And uh, Dr. Deepan has already alluded to the phase three RCT, which I am going to be talking about as well. You obviously want to see an improvement in OS and quality of life, or at least uh, either of the two. Let's see if um, the study has shown uh, an improvement in OS. Next, please. Uh, so Dr. Deepan has already talked about the, st the study and has uh, talked about PFS uh, in great uh, detail. Yes, I do admit um, uh, there was an improvement in the progression-free survival, which was the primary endpoint from the, uh, the DFCI IFM 2009 study. But the overall survival at a medium, medium follow-up of about four years was the same. Uh, next slide, please. So again, you, there obviously is an unmet need uh, to improve the survival of patients with multiple myeloma, especially those with ISS-3 and cytogenetic high-risk group. Now, if you look at this forest plot, there wasn't an improvement uh, even in uh, PFS when you looked at ISS-3 and the high-risk. Next, please. Uh, so this was the most recent update from the same study. And again, at eight years, there is no improvement in overall survival. It's about 60% in both the arms. And they've again gone on to look at uh, PFS2. That is, once patients have progressed to look at uh, how uh, progression free, how the progression-free survival was uh, subsequently, there was really no difference. And uh, if my friend was to tell me that the patients have mostly received expensive regimes, they haven't. They've actually only about 14 and 12 patients have uh, in each arm. This was a study of about 700 patients went on to receive carfilzomib and Dara in the second line. Next, uh, please. Uh, so this is a study. It's, it's essentially the same group uh, where bone marrow samples were stored and uh, an NGS-based uh, MRD analysis was done. And what you can essentially see is if the patient has achieved an MRD negative state, or uh, regardless of, of the risk, regardless of the stage, or regardless of whether the patient has had just RVD or RVD with transplant, you see that the outcomes are, are more or less the same. Uh, the survival is more or less the same when you compare MRD negative versus MRD positive. So certainly there is a group of patients in the standard risk who've achieved an MRD negative who probably do not require a transplant because you're not going to see a difference in uh, any of the survivals, PFS or OS. Next slide, please. Uh, again, uh, so uh, number one, overall survival was not uh, better uh, based on the largest study when they compared uh, a PI imid based induction uh, triplet versus that with transplant. Um, the quality of life was also not any different uh, between the two arms, please. Uh, next slide, please. So this is the fatigue and pain scores. You don't see any difference at the last follow-up, which was at about uh, two years. Next slide, please. Uh, now, the patients uh, from that IFM study, uh, from the uh, 2009 IFM study where VRD was given uh, uh, versus uh, VRD and transplantation, actually went on to receive PCD for relapsed multiple myeloma. And that was the most common regimen uh, that was uh, uh, administered. And you do know pomalidomide is, is very, very easily available in uh, India. Multiple generics, the costs have significantly uh, uh, come down. So PCD is not so much of an issue in the sec second line in our setting. And what you essentially see over here is that there was a difference in uh, the PFS. So patients who went on to subsequently receive a transplant and if about 70% did receive a subsequent transplant had better outcomes in terms of PFS versus those who were only continued on PCD. But again, you see the overall survival between the two arms was not different. Next slide, please. 
Uh, so this is just a meta-analysis, uh, next slide please, of, of the most important autotransplant studies. And uh, again, in terms of uh, overall survival, when you look at the forest plot for overall survival, there is no improvement in OS if the patient has received BRD or cybody. The improvements in OS you see are with patients who have received Lendex-based uh, inductions, which we do not um, follow. Next slide, please. Uh, so this is a little futuristic, but the data is already out now. And uh, this is essentially the mutational burden in patients who've had a transplant. So at baseline, they have about 7,000 mutations. Uh, this is any a patient with multiple myeloma before they start treatment. But once they've actually had a transplant, this study very nicely, again from Dana Farber, showed that the mutations they acquire are a lot higher. It was over 10,000 in patients who've had a transplant. Now, what this is going to go on to do will only be known uh, with uh, time. Next slide, please. Uh, this is another very uh, similar study, and uh, this essentially shows that this mutational signature, which is the SSB, SBS, uh, MM1, uh, the, the mutations actually increase significantly. What you can see in the, the bottom graph in black is these mutations that patients acquire post a, a transplant versus, I mean, if, you, if, if a patient did not have a transplant at relapse, they do not show this mutational signature. And it is quite high. The mutational burden is as high as 10 or 20% uh, when compared to chemo alone. Next slide, please. Um, uh, Ma'am, can I request you to conclude? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm done. Thank you. Uh, so obviously, uh, there are a lot of studies that are ongoing, and we really, time will tell us if, if uh, CAR-T and, and the bites, uh, et cetera, actually do um, show improved uh, survival outcomes for uh, multiple myeloma over conventional transplants. Next slide, please. Uh, the future is here, and uh, at our lab, we've also been able to uh, sort of, we, we do a peripheral blood-based uh, MRD assessment. This is uh, using uh, mass spectrometry. And uh, the study uh, in the bottom is uh, one from um, MSKCC, where they've essentially uh, compared bone marrow flow cytometry-based MRDs. They've also compared NGS versus these blood-based uh, moldy turf analysis. And they actually see excellent concordance rates. So if you have to, if, if one is worried about doing repeated MRD assessments by bone marrow, very soon you will have blood-based MRD assessments, which are extremely cost-effective and which can be used in the clinic uh, everywhere. Next slide, please. I think I'm done. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, I'll now request Dr. Deepan to please give his uh, rebuttal. Uh, so please request you to please keep your uh, rebuttal brief. Over to you, sir. So basically on OS and multiple myeloma. So this uh, topic, the end part was actually clinical practice. So that is what... Uh, that is the thing that I want to talk about here because we are in India and in India there are not much of clinical trials that you can go into and uh, post that is relapsed and uh, if if you compare the western literature we always speak about the western literature and the data is always from there and when we look at that they the all those patients who are in the trial actually go into another trial and then another trial and then another trial and then that is why the OS does not show us much of a difference between the two. But if you compare that in our country, which is a place where most people do not, meaning they do not survive up to the first three lines of therapy also, meaning the third line of therapy. Most, most people do not survive that till that time. So in our country, if you're going to extrapolate that data here, unless and until there are a number of clinical trials, I think we can't look into OS right now. We can look on in, into PFS or uh, MRD status as a surrogate marker. Next, um, this is a good thing about mass spectrometry, which is uh, uh, which was spoken of in the recent, uh, I think, IMW Congress or uh, by uh, Saji and uh, Saji sir, and it was a cost-effective way of assessing MRD status right now. And maybe that can be a surrogate for so something else. Um, uh, cost Obviously, cost-wise, the newer era or new agents in the market are actually too costly. Even and if you compare the cost of 
those new agents with the transplant, I think transplant is much cheaper rather than those new agents. Uh, thank you so over to ma'am for her comments. So I'm in complete agreement with you. There's no real disagreement. But the fact is there are some patients with a standard risk and, and maybe an ISS-1 who achieve an MRD negative and who could actually forego the transplant. They don't need to take the transplant right away. I agree this discussion is not as relevant in India because after pomalidomide, we really, even carfilzomib is not uh, very easy to administer uh, given the cost. And these new agents are going to take forever to uh, make it to the country. Uh, but uh, but if I had to make a case for not giving transplant, not transplanting a patient uh, with multiple myeloma, there is excellent data to show that patients with standard risk who achieved an MRD negative status can uh, avoid the transplant completely without a reduction in uh, uh, the survival outcomes, PFS or OS. Uh, thank you, ma'am. I now invite Dr. Kishore. Kumar, uh, hemato oncologist and BMT physician from Chennai, to please give the expert comments. Over to you, sir. Uh, thanks, organizers. I think you're running short of time and uh, two well-read academicians. I've got nothing much to say. <laughs> and it's very tricky. Kripa sir has really made this debate thing because you have to really read a lot about uh, something which is against our practice also, which Madam has very clearly done and she has made the disclaimer too. And Deepan, uh, good. And one thing about the cost, Deepan, yes, we are in Tamil Nadu. We are quite privileged that Government may not give us carpal zumi, but it does uh, support transplant. That is one thing, yes, which again, kind of as a real world practice, makes us think of consolidating it earlier. But uh, Hemansar is also here. I know that the CML story, the moment we say we don't want to do a transplant in a hemato-oncology, that's the actual success of uh, what is it. For example, in 19, before 1999, it was all transplants in CML. Now, hardly out of our 473 transplants, we have done three transplants for CML. So that's the... I think that's for the way we are going through, but maybe the Moscow happening in 2030, I'll be very confidently able to say that I can get away with transplants in myeloma. But for the time being, uh, one thing is we really talked about PFS. I will look at it the other way. Uh, giving a very short induction, doing a transplant, three months, getting the patient off therapy just on oral maintenance means a lot to these younger people who are actively working. They are kind of back into the society. And one more thing is, for example, four years, five years back, we never had even generic carpal zoomib or pomodomid or water. So if I had a patient with a good PFS, he can, if I can push him on a deeper response for three, four years, India is one country that uh, two to three years down the line, once FDA gets its approval, most of these drugs are uh, kind of affordable and cheaper. That in the ultimatum in the long run may make, make a big difference to the overall survival also. So to get that thing happening, I think transplant per se, practically most of us will accept that an upfront transplant who is relatively kind of eligible uh, physically uh, does make a sense in our setting, at least talking about transplant. At the end of the day, the patient is going to say no to it, nothing wrong in it. But with the newer things happening over the last decade, I mean, things just coming up, even uh, Redis is working on a, a CAR T cell in myeloma, I suppose that's will be happening in another three to four years. So the newer and newer things coming up, it is better we try to have a very deeper response with the minimal available drugs. So that way transplant does work as a very conventional chemotherapy. It's about using melphalan or not. I think using melphalan will give us an advantage of three to four years, buy us some time so that we may expose our patients to more newer drugs, ultimately maybe increasing the overall survival. So thank you for the excellent talks on both of us. A lot of things to actually learn through and uh, even make our, what to say, uh, generate the Indian data. That's what is missing. So I think we have to work on it, I suppose. And in India, we got data for both. 70-80% not doing a transplant and 20-30% to 30 going in for a transplant. So thank you, organizers. Over to uh, Parikh. Thank you so much, sir. I now invite our chairperson, Dr. Raku K, senior hematologist from Coimbatore, to please introduce our moderator and panelists. Uh, Raghu, sir, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Yes, sir. Thank you. This is a, a fantastic topic for a, a panel discussion. TFR in chronic myeloidopenia, why, what, when, and how. We have Dr. Hemant Malhotra from Jaipur, who is a well-known hematologist, the moderate discussion. And uh, over to you, sir, Hemant. And we have a, a, an excellent panel here. Dr. Ashish Joshi from Dr. Oncology of Mumbai, Dr. Saju from Madurai, Dr. Satya Srinivas from Bhutto, Sashi Ranjani from Chennai, Dr. Kripa Shankar, uh, Pambito, Kiran Kumar from Tirupati, Amarnath Padishetri from Gewara, and Dr. Piggy Jaitanran from Chennai. That's a, that's a good panel. Over to, you, over to the moderator of Emmett. 
Thank you, Honorable Chairperson. Am I audible and visible? Yes, sir. You're audible and visible, sir. My screen is also visible? Yes, sir. Your screen is visible. Wonderful. So in the next 20, 25 minutes, we'll see uh, like what is the status? What do our experts, uh, CML experts, medical oncologists and hematologists uh, think about treatment-free remission, particularly with aspects to the Indian perspective? We'll talk a little bit about why, what, when, and how. <clears throat> My most sincere thanks to the patrons of this seventh uh, MOSCON, Dr. Parik, Dr. Sahu, Dr. <clears throat> Nipanjan, and the chairpersons and the program directors. Uh, in addition to uh, these panelists, which you see, a nice mix of medical oncologists and hematologists, we have Dr. Shashi, who's a pediatric hematologist. <clears throat> Dr. Jayachandran and Dr. Krupa Shankar have also very kindly agreed to be on the panel, so we'll direct some questions to them also. So my first question is to Dr. Ashish. Dr. Ashish, when you have a newly diagnosed patient of CMLCP, what is your primary goal of treatment? Yeah. Uh, I don't want a long answer. I want a crisp 30-second yeah. answer, please. So primary goal would be, sir, uh, to prevent them from going to AP and DP. So that is the primary goal. Secondary goal would be hmm. uh, if uh, it maintain, uh, if the parameters fulfill, then either it's a TFR or OS. Excellent. And Dr. Saju, what would be your primary goal? I have listed out five over here. Uh, earlier and deepest molecular response because this leads to better PFS. We have data on that, possibly better OS, no or least progression to AP and blast crisis, as Dr. Ashish has just said. Uh, we want zero development of mutations. Uh, we want to maintain quality of life and we want an operational cure of the patient. Uh, we may be able to stop the TKI and we want the patient to still be in remission. So in, out of this five, what do you think are the important goals for you? Dr. Saju. Yes, sir. Uh, I would say uh, all the points uh, matter here, but uh, if the patient is very young or uh, a senior patient, then the operational cure would be my primary goal. Uh, but uh, practically all of these factors come into consideration when uh, thinking about the uh, goals Correct. And Dr. Shashi, uh, Dr. Satya, uh, would you, you know, kind of, if I ask you unfair question, but if I ask you to pick up one out of these five, uh, Dr. Satya, what would you pick up? Sir, I will pick up two, sir. The four, first priority is prevention them for growing for the accelerated or blast phase. Excellent. So I think uh, most of our panel would agree that all these five are desirable goals for the newly diagnosed patient. And uh, may I, you know, kind of uh, go down the age bar and talk about pediatric CMLs and ask Dr. Shashi. Dr. Shashi, out of these five, if you have, a, say, a 12-year-old child with CMLCP, what would be your goal? So my uh, goal would be definitely to prevent a progression to um, AP or BP. But then... Um, um, also very important, extremely important would be to maintain the quality of life because these are young children who have a long way to go. Um, so if we could uh, somehow take them off medications, it would mean a lot to them in terms of quality of life and the economic cost. But um, yeah, so these would be my two pick. Absolutely. I think it's an extremely important consideration. If you have a patient of 60 years old, which is the you know, usual age at diagnosis of CML in the West, that patient has another 15 years of life. So you will expose the patient uh, considering that the patient is not a candidate for TFR or considering that you don't believe in TFR, will be exposed to the TKI for 15 years as compared to a child who is 15 years of age and who has another 50 years to live. God only knows what kind of toxicity the TKI will produce uh, in 50 years of exposure. So it becomes extremely different and, you know, important to look at our pediatric patients with CML in a different light. So if we were to carry on, my next question, and let me direct this to Dr. Kiran Kumar. Uh, why do you think TFR should be one of the goals uh, in the selected patient uh, at diagnosis who has CML-CP? Dr. Krishan? Yes, sir. Good afternoon, sir. 
Sir, uh, TFR is one of the important goals for uh, patients like young females who are going to get married and going to become pregnant. We want the disease to be under control before we can uh, they become pregnant. And also, some of the patients might not tolerate the TKS. They have their toxicities. And uh, for them to uh, carry on those toxicities for the lifelong, uh, it will be a problem. So I want them to be off treatment as soon as possible to maintain the quality of life. Dr. Amarnath, would you agree? Like, uh, uh, why do you think uh, we should think of TFR in all newly diagnosed patients? I agree with uh, with the sir. Uh, it is like almost to prevent the side effects and to maintain good quality of life and to prevent the progression of the disease. Excellent. So you know, uh, you know, there is no clean tyrosine kinase inhibitors. And this is the kinogram of just one of the drugs, Desetinib, which we use very frequently. And this is here is the AVL inhibition. In addition to what we desire, the AVL inhibition, the drug inhibits so many other tyrosine kinases also. And you know, uh, once this happens, then there is potential for long-term toxicity. There is impact on quality of life. Of course, when the patient is on TKI, we would not like to permit pregnancies. <clears throat> there is a lifetime cost of the TKI. Even if we have generics, it still costs a significant amount of uh, monthly money and it indents the patient's uh, budget. And first and foremost, uh, and most importantly, that there is now some science telling us that TFR may be possible. So this is what we want to do. We want to inhibit the BCR able, and this is the on-target effect. But unfortunately, it hardly ever happens. And there are lots of off-target effects, like inhibition of the SARC kinase, the CK, the PDGFR, the ABL. And this leads to the toxicities which we see. And, and you are quite aware of the toxicities of the various TKIs. It's been estimated that about one third of the patients have moderate to severe side effects. And uh, <clears throat> you know, new and new side effects are being reported uh, like pleural effusion and pulmonary hypertension with diabetes, increasing incidence of vascular events with uh, uh, nilotinib, and accelerated decline in GFR with our, so to say, uh, very safe imatinib. And, you know, none of the TKIs are, are recommended either in pregnancy or in lactation. So the science for TFR is there, but we do need to bear in mind that if you use imatinib first line, that they are only going to be about 15 to 20%, means one in five patients who will achieve an operational cure, uh, meaning you will achieve a, you know, successful TFR. If you use the second generation TKI as first line, this increases to 20 to 25%, so one out of four patients. So that still means that the very large majority of the patients at diagnosis have to be counseled that they will have to take the medicine for life. And we have to you know, continue to monitor the toxicity of the medicine very, very carefully and ameliorate the toxicity of the medicine as far as possible. And all of you are aware that this was the first study by the French group, uh, Francis Zéol Mehon, uh, and uh, they did prove that in very carefully selected patients, uh, four out of 10 patients can achieve a deep molecular response or a complete molecular response as it was known at that time, uh, which is sustained. And we now have data that it can be sustained uh, in about 40% of patients for up to five years. Since this first French study, there's been a whole bunch of other studies with first generation TKI from Australia, from Korea, from Japan, and also some data from uh, second generation TKIs, and it's now like a, the TFR is like a cottage industry now. So now my next question to our senior uh, panelist, Dr. Jai Chandran, is Dr. Jai, do you practice TFR in your clinic or do you still consider it as a research tool? I still, in the sense, uh, for very reasons of pregnancy and uh, other toxicity, I practice TFR in hospital. And uh, uh, about 25, 30 odd patients, I have practiced TFR. I've uh, been treating about 1,500 patients in ASA and CMR and Institute. Uh, very few patients only we routinely practice TFR unless they require uh, reasons for it. 
otherwise i still consider it as a search tool only uh, there are a lot more improvisations to be done we all know that over all these studies we don't know who are the patients who are going to do good uh, be, uh, not more scoring systems coming up for the huge group and also assessment of the innate immunity like t-rex and myelite derived mononuclear cells and uh, the nk cells and they are making some scoring system to know who exactly would relapse after a stop now how they, uh, there are a lot of other trials which have been coming into picture using interferons uh, their bioglitazone uh, and the other lanthanide to immunomodulate and how better we can make this 40% so higher percentage so i still your, your experience and your inputs are extremely valuable Uh, there are very few, very few experts in the world who can say that they have more than a thousand patients of CML on follow up. Thank you very much, Dr. Jai Chandran. Dr. Kripa Shankar, again, uh, uh, like you have a vast experience, been practicing for a long time. Do you practice TFR in your clinic? Do you talk about TFR when you have a newly diagnosed patient, or you consider it a research tool? No, I, I would definitely look at offering it as an option. I would definitely discuss the pros and cons. and throw give them the options of getting into a tfr as well so definitely do that before starting anybody on treatment i think it really does matter because we you know the success rates especially if you start off with the second generation tki i mean like you you're more prone to have early and a deep molecular response as well so you have a very good chance of around a 40 to 50% chance of maintaining the tfr as well so why deny them that option i would definitely look at offering them as that as an option sir. so excellent so like since this first publication from adelaide by tim hughes and david ross in 2016 in which they had mentioned that it is it might be time to think of moving tfr into the mainstream of clinical practice uh, and you know they had very eloquently laid down these uh, green signals and yellow signals and red signals which are you know still very very relevant and i think they are very relevant to treating cmls and thinking of tfr in our country and in other uh, resource limited countries and then since then you have esmo guidelines for tfr and you have nccm guidelines for tfr and you have the latest eln of guidelines for tfr also so it has moved into the mainstream but again uh, it has to be remembered by all of us and it has to be remembered by particularly physicians who are dabbing into treatment of chronic myeloid leukemia that your that your very next patient which you see tomorrow monday morning should not be offered tfr you have to fulfill some very extracting criteria before you can think of tfr so now my question again let me start with dr ashish again Uh, do you feel that uh, uh, the tfr criteria should be different in our country and in other low middle income countries as compared to the recommendations which we get from the west dr ashish yes, yes sir so i think it's it's always good uh, to you know uh, modify the criteria depending on the demographics and the population that we treat um and having said so um, currently as we speak uh, the tfr is only for imatinib dasatinib nilotinib so we really do not have the data is emerging but we really really do not have a lot of data uh, for a second generation tk apart from these uh, of a couple of them which i have mentioned before so yes one we need uh, definitely a data number two with indian patients compliance can be a considerable issue so especially uh, if you see the criteria as once we discontinue then we need to have an access to pml uh, uh, bcr abl rq pcr by is to be done every monthly and the report should be coming within two weeks so uh, for some of our patients who see our clinic this might not be possible so we really need to customize this criteria for our patient need and i do practice tfr in my clinical practice but then it is for a select group of patients only excellent dr ashish you brought out some very very good points i'd like to ask the same question to our you know uh, a senior most panelist if i may say so dr jay chandran do you feel that we should uh, just follow the criterias laid down by our western counterparts or should we have different uh, uh, stim criterias for the indian patients dr jay chandran i completely second the opinion of dr ashish uh, we should have our own criteria in the sense we can't complete and blindly follow the western criteria uh, so we need to and uh, based on that we also have to set guide 
set guidelines for considering such a thing. So I said uh, the accessibility to uh, proper BCR, ABL, the distance to the lab. And again, if you have a uh, patient who has been getting treated in a second tier city and is coming to the lab, and the transport RNA quality, which I had been alluding to the previous uh, study, again, a lot of things are kept, should be kept in mind uh, before offering a TFR. And we should have our own guidelines. Uh, a lot of patients are on still on GPAP scheme, and uh, a lot of patients are really uh, uh, available for stop. But really, are we ready for stop? Uh, I am say they are not even able to get the yearly BCR able testing done. So how could I really make them do a monthly or six weekly once? I do really practice six weekly once testing, and uh, in my clinical practice. But uh, in the initial six months. But uh, it's very tough for them to get a one testing per year and how uh, it would be possible for getting them tested is the point. Only availability and accessibility should be ensured before uh, the starting practicing the TFR and routine. And there must be a standard set guidelines for all over India, maybe under the leadership of yours, probably there must be a proper set guidelines for every other practicing physician. Thank you very much, Dr. Jay, Jay, uh, Jay Chandran. I think very valid points you've raised. And in addition to the <clears throat> logistic issues and the economic issues, like some of us practicing in India and other lower middle income countries feel, you know, in the chronic phase, uh, the patient in the high income countries is diagnosed very early in the chronic phase, while in our country, the patient is diagnosed much later, even though he or she is still in the chronic phase. But at this particular time, the disease burden is also significantly higher and the patient has also accumulated several, you know, uh, genetic mutations and our responses uh, across the board, hematological responses, cytogenetic responses, molecular responses are less and delayed. So we, you know, need uh, uh, possibly a very careful concentration of thinking of TFR in our patients. And, and I think all of you are aware of this, half to two thirds of our patients are in advanced stage majority of our patients are out of pocket payments. So we have lower rates of uh, hematological, cytogenetic and molecular responses. I think this is just because we have more advanced disease at presentation, probably not a biological difference, but I have put a question mark over there. And then issues with molecular monitoring uh, because of economic reasons and because of you know availability of standard testing. And then second generation TKI is, uh, you know, a little bit of question mark for a majority of our patients. This has changed with the availability of uh, the generic second generation TKI. I'm very thankful to our pharma industry for that. A third generation TKI is fourth generation TKI is not available to us. And transplant is an option for a very, very tiny minority of our patients. And you can see like uh, this was a nice, uh, 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 report uh, in the Times of India, about two thirds of our patients still have uh, out of pocket expense uh, as compared to only 10% uh, in the United States. And this does change the dynamics of whatever decision making you do. A couple of uh, inputs from our pediatric uh, hematology uh, colleague. Now, Dr. Shashi, can you very quickly tell us which are the TKIs which are approved for children? Uh, their doses, and are you aware of any pediatric uh, stop TKI data? Dr. Shashi. Yeah, so um, the approved TKIs for CML are uh, in pediatrics are the first and second generations, but we're still, uh, we still prescribe imatinib unless uh, there is uh, uh, intolerance where we have to change to the satinib. Um, but most of our experience is still with imatinib. Um, we started a dose of 340 to 360 mg per meter square, that's uh, the dose. Uh, but with the satinib, it's more uh, um, uh, weight-based, so it can go on any, anywhere between 40 to um, 100 mg. And uh, nilotinib, a very limited experience in the pediatric age group, but the recommended dose is um, 230 mg per meter square. It's much more difficult to administer nilotinib because it's got a, a interaction with food. It's twice a day dosing, and it has to be given before or after food. And um, coming to data on pediatric stop TKI, um, very few studies have been done. And even the uh, uh, children enrolled in these studies, the numbers have been very few. So we do have a couple of studies um, 
uh, uh, there have been the French study, and then there's a stop imatinib in pediatrics, the stop imapet study, which came out, I think, in 2019. Then we have a Japanese study, and then more recently, the International uh, Registry of Childhood CML. They also have come out with a paper. But if you see, all of them have, I mean, the uh, number of children enrolled are around 14 to 20. So it's all, it's all a very small uh, uh, study. Um, in the uh, uh, stop IMAPET study, uh, I think they had a, 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 the response date as an after stopping TKI. Uh, the response date was only 30 percent. And uh, but in the Japanese study and in the more recent uh, international registry, we've seen um, uh, uh, reports almost similar to that of adults as in 50, uh, almost 50 percent of children have been able to go off TKI. Uh, but we do not have a definite criteria of, uh, you know, whom to include in the study or whom to advise. Um, so we are still waiting for uh, uh, what what data we have now is almost what is derived from the adult data. Thank so you, Dr. Shashi. I think that was, you know, very well put. And I think that is a very big research opportunity in our, st our, our country. Uh, like we've had a uh, hundred plus pediatric patient publication from Dr. Banavali's group at TMH and very recently another hundred plus uh, pediatric CML patient publication from Dr. Samir, uh, Samir uh, at All India Institute in Delhi. So I think that's a, that's a, important a, a small uh, point to make, sir, Dr. Jayachandran. Yes. yes, Dr. Jayachandran. <laughs> so most of the children who have been diagnosed uh, as a child uh, have been included when they become adults. So the stop TK study did not uh, really uh, say the num whether they were diagnosed as a child or not. So a lot of patients who have been diagnosed as children when they become adults are included in stop TK study. I don't think so. There's a different strategy for stop TK in children, sir. Actually, uh, there is no recommendation world over as of just now for pediatric CML and stop TKI in children. And I know it's very, very important. So I think we'll move on. We don't have too much time. My next question is to Dr. Saju. Dr. Saju, uh, in your personal opinion, what would be your criteria for stopping treatment if you were to devise Indian criteria? Uh, would you feel that uh, patients of high SOCAL risk should be excluded or can be can they be included in uh, Indian CML stop TKI studies? Dr. Saju. In the Indian scenario, I believe a high SOCAL group should be awarded when trying to stop, uh, stop TKI. Uh, but otherwise, uh, in patients with uh, a low SOCAL score, uh, probably uh, patients who have at least received the uh, imaginative for five years should be considered and they should have uh, MR4 or MR4.5 for uh, minimum two to three years. Uh, if they are on second generation, then uh, probably two years uh, MR4 or MR4.5 should be enough. Thank you. Dr. Satya, uh, can you come to this point? Like in your opinion, uh, we're talking about uh, TFR in India. Uh, for the patient who is on imatinib, what should be the presumed dura minimum duration of imatinib before you should think of TFR, two years, three years, five years, or more than five years? Dr. Satya. Sorry. Five years, sir. Excellent. I think most of us believe that it should be, I personally believe that it should be more than five years, and I'll come to that in a minute. Now, the next question is to Dr. Uh, Kiran. Dr. Kiran, uh, what do you think, again, in our country, uh, should be the duration uh, of second generation TKI is when used up front, two years, three years, more than three years. I think more than three years, sir. Again, I think uh, that is absolutely correct. I agree with you. So I would tend to agree with you. You know, people might differ with that. But in our country, we have to, you know, be more conservative because our patients are, uh, they have higher volume of disease. So now my question is to Dr. Uh, uh, Amarnath. Uh, Dr. Amarnath, uh, Let's come to deep molecular response. Uh, uh, would you want, what would be the duration of deep molecular response optimally in your opinion? Uh, two years, three years, or more than three years? Yeah, more than three years may be a good option, sir. Again, okay, excellent. I think each one of you is erring on the side of caution, uh, being a little extra conservative. Uh, and, you know, these are the various studies and the various uh, uh, depth and duration of molecular response which have been used. Uh, is, it, it varies, uh, you know, across the board uh, with the same, about the same chances of success. 
uh, and this was the largest uh, stop imatinib study, the Euroski study, 400 plus patients. And they did find that one of the most important predictors of MMR status was a treatment duration of more than 5.8 years. Uh, the success for the TFR was two thirds in patients who were in major molecular response for more than for approximately six years versus only 42% for patients who were less than six years. So I do tend to agree with my panelists that we should err on the side of caution, we should be more conservative. And uh, can uh, let me ask this to Dr. Krupa Shankar. Dr. Krupa Shankar, what would be your molecular relapse trigger for retreatment? You have put a patient on TFR. Uh, when would you restart the TKI? I think if you look at all these top strategies and all the trials as well, they have looked at loss of MMR as a trigger for starting on <clears throat> retreatment. I wouldn't necessarily restart them just because they've lost MR 4.5 or MR 4. I would wait until they lose MMR and then restart them if at all I'm going on to the stop strategies. Excellent. I think other than the STIM study, which was the first French study in which, you know, they had to be very careful because it was the, you know, the first study, uh, all the other studies have used uh, loss of MMR uh, as the restart trigger. And you know, this is the difference here. Uh, if, you, you, if you use a very low, uh, you know, restart trigger, say for example, a loss of CMR or loss of deep molecular response, then only 40% success you're likely to achieve. Uh, but if you use loss of MMR as your restart trigger, then almost two thirds of your patients can be expected to have a successful TFR. So uh, Naik, let me ask now, uh, let me start with Dr. Ashish again. Dr. Ashish, if you are engaging on TFR, then how frequently uh, should the patient be monitored with good quality RT-PCR for the BCR-able gene? Dr. Ashish. Yeah. So typically, sir, if you go by the guidelines and the recommendation, uh, the follow-up is uh, is on a monthly uh, for initial uh, initial one to two years, uh, and then maybe you could reduce the follow-up. Uh, but in my clinical practice, I think six to eight weeks is what I typically follow because monthly come sometimes can be very very challenging. But yes, I think uh, presence of M MMR would be a trigger uh, for restarting the treatment because that means a lot of disease burden actually has come in. And we need to start the treatment. Yes. Agreed. So I think all of us are aware of uh, these recommended guidelines that for the first six months, uh, I have about 30 odd patients uh, who uh, are in the process of uh, stopping the TKI. And at least for the first six months, uh, I make sure that they get the BCR able testing every four weeks. In fact, I write down six dates for them at one four weeks intervals and I give them that uh, that document and my secretary calls them if they don't come back with the report and after six months uh, the monitoring can be made every two to three months i think uh, uh, for for us in india this is the first condition first criteria which we have to ensure uh, tki withdrawal syndromes uh, happen in about 20 to 25 percent of patients uh, I have, I have seen it only in only one or two patients. But one interesting thing I may like to point out to you, one uh, you know, very fine young lady who I attempted TFR on, she calls me after uh, uh, 10 months, uh, Doc, I want to start the tablet again. I go, what happened? Have you lost your molecular response? She said, no, I'm still uh, undetectable BCR able, but I've started to become darker now, so I want to start the TKI again. <laughs> So we have, you know, strange things happening in our country. Yes. I think this is again very important. And let me ask Dr. Jayachandran this. Uh, uh, Dr. Jayachandran, how do you offer or do you not offer uh, a STEM to a patient on GPAP? Uh, apologies, sir. Can I also request you to conclude after this? Yeah, We're running so short I'll time. go to the conclusion right after this. Dr. Jayachandran, yes, this is an important I, question. I think we should have... a second answer. I, sh I think we should again approach... Uh, the Max Foundation for supporting them so that they can cut down about 40% of the uh, revenue generated. That's the only way about I would think about as a whole. We should represent the Max Foundation and say that they should 
for the BCI bell testing for these patients where about 40 to 50 percent of the patients uh, cut off, they can be cut down from the GPAP scheme. That's the only way I see. Thank you. So are you you will be happy to know, Dr. Jayatranjan, that Max Foundation has started a pilot project uh, in which a few selected centers have been asked to choose four patients uh, in which they will support the BCR able testing every monthly for the initial six months. And in case the patient has a molecular response, uh, they would uh, restart that patient on uh, GLUAC because that is also an important consideration. So that, you know, your wish is being fulfilled. And once you have results of this pilot data, then maybe it will be applicable for, you know, wider usage. So there's one more strategy which you could think of, which I am quite, I quite like, uh, halving the dose of TAKI, and this is yes. the destiny study uh, in which uh, it did show that uh, if the patient is stable after 12 months, then that patient could be their possible ideal patient for TFR. Uh, so this is what my suggestions are, and I think this is important, so I'll very quickly go through this before I conclude. My feeling is that if you're using imatinib, the minimum duration should be eight years. If you're using a second generation TKI, five years, uh, deep molecular response, three years, restart trigger is fine, loss of MMR, and patients who have high SOCAL risk could be candidates for the half TKI, the destiny model, and then go, go on to the stop TKI. And the monitoring frequency, I don't think we should compromise on that. At least for the six, first six months, it should be uh, monthly. So if I were to conclude now, there are several unanswered questions which all of us are aware, but the concept is there, the, the science is there. It is not applicable to all the patients. It's applicable to a very select group of patients. And it, is, uh, it depends on us uh, to refine this science and make it applicable to patients in our country. We have a massive number of patients uh, coming in we have a huge prevalence of patients of CML, which is going to increase exponentially in the next five, 10 years. So I think it is in the interest of our country and our healthcare system to have a, have a Indian specific guidelines so that we can safeguard the interests of our patients. We are in the process of setting up a task force and I will contact each one of you once we have moved along those lines. And, you know, with that, I'd like to thank uh, each one of my panel for their wonderful inputs. Uh, I've learned quite a lot from all of you, and I'm sure the audience have also learned. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, sir. Thank you to all the panelists. Mm -hmm. We'll move on to the next debate. I request uh, Dr. Raghu to please introduce our two debaters, and then we'll move on to the expert comments. It's about first line to CLL. We have Dr. Vivek Agarwala, talking about the based regimen and Dr. Ram Abhinav uh, talking about Ekalab and a place strategy. Over to you, Dr. Vivek Agarwala to start. Uh, Vivek sir and Ram sir, we request you to please stick to the time uh, because our yeah. expert has uh, other commitments yeah. as well. Thank you so much, sir. So I think the screen is uh, well uh, visible. Yes, sir, it's visible. And I sir. thank the uh, organizers for giving me this opportunity. So. Yeah. So first line treatment in CLL in the current era, we have targeted therapy with BCL2 inhibitors or Bruton tyrosine kinase inhibitors, <laughs> which is the preferred strategy in all patients, more so in the poor risk patients with 17P deletion or IGBH unmutated or in the unfit patients. And even combination of BTK inhibitors and anti-CD20 monoclonal antibodies is an option. There is no major benefit except we have deeper responses in younger and fit patients. Now, among the Bruton tyrosine kinase inhibitors, we have the, uh, the recently approved acalabrutinib and we have the ibrutinib and that is what we are debating and I am speaking for ibrutinib. So if you look at the NCCN guidelines, uh, ibrutinib is now the preferred uh, strategy for every CLL patient in the first line. And if you look at these latest guidelines, we see whether the patients are more than 65 or less than 65 with comorbidities or without comorbidities and whether with or without uh, uh, high risk factors. The preferred regimen is acalabrutinib 
plus or minus obinutuzumab category 1 or ibrutinib category 1. So, uh, my dear friend Rab Amidav should note that there is no preferred strategy being given over a calibrutinib as compared to ibrutinib. When you look at the guidelines in uh, EGFR positive lung cancer, you have a preferred uh, you know, strategy over osimertinib. But here, you see there is no preference given to a calibrutinib over ibrutinib. Both are category 1. Even in the relapsed refractory setting, it is same category 1 for all patients for both a calibrutinib and ibrutinib. Now, we look at the efficacy data. And this is the phase 1B PIC31102 study. And we can see that at 7 year, the OS rate is 84% with first line treatment. And why this data is important? Because it is an 8 year follow up data, the longest follow up data for any BTK inhibitor to date. If you look at the other data, we have the resonate data for treatment NAVE CLL, where, where we have a 5 year follow up data, longest for any BTK inhibitor in phase 3 setting where it was compared with chlorambucil, we have Illuminate, Alliance and ECOG 1912 data. Now, in the uh, in, in the Resonate data, clearly we see a 49% reduction in higher overall survival. And we also have a quality of life data for a brutine where we have seen a clinically meaningful improvement in quality of life, which is higher with a brutine versus chlorambucil. Illuminate data, again, a good four-year follow-up data. Ibrutinib obinutuzumab has a better PFS as compared to chlorambucil obinutuzumab. Alliance data, again, ibrutinib single agent or with rituximab has a better PFS as compared to bendamustine and rituximab. And again, in the ECOG 1912 data, we have compared to FCR, a higher PFS with ibrutinib. So there are, these are the definite advantages, single daily dosing, long-term follow-up data available, reliable and in-hand experience. So a trusted molecule, quality of life data is available. It is cost-effective. We have ibrutinib available now at 9,000 to 10,000 per month only. Whereas there are definite disadvantages of a calibrutinib, twice daily dosing. Long-term follow-up data is not available. We have only elevate study of 224 patients in the first line. The efficacy is equivalent in first line as per the cross trial company. There is no data of superiority, no in hand experience of a, you know, a calibrity, no quality of life data, exorbitant cost 4.5 lakhs per month. So, not a feasible choice for first line universally in a developing country like ours. Now, what about combinations? So, when you combine with ibrutinib, the combination with rituximab, we can there, and combination is still feasible economically. But if you have to combine a calibrutinib with the data is only with obinutuzumab, a still higher costly molecule. So, a more costly molecule without any meaningful improvement in efficacy. You can't use in combination also. Now, let us talk about the potency. So, you can see here ibrutinib how it is much more potent molecule. But yes, it has more off-target effects as compared to a calibrutinib or zanubritinib. So toxicity is the main issue. And this is the toxicity chart. So if you look at this, apart from cardiological toxicities, the, all the toxicities are similar. If you look at hepatic impairment patients, it is clearly written, avoid a calibrutinib in severe impairment. So you can't, but there is good data of using ibrutinib even in patients of mild to moderate hepatic impairment and reduced doses. In patients less than 30 creatinine clearance, again, ibrutinib doesn't have any uh, uh, you know, clear, uh, uh, renal clearance, so we can use ibrutinib in them also. Talking about toxicities, hematological toxicities, both are same. No issues. Slightly higher diarrhea, slightly higher musculoskeletal toxicities, but these are manageable. And we talk about the uh, cardiac effects. So yes, it has a higher hypertension as compared to a calibrutinib. But again, hypertension is manageable and we have to monitor. Incidence of atrial fibrillation, well, 5% as against 3%. So slightly higher, uh, you know, uh, major uh, uh, this. So, and if you look at the long-term data, what is seen is that the most of the grade 3 or more adverse events, they decrease over time and the tolerance is good. So we have a long-term safety analysis and there are no new long-term signals. We have been using this molecule very safely. So what is this new fuss about a calibrutinib? Uh, so sorry, can I request you to conclude, sir? So it is because of this 
elevate rr data and this is not in a first line setting this is in the relapse refractory setting and even in this study a calibrotinib was not found superior it was non inferior and what was there we can see in the, even in this data no difference in the deaths no difference in the serious adverse events or slightly higher discontinuation of ibrutinib if you look at their data higher headache and higher cough in a calibrotinib and the atrial fibrillation all grade was 16% in ibrutinib versus 9.4% but if you look at the grade 3 atrial fibrillation flutter it was not much different 4.9% versus 3.8% so not much different uh, grade 3 adverse events pneumonia 10.5 was so 1 to 2% higher a in in a calibrotinib so these are you know it is balancing and if you look at the atrial fibrillation what we see is that if patients are of higher risk category you have a higher incidence if a patient has a previous history of af you have a higher incidence of af and af is something which is paroxysmal you have to monitor again and again to catch it so it is difficult and that is why some people find it difficult so what is the way forward is actually a careful assessment of our patients optimize the modifiable factors reassess on regular basis educate involve your cardio oncologist to talk about hypertension we can see if you are managing your hypertension well only 5% major adverse cardiac events with ibrutinib and these are long term data which is available and this is a very very new data which says that if your patient is after all ibrutinib intolerant you can then try a calibrutinib 30% of patients will still fail and have again the same grade of toxicity but 70% may not have and this may be a good strategy so what i conclude is that old is gold which is a old old saying ibrutinib is gold for our cll patients pure value but a calibrutinib it is costlier than gold even you have to sell all your gold to procure a calibrutinib ibrutinib is preferable in first line it has a long term efficacy and safety data cost effective manageable toxicity profile only slightly higher cardiotoxicity than acalibrutinib and the way forward is to involve cardio oncologists in your team optimize patients before starting treatment monitor properly manage events to mitigate the toxicity so i can totally understand uh, uh, dr ram abina uh, practices in coimbatore we know how much they have a, a penchant for gold and uh, you know uh, the most of our poor patients for bengal they go to south to take treatment and uh, you know i can understand ram abhinav will give them a calibrutinib and uh, obinutuzumab they will sell all their gold and then they will come back to bengal and we have to manage these patients with uh, ibrutinib if they have their money left so this is what uh, you know uh, age old uh, thing that happens and this is what is there so all uh, you know to ram abhinav let us hear what you have to say Oh. <clears throat> oh my slides are visible i thank the organizers and i thank dr vivek agarwala for nicely propagating ibrutinib on a scientific forum and i also thank dr vivek agarwala and of showcasing how difficult it is to give in detail to give ibrutinib to his patients so uh he is my senior so we'll have to move on as the new age comes so now the fir preferred first line is going to be acalabrutinib so he's already mentioned in detail i'm not going in detail we have shortage of time initially we all practice chemoimmunotherapy but majority have moved to btk inhibitors so there are two issues with btk inhibitors one is we'll have to give it as long as the patient does not progress and second thing is we are usually giving for patients with decreasing fitness so side effects as dr vivek showed the median progression to be survival is around 36 months so you have to manage the side effects for nearly 36 months in a very frail patient who has does not have fitness for chemotherapy so this is already discussed by dr vivek so due to shortage of time moving so what is a real world scenario so out of 100 patients 23 patients are going to discontinue ibrutinib that is one in four patients are going to discontinue ibrutinib only for toxicity and is this only based on retrospective study no even the recently published jan 2022 cll 12 study 
in early stage CLL, the discontinuation rate is around 29%. So nearly one in three are going to discontinue ibrutinib if you start on first line ibrutinib. So that is very high. Discontinuation of around 30% is going to be extremely high. So why is it? It's because of the multiple action of target inhibition. It has atrial fibrillation, bleeding, infection, arthralgia, there's rash, cardiac toxicities, platelet thrombocytopenia. I have, Dr. Vivek has actually helped me in describing how difficult it is to give ibrutinib and how he involves so many physicians, so many cardiologists, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, uh, to manage ibrutinib. So basically, ecolabrutinib is a second generation ibrutinib. It is a much better ibrutinib because the off-target inhibition is very low. So it does not depend upon the potency. You can actually give as much as drug if you want. The drug does not have side effects. The drug does not have any off-target activity. You can give as much drug as you want. So there's no shortage of first-line study. We have ekilobritinib with obinutizumab versus obinutizumab with chemotherapy-based in first-line CLL. Not going into the detail. So it is ecolabrutinib with obinutizumab compared with ecolabrutinib versus obinutizumab plus chlorambicil in all sets of patients, whether it is poor risk or good risk, uh, less fit patient, more fit patients. And even with zinc agent ecolabrutinib, we have uh, four year progression free survival rates of around 78%. And even without addition of obinutizumab, and with addition of obinutizumab, it is going to be as high as 87%. And is it going to be different across risk groups? Unmutated IGHP, DEL 17P, TP53 mutated all have excellent prognosis with ecolabrutinib. So, coming to the side effects, as I said earlier, it is ibrutinib is a thing of the past, and ecolabrutinib is a better ibrutinib. It's a second generation ibrutinib. And if it is feasible, definitely. Ecolabritinib should be the treatment of choice because the atrial fibrillation rates is as three, yeah, grade three is as low as one person, and overall side effect rates are as low as less than five percent. And if you look at the uh, TN elevate TN study, the discontinuation rate is nine percent. It's actually less than ten percent, and the dose reductions are required in only three percent of the patients, as opposed to ibrutinib. One in three patients are going to stop the drug due to side effects. So we are not going to do a clinical trial. We know our patients are poor, as Dr. Vivek Agrawala told, uh, in doing repeated ECGs, he calls multiple cardiac functions. He, he's actually going to, he or she is actually going to sell a follow gold in non-medicine <laughs> investigations. And coming, we have already seen as a direct comparison of ibrutinib and ecolabrinib in relapsed CLL, the PFS rates are going to be the same but the cardiac events, etc., are going to be very high in ibrutinib. With that, I'll conclude saying that ecolabrutinib is nothing but a better version, more refined version of ibrutinib, which is going to have less side effects. The effects are going to be the same and which requires less intensive monitoring. And if ecolabrutinib is feasible, that should be the treatment of Joyce and ibrutinib should not be considered. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Over to Vivek, sir, for his rebuttal. Yeah, I think, uh, uh, Ram, uh, you know, the last comment that you made is really funny, where you are saying that a uh, patient will lose all the gold uh, while doing multiple ECGs and ECOs, which is going to cost some, you know, 2,000 rupees per month uh, as against four and a half lakh rupees of uh, cost of a calibrutinib. So if the patient uh, has a cardiac failure yeah. and he switch him to ICU, and the patient is in ICU for well, so. well, well, those are you know manageable things that <laughs> no, that's not manage manageable. <laughs> Metallurgical malignancies, you have to manage complications. But one thing I, you know, you you must remember. Number one, you quoted the CLL twelve data where there is twenty nine percent you know discontinuation. But do remember the it was used in a early non symptomatic CLL where even placebo or observation is an option. So obviously. The, the investigator is going to discontinue more drug as compared to other setting. And you can see that in a symptomatic CLL where treatment is required, you are having 10% discontinuation with a calibrutinib itself. So, you know, 
20 percent, uh, 10 percent in in uh, see symptomatic CLL, you are discontinuing a 30 percent in asymptomatic. You can't compare. Yeah, unfortunately, two, CLL. Are you telling that uh, a calibrutinib doesn't require any cardiac monitoring? Doesn't require any uh, you know uh, uh, doesn't have any cardiac toxicities? Well, no. They have, uh, you know, the data is still there. It is is nine percent all grade versus sixteen percent uh, all grade. So there is a seven percent higher all grade atrial fibrillation. Uh, that is as simple as that. So you know, it, uh, and and you have to understand, people have uh, seen a uh, uh, ibrutinib and managed ibrutinib. So obviously they are more confident and more selective when when taking their patients in clinical trials for a calibrutinib. So obviously, a calabrutinib is going to show lesser cardiotoxicity as compared to ibrutinib because it is a newer molecule and we have learned how to manage it better as compared to ibrutinib. So with this, I, I rest the case and, uh, uh, you know, if you have any more comments, otherwise, let yeah. us listen. Thank to you. Thank episode. you for concluding that a calabrutinib is very safe compared to ibrutinib. For the first point, uh, I'll have to say that CLL-12 trial is a clinical trial. That's not some clinical practice. So they have specific guidelines of when to stop the drug and when to resume the drug, when to completely discontinue the drug. So that's not based on their uh, thought process. So patients discontinued drug because they met the stopping endpoints. So they had toxicities, 30% have toxicities, which actually met the stopping criteria. That is huge. And second point is, as you have already... Well, the stopping criteria no, no, is more This is my time. This is my time. This is my time. This is my time. And second point is, obviously, every drug requires monitoring. The chances of having any side effects are going to be very less. Discontinuation is less than 5%. So it is safe. It is efficacious. It might be expensive, but scientific forum, we are not talking about expenses. It is only for patients who are fit for it. Uh, thank you so much, sir. Thank you to both the debaters. I now request our expert, Dr. Tapan Saikia, Senior Medical Oncologist and Hematologist from Mumbai, to please give his expert comments. Over to you, sir. Thank you, organizers, and thank you, Chair. <laughs> both debaters have spoken very well. <laughs> I enjoyed you, know, you coming in debating like in the parliament. Uh, my comments, number one, we all are happy to note rapid development and approval of targeted drugs for CLL. Number two, more such molecules will be developed as is happening in the cases of CML and each molecule will find its own niche based on the host factors, disease factors and the drugs. Number three, as a first line therapy, both patients and physicians would like a single molecule as opposed to combinations. Combination protocols through clinical trials should be developed for high risk and the relapse disease. Number four, we'll kind of keenly wait for molecules and the clinical trials that will make all CLL patients, as we are not treating each and every one, and newly diagnosed CLL cases uh, eligible for treatment and for a finite period of time and achieve an operational cure. And the final point is the cost matters anywhere in the world, and that will remain a key factor, what we choose, when we choose. For the present, in our real world practice, we continue to explain to patients and families these complex issues in a very simple words, as much as you can, and try to get their trust for receiving treatment for a long period of time. That itself is a challenge. Thank you, both the debaters. You did well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you to both the debaters and our expert. Uh, I now request our chairperson, Dr. Raghu, to introduce our last speaker for the day and for the conference. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Now, this uh, talk is about ideal serious prophylaxis for high rate, high grade B NHL, uh, IT versus HD, which is the state. Uh, Dr. Prashant Nathan from uh, my part of check. Hello, everyone. Greetings from Jukmer to all the attendees of uh, MOSCON 2022. I'm going to talk about CNS prophylaxis in high-grade lymphomas. I thank the organizers of uh, MOSCON 2022 for giving me this opportunity. Let's start with a case. The case uh, which we will be discussing today is a 67-year-old male with a diagnosis of diffuse large basal lymphoma, GCB subtype, fish for MIC and DCL2 translocations are negative. LDH is high, stage 4 disease, bone marrow, bone, and liver involvement. 
IPA score is four and CNS IPA score is four. He was started on our job. The question which we have to discuss today is whether we should offer him CNS prophylaxis or not. And if yes, whether we have to use IV or IT. If you're using IV, whether you should use it intercalated or end of treatment, what is the dose and what are the number of cases? Finally, how to choose the right patient for this? With these questions in mind, why are we even discussing this? Because central nervous system relapse and diffuse large B cell lymphoma, though it is rare, it happens in about 5% of patients overall. The median overall survival in these group of patients is quite dismal. Once you have a CNS relapse, it's almost difficult to salvage. Difficult enough to salvage any relapsed DLBCM, but a CNS relapse is notoriously difficult. So, and uh, there are some subgroups which we have now identified who have a higher sub a risk of relapse. If you go by uh, the NCCN and the CNS IPI model, which is validated in a large population, generally we say that if you have a score of more than four, this is associated with the CNS relapse of 12% or greater. But this is not the only one. We have additional indications for CNS prophylaxis, which is like HIV associated lymphomas, testicular lymphomas, high grade B cell lymphomas, leg type cutaneous DLBCL. and DLBCL of the breast. So the NCCN suggests, again, here you have clearly written that optimal management is uncertain. It suggested systemic high-dose methotrexate during or after the course of treatment and or intrathecal methotrexate and or cytorabine during or after the course of treatment. So it is pretty unclear. The statements are very diplomatically worded here. So what are the pros and cons of the two types of prophylaxis that we are currently using? The intravenous, it has a greater parenchymal penetration. So theoretically, it could be better. But it's definitely more toxic, requires hospitalization. Most of the DLBCL patients are over 60 years of age. They may have renal compromise. Many centers don't have methotrexate levels. So all these issues are there. The intrathecal, of course, is much more easier to do. We are all comfortable giving these injections. There are likely to be fewer interruptions to the backbone of chemotherapy. But the problems are that it has minimal parenchymal penetration. Ideally, you should use an Omaya reservoir if you want a good uh, you know, dissemination of the drug. And of course, there are no prospective comparisons available. It's unlikely to happen that we're going to have a prospective study comparing IV versus IT. So there is a general lack of data. But with whatever information that is available, the first question that we have to answer is, does CNS prophylaxis even work? So this is data from the Recover60 trial. This is a trial which compared RCHOP14 versus CHOP14 in elderly DLBCL. In this trial, they allowed, not mandated, IT methotrexate for whatever was considered as high risk. Totally, at the end of the trial, there was 58 cases of CNS collapses. The two-year incidence was 6.9% with CHOP14 and 4.1% with RCHOP14. So generally quite uh, consistent with what we generally say about 5%. But the RCHOP seemed to reduce the risk of CNS relapse. So the p-value was significant. But when they looked at the subgroup analysis, the patients treated with RCHOP14 did not show any benefit from intrathecal methotrexate with the possible exception of patients with testicular involvement. These are the graphs to show that. So here with rituximab, the recurrence is uh, lesser, the CNS recurrences are lesser. The, the use of IT methotrexate seems to benefit only those who did not get rituximab. That is the bottom curve here. Moving on, let us look at the data of this IV methotrexate. So we have three big studies, all of which have come in the last one year or so. So this abstract from Canada, this is again a retrospective analysis of 906 patients who received a, a CNS prophylaxis or not. And again, here, between 2012 to 2015, the policy in these centers was to use high-dose methotrexate for those with elevated LDH, ECOG more than one, and more than one extra nodal site. So fairly consistent with what many people would do. What did they find? Look at the bottom part of this uh, slide. So you can see here, comparing those who got prophylactic high-dose methotrexate, 115 patients versus those who did not get methotrexate, there was no difference in the CNS relapse risk. It was 11% versus 
There were other factors which were identified as risk for CNS relapse. The, the ALG high risk criteria was one, CNS IPI was one, testicular involvement 20% versus 5%. Double shield lymphoma, 9% versus 5.8%. Again, all consistent with which we already know, but there was no benefit of adding prophylactic high-dose methotrexate, and there was no reduction in CNS collapse risk. Going on to a second study, which was just presented in the recently concluded ASH. This is an international retrospective study of 2,300 high-risk patients, whether they got CNS prophylaxis with high-dose methotrexate or not. These are patients from Australia, New Zealand, Canada, many centers in Europe. So this is a fairly widely disseminated patient population. Again, the results are the same. There was absolutely no difference in the CNS relapses, 9% versus 8%. It doesn't matter whether you got high-dose methotrexate or not. So coming back to our question, whether CNS prophylaxis at all works, at this point, from whatever data we have from the retrospective analysis with all its caveats, it does seem that there, will, there may not be much benefit for CNS prophylaxis. This is what we have to infer from this data. The deficiencies of data that we will come back to later. One more study which I want to show you. This has recently been published in blood. And this is one of the largest series again. And this one is slightly different. Here they are not comparing CNS prophylaxis versus no CNS prophylaxis. Here they are comparing among patients who got CNS prophylaxis. They are comparing those who got IV versus IT. Again, this is retrospective, but this study is uh, notable because this has most of the US academic centers and almost the, you know, all the top people working in the field of lymphoma are involved in this study. So as, as can be expected, more people who are older, who are renal dysfunction tended to get IT, and those who got R epoch tended to get IT because R epoch by itself is an intense chemotherapy. Whereas high V high, high dose methotrexate was most associated with testicular uh, disease and more extranodal burden. This was the baseline characteristics. What did they find overall out of this uh, thousand plus patients? 64 patients. That is again 5.6 percent. Again, the consistent number of around 5 percent had CNS lapses. Uh, again, the high risk CNS IPA consistently predicted a higher risk of CNS relapse. But again, what was the difference? 5.3% with intrathecal, 7.1% with intravenous. Absolutely no difference whether you used IT or IV. So, whether uh, more high risk patients got IV, so with, whether this was the factor which distorted the results. So, they did a propensity score match analysis. And they matched for age more than 70, chemotherapy regimen and renal function. Again, even after the matching, there was absolutely no difference, 5.4% versus 8.0%. So what this study concluded was that between IT and IV, apparently there is no difference. Again, this is a retrospective analysis, but this is a fairly large data. What was also interesting is that when they looked at the predicted baseline CNS relapse risk weighted by the CNS IPA score of this entire population, it was 5.8%. And after CN single root prophylaxis, it was 5.7%. Again, bringing into question whether there was any benefit at all from the prophylaxis that was used. So differences in CNS relapse rate by route of administration failed to show significant differences. Also, when patient groups were stratified by IPI, MCC and IPI, and double hit status. Again, one more study questioning whether we need to use CNS prophylaxis at all, and if we have to use, whether we should struggle and give IV methotrexate. What about this question of testicular involvement? In this study that we just now discussed, there was only 69 patients with testicular involvement at baseline, and among these 69 patients, eight of them had a relapse. That's 12%. And six of these were actually low and intermediate risk patients. The numbers were too small to make any conclusions here. So what to do with testicular DLBCL? The, there is a lot of debate here because, you know, there, is, there doesn't seem to be any benefit. And, uh, you know, many people get IT methotrexate, but most of the relapses with testicular lymphoma actually happen in the CNS parenchyma. So whether only for this patient I should give IV, all these things, we do not have a correct data at this point of time. But what we know, again, one more very interesting paper, this is also from this ASH. If you choose to give IV methotrexate for whatever your own reasons, despite of all the data that I have shown, when you should give it. So we've been traditionally told that we should try to intercalate this between the cycles of RCHOP. So around day 15 of RCHOP, you try to give the high-dose methotrexate. Now here is data which shows 
that when you try to intercalate or whether you give it in the end, absolutely no difference in the rate of CNS prophylaxis. So you don't have to kill yourself and kill your patient trying to intercalate the high dose methotrexate between your ARCHOP cycles. It is very well, if you are still hell-bent on giving IV methotrexate, you can very well give it at end of your six, complete, six cycles of ARCHOP. Not only that, when they tried to give intercalated high dose methotrexate, there was more chances of delay of the primary therapy, which led to more risks of relapses. So if you're still not convinced, this is a meta-analysis. Again, meta-analysis is all the retrospective data. We do not have prospective data here. 10 studies, no significant difference in relative risk or absolute risk of difference between those who received CNS prophylaxis and those who did not. So I'm just putting up all the studies that we have until this date. So you can see a whole bunch of studies, a lot of patients, again, all of them retrospective, except for the one, which is a single center study from Singapore. All the studies did not show any difference whether you use high risk methotrexate, whether you use IV methotrexate or no prophylaxis, there was no difference by your intervention. So based on this, what conclusion do we have? You have three options. Option A, completely abandon CNS prophylaxis. Why? Because most studies show, show no benefit. As of now, we do not have data. Option B, let us at least give IT methotrexate. It's not so toxic. Why? All these studies are not controlled. If not very effective, at least IT methotrexate is less toxic. And again, back of your mind, if these patients do relapse, we have very little to offer them. Option C, I would still use IV high-dose methotrexate because these are on retrospective analysis. There is definitely potential for bias. More patients at risk may have received prophylaxis because of all these factors. I do not want to change. I will continue to use IV methotrexate. You can choose which one you want to be because again, this is all left to interpretation. What are the take home messages? There is a group of patients with DLDCL with high risk of CNS relapse. They may be identified by high risk CNS IPI. There will be other things like testis, bone marrow, breast involvement, maybe ABC subtype, DHL, some genetic profiles, B symptoms. We should do something about them. No doubt about it. Nobody is questioning that. But what we are doing now may not help, whether it is IT or IV. It is something for us to, you know, it's, it's difficult to, you know, uh, take in something, but that's what we have with the available data. But yes, you know, we want to find some a middle ground here. So we still do CNS prophylaxis for some groups, maybe testis involvement, DHL, and, you know, you, you need to really pick your patients correctly here. If you are doing, Maybe IT is enough. I personally go towards IT. I've never been much of a fan of giving IV methotrexate. But if you are using IV, please use it at end of your ARCHOP. Don't try to push it in the middle of your ARCHOP. So with this message, let me stop and thank once more for all of you for patient listening and the organizers for giving me this opportunity. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, sir. And now we request uh, Dr. Jose to please give his expert comments. And then we'll go to Dr. Raghu for his comments. Over to you, sir. Thank you, uh, Dr. Prashant, for uh, nicely uh, taking us through this uh, difficult uh, decision to take, even though the practice has been to use uh, uh, intrathecal uh, methotrexate for high-risk uh, lymphoma patients. As you mentioned, if, if someone has a high-risk score or if the, uh, if the lymphoma is involving the testis, adrenals, uh, kidneys, bone marrow, or if the LDH values are high and so forth, and the, the point that you uh, you uh, emphasized also, and the and the studies that you have shown, clearly is there a role when you use uh, rituximab to uh, prophylax these uh, patients. Uh, but obviously, we feel bad if we don't use uh, some strategy to prevent this disease coming back, even though the numbers are low. Um, uh, I think it is fair enough uh, till things are very a bit more clearer to to uh, provide us uh, CNS prophylaxis for these high-risk uh, patients um, um, and uh, uh, again uh, the, the poll that you've given maybe to use if at all if someone is interested in giving high dose uh, methotrexate maybe to use it uh, once the chemotherapy is completed on time thank you dr. Prasant. 
thank you so much sir uh, over to dr raghu for his final comments before we end the session uh, thank you so much to all the participants uh, moderator panelists expert commentators and everyone else it's an excellent uh, late afternoon session on a sunday and i really enjoyed myself and uh, good luck and have a good day thank you so much uh thank you so much sir with that we come to the end of this session and i now request our program director to please give the thank you to give the thank you note and the closing remark over to you sir thank you guys so we've come to the end of the 7th edition of the mosca and what a wonderful four days we've had until now and uh, we 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 initially planned for this to be a physical conference but in view of the ongoing pandemic we've had to make this a virtual completely virtual one but i hope probably in the near future we'll be able to look for looking forward to meeting all of you in person as well and i'd like to wholeheartedly thank everyone who's logged in and made this conference a resounding success and also starting with our patrons purvesh sir sahu sir and again of nanjan dapan sir as well and uh, of course ably led by my organizing committee my organizing chairperson jc and the organizing committee led by pavan and sunil and all the debaters all the moderators all the chairpersons and all the panelists i i mean like without any of you none of this would have been absolutely possible and also i would uh, last of all but definitely not the least i would like to thank our event management team led ably by kashish kavina creations and the entire team for making sure that we go through this without any glitches whatsoever so thanks a lot guys and i would also like to thank all of our sponsors for taking the initiative and also for being part of the this academic initiative and looking forward to meeting all of you in person pretty okay. soon so yeah. with that uh, i'll thank yeah. everyone and uh, thank you so much thank you so much sir and with that we'll come to a close for the 7th molecular oncology society conference thank you everyone thank you bye bye